the Project Gutenberg Gebok of Galactic Patrol. By it, quote, Smith the Sebok is for the use of anyone anywhere in the United States and most other parts of the world at no cost and with almost no restrictions whatsoever. You may copy it, give it away or reuse it under the terms of the Project Gutenberg license included with this Sebok or online at WAF. Gutenberg, or if you are not located in the United States, you will have to check the laws of the country where you are located before using the Sebok. Title The Lactic Patrol Offers. Oat, oat. Smith Release Date August 22, 2022. Evoke 6815 Language. English produced by Greg Weeks, Mary Meehan, and the online distributed proofreading team at DAC D. Waf. Next start of the Project Gutenberg Evoc Galactic Patrol Galactic Patrol by H. Oat. Smith. P. H. Mm -hmm. Transcriber's Note. This set was produced from Astounding Stories September, October, November, December 1930, January, February 1930. Extensive research did not uncover any evidence that the U. S. Copyright on this publication was renewed, dominating twice a hundred square miles of campus, parade ground, airport, and spaceport. A nine-to-street edifice of chromium and glass sparkled dazzlingly in the bright sunlight of a June morning. This monumental pile was Wentworth Hall, in which the Tellurian candidates for the lens of the Galactic Patrol live and move and have their being. One wing of its topmost floor seed with tense activity. For that wing was the habitat of the lordly Fivier men. This was graduation day, and in a few minutes class five was due to report in Roma. Roma. The private office of the commandant himself, the dreadful lair into which an undergraduate was summoned only to disappear from the hall and from the cadet corps. The portentous chamber into which each year the handful of graduates marched and from which they emerged. Each man in some subtle fashion changed. In their cubicles of steel the graduates scanned each other narrowly, making sure that no wrinkle or speck of dust marred the black and svanter perfection of the dress uniform of the patrol, that not even the tiniest spot of tarnish or dullness violated the glittering gold and meteors upon their collars or the respellent and polished tray pistols and other equipment at their belts. The microscopic mutual inspection over, the kit boxes were snapped shut and dragged, and the embryonic lensmen made their way out into the assembly hall. In the wardroom, Kimball Kinnison, captain of the class by virtue of graduating at its head, and his free lieutenants, Clifford Maitland, Roll of Fourth, and Whitel Holmbert had inspected each other minutely and were now simply awaiting, in never in Syker's intention, the zero minute. But, fellows, remember that drop the young captain jerked out, weird dropping the shaft free, at higher velocity and in tighter formation than any class ever tried before. If anybody hashes the former Uncher last show and with the whole corps looking on, don't worry about the drop. Kim advised Maitland. All three platoons will take that like clockwork. What's got me all of a dither is what is really going to happen in Roma. A uh, exclaimed Laforg and Holmberg as one. You can play that across the board for the whole class. Kinnison agreed. Well, we'll soon know. It's time to get going. The four officers stepped out into the assembly hall, the class springing to attention at their approach. Kinnison, now old risk captain, stared along the mathematically exact lines and snapped. Report class five present in full. Sir, the sergeant major touched a stud at his belt and all vast Wentworth Hall fairly trembled under the impact of an alverpating, lilting, Throbbing melody as the world's finest military band crashed into our patrol. Squads left march, although no possible human voice could have been heard in that gale of salt's ring sound. And although Kinnison's lips did not move, his command was carried to the very bones of those for whom it was intended to no one else be the Tibet Maltram Cauterixen strapped upon their chests. Close formador and Chepram in perfect alignment and cadence, the little column marched down the hall. 
In their path yawned the shaft, a vertical pit some twenty feet square extending from main floor to roof of the hall. More than a thousand sheer feet of unobstructed dare, cleared now of all traffic by flaring red lights. Five left heels flipped sharply, simultaneously upon the lip of the stupendous abyss. Five right legs swept out into emptiness. Five right hands snapped to belts in five bodies, rigidly erect, arid downward at such an appalling velocity that to in practice vision they simply vanished. Six tenths of a second later, precisely upon a beat of the stirring march, those ten heels struck the main floor of Wentworth Hall, but not with a click, dropping with a velocity of almost two thousand feet per second, though they were at the instant of impact. Yet those five husky bodies came from full speed to an instantaneous, shopless, effortless halt at contact. The drop had been made under complete neutralization of inner surety. In space parlance, inertia restored. The march was resumed, or rather continued in a perfect time with the bind. Five left feet swung out, and as the right toes left the floor, the second rank, with only bare inches to spare, plunged down into the space its predecessor had occupied a moment before. Rank after rank landed and marched away with machinal-like precision. The dread door of Rumo opened automatically at the approach of the cadets and closed behind them. Column rhymed Art Kinnison commanded and notably, and the class obeyed in clockwork perfection. Column left march squads rhymed Art companionate salute in company front. In a huge, square room devoid of furniture, the class faced the Obergnestrup's General Fritz von Hondorf, Commandant of Cadets, Martinti, Tyrant. Dictator was known throughout the system as the embodiment of Sulences. F insofar as he had ever been known to show emotion or feeling before any undergraduate. He seemed to glory in his repute of being the most pitilessly rigid disciplinarian that earth had ever known. His thick, white hair was roached fiercely upward into a stiff pompadour. His left eye was of glass, and his face bore dozens of tiny, thread-like scars, for not even the marvellous plastic surgery of that age could repair entirely the havoc quote by the lethal rays of space combat. Also, his right leg and left arm, although practically normal to all outward seeming, were in reality largely products of science and art instead of nature. Kinnison faced, then, this reconstructed potentate, saluted crisply, and snapped, sewed, Class five reports to the commandant. Take your poist. Sewed. The veteran saluted as pentitiales. And as he did so, a semicircular disc rose around him from the floor, a desk whose most striking feature was an intricate mechanism surrounding a splint like form so shaped as to receive a man's left arm. Note. One. Kimball Kinnis and von Hondorf barked. Front and center marked the oath. Sewed. Before the omnipotent witness, I promise never to lower the standard of the galactic patrol. Kinnison said reverently, F, bearing his left arm, thrust it into the hollow form, from a small container labeled, No. 1. Kimball Kinnison. The commandant shook out what was apparently an ornament lenticular jewel fabricated of hundreds of tiny, dead white gems taking it up with a pair of insulated forceps. He touched it momentarily to the bronzed skin of the arm before him, and at that fleeting contact a flash as of many colder fire swept over the stones. Satisfied, he dropped the jewel into a recess provided for it in the mechanism, which at once burst into activity. The forearm was wrapped in thick insulation. Molds and shields snapped into place and there flared out an instantly suppressed flash of brilliance intolerable. Then the molds fell apart. The insulation was removed. There was revealed the lens, clamped to Kinnison's brawny wrist by a massive bracelet of imperishable, almost unbreakable. Metal in which it was embedded, it shone in all its lambent splendor, no longer a whitely inert piece of jewelry, but a lenticular polychrome of writhing, almost fluid radiance which proclaimed to all observers in symbols of ecrashining flame that here was a lensman of the galactic patrol. 
in similar fashion each man of the class was invested with the symbol of his rank then the stern fiste inspector general touched a button and from the bare metal floor there arose deeply upholstered chairs one forced graduate full out he commanded then smiled almost boshal first intimation any of the class had ever had that the hard-bold old tyrant could smile and went on in a strangely altered voice sit down mad and small cup we have an hour in which to talk things over and now i can tell you what it is all about each of you will find his favorite refreshment in the arm of his chair no there's no catch to it he continued in answer to amazed or doubtful stares and lighted a huge black cigar of venice gorn tobacco as he spoke you are lensman now and henceforth each of you is accountable only to himself and to guppy of course you have yet to go through the formalities of commencement but they don't count each of you really graduated when the lens was welded around his arm we know your individual preferences and each of you has his favorite weed from Tillotson's Pittsburgh stogies up to Snowden's Alsican H cigarist, even though Alsican is just about as far away from here as a planet can be and still lie within the galaxy. We also know that you are all immune to the lure of noxious drugs. If you were not, you would not be here today. So smoke up and speak up. Ask any questions you care to, and I will try to answer them. Nothing is barred now. This room is shielded against any spy ray or communicator beam operable upon any known frequency. There was a brief and rather uncomfortable silence. Then Kinnison suggested, diffidently, might it not be best, so, to tell us all about it. From the ground up I imagine that most of us are in too much of a daze to ask intelligent questions. Perhaps, while some of you undoubtedly have your suspicions, I will begin by telling you what is behind what you have been put through during the last five years. Feel perfectly free to break in with questions at any time. You know that every year one million ID Nalgird boys of Earth are chosen as cadets by competitive examinations. You know that during the first year, before any of them see Wentworth Hulk, that number shrinks to less than 50,000. You know that by graduation day there are only, approximately, one hundred left in the class. Now I am allowed to tell you that you graduates are those who have come with flying colors through the most brutally rigid, the most fiendishly thorough process of elimination that it has been possible to develop. Every man who can be made to reveal any sign of weakness is dropped. Most of these are dismissed from the patrol. There are many splendid men. However, oh, for some reason not involving moral turpitude, are not quite what a lensman must be. These men make up our organization. From grease monkeys up to the highest commissioned officers below the rank of lensmen. This explains what you already now hot the galactic patrol is the finest body of intelligent beings yet to serve under one banner. Of the million who started, you few are left, as must every being who has ever worn or whoever will wear the lens. Each of you has proven repeatedly to the cold verge of death itself, that he is in every possible respect worthy to wear it. For instance, Kinnison here once had a highly adventurous interview with a lady of Aldebaran and her friends. He did not know that we knew all about it. But we did. Kinnison's very ears burned scarlet. But the commandant went imperturbably on. So it was with Volcarin the hypnotist of Carillon, with Laforgan the Bentlameters with Flewelling when the Ganymede Asino spy and its mugglers tried to bribe him with ten million in gold. Good heavens! Commandant broke in one outraged youth. Didn't we do any real work at all plenty of it? But at the same time each of you underwent enough testing to prove definitely that you could not be cracked. And none of you need be ashamed, for you have passed every test. Those who did not pass them were those who were dropped, nor is it any disgrace to have been dismissed from the service before graduation into the patrol. The million who started with you were the pick of the planet. Yet we knew in advance that of that selected million scarcely one in ten thousand would measure up in every essential. Therefore, 
it would be manifestly unfair to stigmatize the rest of them because they were not born with that extra something that ultimate quality of fiber which does and of stern necessity must characterize the wearers of the lens for that reason not even the man himself knows why he was dismissed and no one save those who wear the lens knows why they were selected and a member of the patrol does not talk it is necessary to consider the history and background of the patrol in order to bring out clearly the necessity for such care in the selection of its personnel you are all familiar with it but probably very few of you have thought of it in that connection the patrol is of course an outgrowth of the old planetary police systems if until its development law enforcement always lag behind law violation thus in the old days following the invention of the automobile state troopers could not cross state lines then when the national police finally took charge they could not follow the rapitect wide criminals across national boundaries still later when interplanetary flight became a commonplace the planetary police were at the same old disadvantage they had no authority off their own worlds while the public enemies flitted and hampered from planet to planet and finally with the invention of the inertials drive and the consequent traffic between the worlds of hundreds of thousands of solar systems crime became so rampant so utterly uncontrollable that it threatened the very foundations of civilization a man could perpetrate any crime imaginable without fear of consequences for in an hour he could be thousands of light years away from the scene and safely beyond the reach of the law and helping powerfully toward utter chaos were the new vices which were spreading from world to world among others the taking of new and horrible drugs thionit for instance occurring only upon trancoit a drug as much deadlier than heroin as that compound is than coffee and which even now commands such a fabulous price that a man can carry a fortune in one hollow boot heel the sour patrol came into being at first it was a pitiful enough organization it was handicapped from without by politics and politicians and at the same time it was honeycomb bad from within by the usual small but utterly poisonous percentage of the unfight reports corruptionists bribe takers undoubted criminals it was also hampered by the fact that there was then no emblem or credential which could not be counterfeited no one could tell with certainty that the man in uniform was a patrolman and not a criminal in disguise slowly the patrol perfected itself one of its greatest advances came with the invention of the lens which being proof against counterfeiting or imitation renders identification of all lensmen automatic the patrol then set up its own military courts and executed the few of its members guilty of misconduct standards of entrance were raised ever higher and when it had become evident that the patrol was to a man and corkapit it was granted more and ever more authority now its power is practically absolute its armament and equipment are the ultimate its members can follow the lawbreaker wherever he may go furthermore a lensman can commandeer any material or assistance wherever and whenever required and the lens is so respected throughout the galaxy that any wearer of it may be called upon at any time to be judge jury and executioner wherever he goes upon him or through any land water air or space anywhere within the confines of our island universe his word is law that i think explains what you have been forced to undergo the only excuse for its severity is that it produces results in the last hundred years no wearer of the lens has disgraced it any questions about the lens for instance we have all wondered about the lens so of course maitland ventured the outlaws apparently keep up with us in science boss Khan himself is supposed to be a genius and to have surrounded himself with a scientific staff second to none in the known universe i have always supposed that what science can build science can duplicate surely more than one lens has fallen into the hands of the outlaws if it had been a scientific invention it would have been duplicated long ago 
the commandant made surprising answer it is however not essentially scientific in nature it is almost entirely philosophical and was developed for us by the origins yes each of you was said to Risia quite recently von hondorf went on as the newly commissioned officers glanced at each other in dawning understanding what did you think of them Murty at first sewed i thought that they were some new kind of dragon but dragons with brains that you could actually feel i was glad to get away sewed they fairly gave me the creeps even though i never did see one of them so much as move they are a peculiar race the commandant went on essentially antisoberal rather supremely indifferent to all material things for hundreds of thousands of generations they have devoted themselves to thinking mainly of the essence of life they say that they know scarcely anything fundamental concerning it but even so they know more about it than does any other known race while ordinarily they will have no intercourse whatever with outsiders they did consent to help the patrol for the good of all intelligence thus each being about to graduate into the patrol is sent to Aresia, where a lens is built to match its individual life force while no mind other than that of anorision can understand its operation thinking of your lens as being synchronized with or an exact resonance with your own vital principle or ego will give you a rough idea of it the lens is not really alive as we understand the term it is however endowed with a sort of pseudo life by virtue of which it gives off its strong characteristically changing light as long as it is in metaphlophous circuit with the living mentality for which it was designed also by virtue of that pseudo life it acts as a telepath through which you may converse with other intelligences even though they may possess no organs either of sight or of hearing as we know those senses it also has other highly important uses the lens cannot be removed by anyone except its wearer without dismemberment it glows as long as its rightful owner wears it and it ceases to glow in the instant of its owner's death al soden here is the thing that renders impossible the impersonation of a lens not only does the lens not glow if worn by an impostor but if a patrolman be dismembered and his lens removed that lens kills in a space of minutes any living being who attempts to wear it its pseudo life interferes so strongly with any life to which it is not attuned that that life force cannot exist in this plane a brief silence fell during which the young men absorbed the stunning import of what their commandant had been saying more there was striking into each young consciousness a realization of the stark heroism of the grand old lensman before them a man of such fibre that although physically incapacitated and long past the retirement age he had conquered his human emotions sufficiently to accept deliberately his ogre's role because in that way he could best further the progress of his patrol i have scarcely broken the ground von hondorf continued i have merely given you an introduction to your new status during the next few weeks before you are assigned to duty other officers will make clear to you the many things about which you are still in the dark our time is growing short but perhaps we have time for one more question not a question so but something more important kinnison spoke up i speak for the class when i say that we have misjudged you grievously and we wish to apologize i thank you sincerely for the caught although it is a necessary you could not have thought otherwise of me than as you did it is not a particularly pleasant task that we old men have feet of weeding out than fit but we are too old for active duty in space we no longer have the instantaneous nervous responses that are for that duty imperative we do what we can however the work has its brighter side since each year there are about a hundred found worthy of the lens thus my one hour with the graduates more than makes up for the year that precedes it and the other oldsters have somewhat similar compensations in conclusion you are now able to understand fully what kind of mentalities compose our patrol 
you know that any creature wearing the lens is in every sense a lensman, whether he be human or hailing from some strange and distant planet, a monstrosity of a shape you have as yet not even imagined. Whatever his form, you may rest assured that he has been tested even as you have been, that he is as worthy of trust as are you yourselves. My last word is Fizmin of the Galactic Patrol Dyke, but they do not fold up. Individuals come and go, but the patrol goes on then. Then all Martinti, class five. Attention, he barked. Report upon the stage of the main auditorium, the class. Again, a rigidly military unit marched out of room and down the long corridor toward the great theater in which, before the mast could at Corinda throng of civilians, they were to be formally graduated. As they marched along, the graduates realized in what way the wearers of the lens who emerged from rumor were different from the candidates who had entered it such a short time before. They had gone in as bons for was, apprehensive, and still somewhat unsure of themselves, in spite of their survival through the five long years of grueling tests which now lay behind them. They emerged from room as men men knowing for the first time the real meaning of the physical and mental tortures they had undergone, men able to wield justly the vast powers whose scope and scale they could even now but dimly comprehend, oh, barely a month after his graduation, even before he had entirely completed the pistagridate tours of duty mentioned by von Hondorf, Kinnison was summoned to prime base by no less a person than Port Admiral Haynes himself. There, in the admiral's private arrow, whose flaring lights cleared a path as the by magic through the swarming traffic, the novice and the veteran flew slowly over the vast establishment of the base, shops and factories, citadel of barracks, landing fields stretching beyond the fore horizon, flying craft ranging from tiny, onman helicopters through small and large spouts, patrol ships and cruisers up to the men's. Globular super of space, all these were observed and commented upon. Finally, the arrow landed beside a long, comparatively low Wildigan structure heavily guarded. Inside the base, although it was within which Kinnison saw a thing that fairly snatched away his breath. A spaceship it was, but what a ship in bulk it was vastly larger even than the super of the patrol. But, unlike them, it was, in shape, a perfect teardrop, streamlined to the ultimate possible degree. One footnote one. In the big toe drop spurs and battle spies driving force is always directed upward, along the geometrical axis of the ship, and the artificial gravity is always downward along that same line. Thus, throughout any possible maneuvering, three or a note, down and up have the same significance as within any earthly structure. These vessels are ordinarily landed only in special docks, but in emergencies can be landed almost anywhere. Sharps turn down, as their immense weight drives them deep enough into even the hardest ground to keep them upright. They sink in water, but are readily maneuverable, even under water. What do you think of her? The port admiral asked. Think of her, the young officer gulped twice before he attained coherence. I can't put it in words. So, but some day, if I love long enough and develop enough force, I hope to command a ship like that sooner than you think. Kinnison, Haynes told him, flatly, you are in command of her beginning tomorrow morning. Oh, me, Kinnison exclaimed, but sobered quickly. Oh, I sue. So, it takes ten years of proved accomplishment to rate command of a first school's enforcement vessel, and I have no rating at all. You have already intimated that this ship is experimental. There is, then, something about her that is new and untried, and so dangerous that you do not want to risk an experienced commander in her. I am to give her a workout, and if I can bring her back in one piece, I turn her over to her real captain. But that's all right with me. Admiral rations a lot for picking me out. But a chance, what a chance, Innocence I gleamed at the prospect of even a brief command of such a creation. Right and wrong. The old admiral made surprising answer. 
it is true that she is new and tried and dangerous so much so that we are unwilling to give her to any of our present captains Dog. she is not really new either rather her basic idea is all that it has been abandoned for centuries she uses explosives of a type that cannot be tried out fully except in actual combat her primary weapon is what we have called the quignin the propellant is hectodotation the shell carries a charge of twenty metric tons of dudospolitic but sir kinnison began just a minute i'll go into that later while your premises were correct your conclusion is not you graduated no one and in every respect save experience you are as well qualified to command as is any captain of the fleet and since the britannia is such a radical departure from any conventional type battle experience is not a prerequisite therefore if she holds together through one engagement she is yours for good in other words to make up for the possibility of having yourself scattered all over space you have a chance to win that ten years rating you mentioned a minute ago all in one trick fair enough ferrets find one's wand and thanks and never mind the thanks until you get back you were about to comment i believe upon the impossibility of using explosives against a three opponent it can't be impossible of course since the britannia has been built i just don't quite see how it could have been made effective new lock to the pirate with tractors screen to screen x about ten kilometers you blast a hole through his screens to his wall shield the muzzle of the quagnon mounts an annular multiplex projector which puts out a kite pound tube of forks of strinciter to be exact as you can see from the type formula this helix extends the gun barrel from ship to ship and confines the propellant gases behind the projectile where they belong when the shell strikes the wall shield of the pirate and detonates something will have to give way the tube and tractors being cure force and computed for this particular combination of explosions will hold and our physicists have calculated that the ten per column of inert propellant gases will offer so much inertia and resistance that any possible wall shield will have to go down that is the point that cannot be tried out experimentally it is quite within the bounds of possibility that the pirates may have been able to develop wall screens as powerful as our cat pihelices it should not be necessary to point out to you that if they have been able to develop a wall shield that will stand up under detonating due to spolitic, the back blast through the breach of the quagnon will blow the britannia apart as though she were made of matchwood that is only one of the chances and perhaps not the greatest hunfy to you and your crew will have to take they are all volunteers by the way and will get plenty of extra rating if they come through alive do you want the job you don't have to ask me that chief you know i want it of course but i had to go through the formality of asking sometime but to get on with the discussion this pirate situation is entirely out of control as you already know we don't even know whether boscon is a reality a figurehead a symbol or simply a figment of somebody imagination but whoever or whatever Boscom really is, some being or some group of beings has perfected a mighty efficient organization of outlaws, so efficient that we haven't been able to locate their main base. You may as well know now a fact that is not yet public property, that even convoyed vessels are no longer safe. The pirates have developed ships of a new and extraordinary type, ships that are much faster than our heavy battleships, and yet vastly more heavily armed than our fast cruisers. Thus, they can outfight any enforcement vessel that can catch them, and can outrun anything of ours armed heavily enough to stand up against their beams. That accounts for the recent heavy losses. Kinnison mused. Yes. Haynes went on. Grimly. Ship after ship of our best has been blasted out of the ether, doomed before it pointed a beam, and more will be. We cannot force an engagement on our terms. We must fight on theirs. That is the present intolerable situation. We must loan what the pirates' new power system is. 
our scientists say that it may be anything, from cosmic key receptors and converters down to a controlled space warp you wetter that may be. Anyway, they haven't been able to duplicate it. So it is up to us to find out what it is. The Britannia is the tool our engineers have designed to get that information. She is the fastest thing in space, developing at full blast and a note acceleration of ten gravities. Figure out for yourself what velocity that means three in open space. You have just said that we can't have everything in one ship. Kinison said, thoughtfully, what did they sacrifice to get that speed all the conventional offensive armament? Haynes replied frankly, she has no long-range beams at all, and only enough sure trang stuff to help drive the Cahilkas through the enemy's screens. Practically her only offense is the Quignant. But she has plenty of defensive screens. She has speed enough to catch anything afloat. And she has the Cognovshich we hope will be enough. Now we'll go over the general plan of action. The engineers will go into all the technical details with you during a test flight that will last as long as you like. When you and your crew are thoroughly familiar with every phase of her operation, bring the engineers back here to base and go out on patrol. Somewhere in the galaxy you will find a pirate vessel of the new type. You lock to him. As I said before, you attach the Quagnon well forward, being sure that the point of attachment is far enough away from the power rooms so that the essential mechanisms will not be destroyed. You board and storm in her revival of the technique of older times. Specialists in your crew, who will have done nothing much up to that time, will then find out what higher scientists want to know. If at all possible, they will send it an instantly via Tibetan communicator. If, because of distance or for any other reason, it should be impossible for them to communicate. The whole thing is again up to you. The port admiral paused, his eyes boring into those of the younger man, then went on impressively. That information must get back to base. If it does not, the Britannia is a failure. We will be right back where we started from. The slaughter of our men and the destruction of our ships will continue unchecked. As to how you are to do it, we cannot give you even general instructions. All I can say is that you have the most important assignment in the universe today, and repetite information must get back to base. Now come aboard and meet your crew and the engineers. Under the expert tutelage of the designers and builders of the Brit, any of Vice Commander Kinnison drove her hither and thither through the trackless wastes of the Galascotso. In Nurton three, under every possible degree of power he maneuvered her, attacking imaginary foes and actual meteorites with equal zeal, maneuvered and attacked until he and his ship were one, until he reacted automatically to her slightest demand, until he and every man of his eager and highly trained crew knew to the final vault and to the ultimate tamper her gargantuan capacity both to give it and to take it. Footnote 2. Navigation. Each ship has a reference sphere held rigidly by gyroscopes so that its great circle of galactic longitude is always parallel to the galactic equator. Its line of zeros is always parallel to the line joining Centralia. The central solar system of the galaxy, with the system of Vandemar, which is on its very rim. Thus, courses are expressed in galactic longitude and latitude, from zero to 360 degrees in each circle. Position is expressed in galactic coordinate sub x, y, and c. The origin is at Centralic, and the line of positive x is the Bovementined and Central Agencer line. The position of the ship in the galaxy is known at all times by that of a moving dot in the tank. This dot is shifted automatically by calculating machines coupled inductively to the leads of the drives. When the ship is inert, this device is inoperative. As any distance traversed in inert flight is entirely negligible in galactic computations, due to various perturbations and other slight errors, cumulative discrepancies occur, for which the pilot must from time to time correct manually the position of the dot in the tank representing his ship. Then and only then did he return to base, unload the engineers, and set out upon the quest. 
trail after trail he followed, but all were called. Alarm after alarm he answered, but always he arrived too late. Arrived to find gutted merchantmen and riddled enforcement vessel, with no life in neither and with nothing to indicate in which direction the marauders might have gone. Finally, however, B.T. calling B.T. the Britannia's coed call blared from the sealed and speaker, and a string of numbers follow half spatial coordinates of the luckless vessel's position. Chief pilot Henry Henderson punched the figures upon his locator, and in the tank T. Enormous, minutely cubed model of the Galakasher appeared a redly brilliant point of light. Kinnison rocketed out of his narrow bank, digging the sleep out of his eyes, and shot himself into his place beside the pallet. Right an hour lax he exulted. Scarcely ten light years away starts crambling the defer, and as the vengeful cruiser darted toward the scene of depredation, all space became filled with blast after blast of static interference for which it was herped. The pirate could not summon the help he was so soon to need, but that howling static gave the parrot commander pause. Surely this was something new before him lay a richly laden freighter. Its two convoying enforcement ships already practically hors de combat. A few more minutes and the prize would be his. Nevertheless, he darted away, swept the ether with his detectors, saw the Britannia, and turned in headlong flight. For if this streamlined freighter was sufficiently convinced of its prowess to try to blanket the ether against him, that information was something that Boscone would value far above one shipload of material wealth. But the parrot craft was now upon the visiplates of the Britannia, entirely ignoring the crippled spaceships, Henderson flung his vessel after the other, manipulating his incredibly complex controls purely by touch, the while staring into his plate not only with his eyes, but with every fibre of his being as well. He hauled his huge mount hither and thither in front of Cleeps. After what seemed an age he snapped down a toggles which and relaxed long enough to grin at Kinnison, Holding him, the young commander demanded, Go tenth, skipper. The pilot replied, Positively, it was touch and go for ninety seconds, but I've got a crisp tracer on him now at full polk. He can't put out enough jets to get away from that. I can hold him forever fine work. Hen Kinnison strapped himself into his seat and donned his headset. General call attention battle stations by stations. Report Station 1. Tractor Beam Shot Station 2. Repeller to Station 3. Projector Hunt Hot the station after station of the warship of the void reported. Until Station 15. The Kagun hit Kinnison himself reported. Then gave to the pilot the words which throughout the spaceways of the galaxy had come to mean complete readiness to face any emergency. Hot and tight. Penalties take him, the pilot shoved his blast lever. Already almost at maximum. Clear out against it, stop and hunched himself even more intently over his instruments, as moved his pointers. So varied the direction of the thrust that was driving the Britannia toward the enemy at the unimaginable velocity of ninety parsecs and or four g velocity possible only two inertials matter being urged through an almost perfect vacuum by a driving blast capable of lifting the stupendous normal tonnage of the immense sky rover against a brevity ten times that of her native earth. Footnote three. With the neutralization of inertia, it was discovered that while inert mass is limited to the velocity of light. There is no limit whatever to the velocity of inertial's matter. A free ship takes on instantly the velocity at which the force of her drive is exactly equal by the friction of the medium. This velocity is determined by many factors. Above, assuming an ultrafast shaped, a standard mass of light ratio, a power to develop an inert acceleration of ten earth gravities, and a density of matter in space of one atom per ten cubic centimeters. Such speeds are not at all unusual. It may be of interest to note here that Mays and Cornell recently made the transatlantic run along the line of zeros, from Alsacon past Centralia to Vandemar, a distance of one hundred, three hundred nine, four to six parsecs, in twelve fifty re. 
400 Itixis hours galactic standard, thus establishing a new galactic record of 812. Fort you for Parsec Spoiler for the entire distance. Unimaginable completely saved ship of the Galactic Patrol was hurling herself through space at a pace in comparison with which any speed that the mind can grasp would be the merest crawl. A pace to make light itself seem stationary. Ordinary vision would have been useless. But the observers of that day used no antiquated optical system. Their detector beams, converted into light only at their plates, were heterodyned upon and were carried by subafrial ultraves, vibrations residing far below the level of the ether and thus possessing a velocity and a range infinitely greater than those of any possible ephebrin wave. Although stars moved across the visiplates in flaming, zigzag lines of light, as pursued in pursuer past system after solar system in fantastic, light years long hops, yet Henderson kept his cruiser upon the pirate's tail and steadily cut down the distance between them. Soon a tractor beam licked out from the patrol ship, touched the fleeing marauder lightly, and the two space tips flashed toward each other. Nor was the enemy unprepared for combat. One of the crack craters of Boscan, master pirate of the known universe, she had never before found difficulty in conquering any vessel fleet enough to catch her. Therefore, her commander made no attempt to cut the beam, or rather, since the two inertials vessels flashed together to repellers one contact in such a minute fraction of a second that any human action within that time was impossible. It would be more correct to say that the pirate captain changed his tactics instantly from those of flight to those of combat. He thrust out tractor beams of his own, and from the already wet-hot refractory throats of his projectors there raved out horribly potent beams of annihilation beams of dreadful power which tore madly at the straining defensive screens of the patrol ship. Screens flared vividly, radiating all the colors of the spectrum. Space itself seemed a rainbow gone mad, for there were being exerted their forces of a magnitude to stagger the imagined asterisks to be yielded only by the atomic might from which they sprang for sirs whose neutralization set up visible strains in the very fabric of the D for itself. The young commander, seated at his conning plate, clenched his fists and swore a startled, deep safe soath as his eyes swept over the delicately accurate meters and gauges before him, for under the frightful impact of that instantaneously launched attack his outer screen was already down and his second was beginning to crack wheel have to scrap the regulation battle plan he barked into his macro firm. Open all motors to absolute top. Cut all resistance out of no. Free circuit. Dalhousie, cut all repellers. Bring us right up to their zone. All you beamers, concentrate on area K. Break down those screens. Kinnison was hunched rigidly over his panel. His voice came brittlely through locked teeth. Cut all your resistors if you have two. The motors and accumulators will hold long enough. There, that's better. Our fur is up again and theirs is going down. Come on. Boys, burn em down, give him everything you can put through the bare bus bars, no matter what it takes. Fet through to that wall shield, so that I can use this cognate little by little. Under the stupendous force of the Britannia's attack, the defenses of the enemy began to fail, and Kinnison's hands flew over his controls. A port opened in the patrol ship's armored side, and an ugly snout protovashoot projectorating muzzle of a squatting monstrous cannon. From its projector bands there leapt out, with the velocity of light, a tube of quasilost force which was, in effect, a continuation of the rifle's grim barrel, a tube which crashed through the weak and third screen of the enemy with a space-wrecking shock and struck savagely, with writhing, twisting thrusts. At the second, aided by the massed concentration of the Britannia's every battery of short-ring beams, it went through and through the first. Now it struck the very wall shield of the outloaf impregnable screen which, designed to bear the brunt of any possible inert collision, had never been pierced or ruptured by any material substance, however applied. To this inner defense than a material gun barrel clung. Simultaneously, the tractor beams, 
hitherto exerting only a few dines of force, stiffened into unbreakable, inflexible rods of energy, binding the two ships of space into one rigid system, relative to another, immovable. Then Kinnison's flying fingertip touched a button and the Quagnan spoke. From its sullen throat there erupted a huge torpedo. Slowly the giant projectile crept along, watched in gnawed amazement by the officers of both vessels. For to those space-hardened veterans the velocity of light was a veritable crawl, and here was a thing that would require four or five whole seconds to cover mere ten kilometers of distance illustration. Slowly the giant projectile crept along, watching in gnawed amazement by the officers of both vessels. Illustration for to those space-hardened veterans the velocity of light was a veritable crawl and here was a thing that would require four or five whole seconds but although slow this bomb might prove dangerous therefore the pirate commander threw his every resource into attempts to cut the tube of force to blast away from the tractor beams to explode the sluggish missile before it could reach his wall shields in vain for the Britannia's every beam was set to protect the torpedo and the mighty rods of energy without whose grip the inertial's mass of the enemy vessel would offer no resistance whatever to the force of the proposed explosion. Slowly, so slowly, as the abalong seconds crawled into eternity, there extended from enforcement vessel almost to piratual raging. What if tiller gases of combustion of the propellant hepted an acid of which there rushed the Krugnan's tremendous shell with its horribly destructive freight? What would happen could even the almost immeasurable force of that frightful charge of Dudespolitik break down a wall shield designed to withstand the cosmic assaults of meteoric missiles? And what would happen if that wall screen held in spat of himself Kinnison's mind insisted upon painting the ghastly picture? The awful explosion the pirate's screen still intact, the raving gases driven backward along the tube of force, the bare metal of the Quignan's breach, he knew, was not and could not be reinforced by the infinitely stronger, although immaterial shields of pure energy which protected the hull, and no conceivable substance, however resistant, could impede, save momentarily, the unimaginable forces about to be unleashed, nor would there be time to release the Katub after the explosion but before the Britannia's own destruction. For if the enemy's shield stayed up for even a fraction of a second, the unthinkable pressure of the blast would propagate backward through the already densely compressed gases in the tube, would sweep away as though it were nothing the immensely thick metallic barrier of the gun breach, and would wreak within the bowels of the patrol ship a destruction even more complete than that intended for the foe nor were his men in better case. Each knew that this was the climactic instant of his whole existence, that life itself hung poised upon the issue of the next split second. Hurry it up, snap into it, will that crawling, creeping thing never strike some prayed briefly. Some swore bitterly, but prayers and curses were alike unconscious and had precisely the same meaning gawk and man. White of face and grim of jaw, clenched his hands and waited tense and straining for the impact anyway, the missile struck and in the instant of its striking the coldly brilliant stars were blotted from sight in a vast globe of intolerable flame the parrot's shield had failed and under the cataclysmic force of that horrible detonation the entire nose section of the enemy vessel had flashed into incandescent vapor and had added itself to the rapidly expanding cloud of fire as it expanded the cloud cooled his fierce glare subsided to a rosy glow, through which the stars again began to shine. It faded, coozed, darkened, revealing the crippled hulk of the pirate ship. She was still fighting, but ineffectually, now that all her heavy forward batteries were gone. Needlers, fire at will barked Kinnison, and even that feeble resistance was ended. He need needlery men working at spiry visiplates, bored hole after hole into the captive, seeking out and destroying the contraplanus of the remaining beams and screens. Puller up came the next order. The two ships of space flashed toga yawning, blasted on fore end of the one cigar trader solidly against the Britannia's armored side. 
a great poor topend but lusk it's all yours classification to three place appointed they're human or approximately so board and storm back of that port there had been massed a hundred fighting men dressed in full panoply of space armor armed with the deadliest weapons known to the science of the age and powered by the gigantic accumulators of their ship at their head was sergeant van buskirk six and a half feet of dutchably and dynamite who had fallen out of the Lyria's cadet corps only because of an innate inability to master the intricacies of higher mathematics. Now the attackers swept forward in a black ansvanter wave. Four squatly massive semi-portable projectors crashed down upon their magnetic clamps, and in the fierce ardor of their beams the thick bulkhead before them ran the gamut of the spectrum and puffed outward. Some score of defenders were revealed. Mikewise clav in armor, and battle again was joined explosive and solid bullets detonated against and ricocheted from that highly efficient armor the beams of delameter hand projectors splashed in torrents of man-made lightning off its protective fields of force but that skirmish was soon over the semi-portable whose vast energies no ordinary personal armor could withstand were brought up and clamped down and in their holocaust of vibratory destruction all life vanished from the pirates' compartment. One more bolt head and we are in their control room, Van Busker cried. Beam it down, but when the beams pressed their switches, nothing happened. The pirates had managed to jury-rig a screen generator, and with it had cut the power beams behind the invading forces. Also they had cut loopholes in this bulkhead, through which, in frantic haste, they were trying to bring heavy projectors of their own into alignment. Bring up the feral paste. The sergeant commanded, Fed up as close to that wall as you can. So they can blast us the paste ain't ultramodern or development of Fermitas brought up and the giant Dutchman himself trolled it on in furious swings. From floor up and around in a huge arc and back down to floor. He fired it and simultaneously some of the enemy gunners managed to angle a projector sharply enough to reach the further ranks of the enforcement men. Then mingled the flashing, scintillating, gassy glare of the thermite and the raving energy of the pirate's beam to make of that confined space a veritable inferno. But the paste had done its work, and as the semiscroll of wall fell out the soldiers of the lens leapt through the hole in the still go lining wall to struggle hand to hand against the pirates, now making a desperate last stand, the semi-portable and other heavy ordnance powered from the Britannia's accumulators were, of course, useless. Pistols were ineffective against the pirate's armor of hard dalamol. Hand rays were equally impotent against its defensive shields. Now heavy hand grenades began to rain down among the combatants, blowing enforcement men and no few pirates to bits for the outlaw chief scared nothing that they killed some of their own men if in so doing they could take a proportionately greater toll of the law and worse a crew of gunners was swiveling a mighty projector around upon its hastily improvised mount to cover that sector of the great compartment in which the policemen were most densely massed but the minions of the law had one remaining weapon carried expressly for this eventuality and no mean weapon it proved to be. The space axe a combination and sublimation of battle axe, mace, and Lodgona massively needle-pointed implement of potentialities limited only by the physical strength and bodily agility of its wielder. But all the men of the Britannia's storming party were Valerians, and therefore were bib, hard, cast, and agile, and of them all. Their sergeant leader was the biggest, hardest, fastest, and most agile, when the space ported apex of that turtopount monstrosity, driven by the far hundred pounds of rawhide and holobon that was his body, struck pirate armor, that armor gave way, nor did it matter whether or not that hellish beak of steel struck a vital part after crashing through the armor, head or body, leg or armed, the net result was the same, a man does not fight effectively when he is breathing space in lieu of atmosphere. Van Buskirk perceived the danger to his men in the slowly turning ray projector, and for the first time called his chief. Him. He spoke in level tones into his microphone. 
blast that delta ray will you or have they cut this beam so you can't hear me yes they have they've cut our communication he informed his troopers then keep them off me as much as you can and i'll attend to that delta ray outfit myself aided by the massed interference of his men he plunged toward the threatening mechanism hewing to right and to left as he strode beside the temporary projector mount at last he aimed a tremendous blow at the man at the delta ray controls only to feel the axe flash instantaneously to its mark and strike it with a gentle punch and to see his intended victim float effortlessly away from the blow the pirate commander had played his last card van busburg floundered not only weightless but no shoals as well but the huge dutchman's mind while not mathematical was even faster than his lightning clay muscles and not for nothing had he spent arduous weeks in inertials tests of strength and skill hooking feet and legs around a convenient wheel he seized the enemy operator and jumped his helmeted head down between the base of the mount and the long heavy steel lever by means of which it was turned then throwing every ounce of his wonderful body into the effort he braced both feet against the projector's grim barrel and heaved. The helmet flew apart like an eggshell. Blood and brains gushed out in nauseous blobs. But the delta ray projector was so jammed that it would not soon again become a threat. Then Van Busburg drew himself across the room toward the main control panel of the warship. Officer after officer he pushed aside, then reversed two ductile wear switches restoring gravity and inertia to the riddled cruiser in the meantime the tide of battle had continued in favor of enforcement few survivors though there were of the black ants vanter force of the pirates there were still fewer fighting now a desperate and hopeless defensive but in this combat quarter was not could not be thought of and sergeant van busburg again waded into the fray Four times more his horribly effective hybrid weapon descended like the irresistible hammer of four, cleaving and crushing its way through steel and flesh and bone. Then, striding to the control board, he manipulated switches and dials, then again spoke evenly to Kinnison. You can hear me now, can't you? All mocked up. Come and get the dope, the specialists. Headed by Chief Technician Laverne Forndike had been waiting strainingly for that word for minutes. Now they literally flew at their tasks, in furious haste, but following rigidly and in perfect coordination a prearranged schedule. Every control and lead, every bus bar and immaterial beam of force was traced and checked. Instruments and machines were dismantled. Sealed mechanisms were ruthlessly torn apart by jacks or sliced open with cutting beams. And everywhere, Everything and every movement was being photographed, charted, and diagrammed. Getting the idea now. Kim, the chief technician said finally, during a brief lull in his work. A sweet system look at this, Samakenik interrupted. Here's a machine that's all shot to pieces. The shielding cover had been torn from a monstrous fabrication of metal, apparently a motor or generator of an exceedingly complex stack. The insulation of its coals and windings had fallen away in charred fragments. Its copper had melted down in sluggish. This piss streams. That's what we've been looking for, Thorndyke declared. Check those leads, Alpha 7 Trufish, and the minutely careful study went on until. That's enough. We've got everything we need now. Have you draftsmen and photographers got everything down solid on the boards and in the cans wrapped out the two reports as one? Then let's go and go fast, Kinnison ordered. Brusquely, I'm afraid that we're going to run out of time as it is all hands hurried back into the Britannia, paying no attention to the bodies littering the decks. So desperate was the emergency. Each man knew that nothing could be done about the dead, whether friend or foe every resource of mechanism of brain and of brawn must needs be strained to the utmost if they themselves were not soon to be in similar case can you talk nels demanded kinnison of his communications officer even before the airlock had closed no so 
They're blanketing us plenty. That worthy replied instantly. Space is so full of static that you couldn't drive a power beam through it, let alone a communicator. Couldn't talk or act. Anyway, look where we are. He pointed out in the tank their present location. Hebs, we couldn't have got much farther away from Mirth without jumping the galaxy entirely. Boscon got a warning, either from that ship back there or from the disturbance. They are undoubtedly concentrating on us now. One of them will spear us with a tractor. Just as sure as hell's a man trapped the fledgling commander ram both hands into his pockets and fought in black intensity. He must get this data back to base. But how how Henderson was already driving the vessel back toward the solar system with every iota of her inconceivable top speed. But it was out of the question even to hope that she would ever get there. The life of the Britannia was now. He was coldly certain. To be measured in hours and all too scant measure. Even of them. For there were hundreds of pirate vessels tearing through the verd, forming a gigantic net to cut off her return to base. Cast though she was, one of that barricading horde would certainly manage to clamp a trace array upon her, and when that happened her flight was done. Nor could she fight. She had conquered one first Skull's war vessel of the public enemy. It was true. But at what awful cost her captain knew only too well. The prodigious drain of power had almost emptied her accumulators. Also, and worse, the refractories of her main projectors were burned away practically to the shells, without vastly heavier bracing fields than the Britannia carried. No substance, however stable, could stand up long under such hellish loads as they had had to handle. The Quignan was as useless as a fountain pen without full driven offensive beams. One fresh vessel, similar to the one they had just left, could very easily blast his crippled mount out of space. Nor would there be only one. Within a space of minutes after the attachment of a tracer ray, the enforcement vessel would be surrounded by the cream of Boscone's fatters. There was apparently only one way out offering any chance at all of success. Unslowly, thoughtfully, and finally grimly, young Vice Commander Kinnison owned and briefly Captain Kinnison decided to take it. Everybody open your communicators and listen, he ordered. We must get this information back to base, and we can't do it in the Britannia. The pirates are bound to catch us, and our chance in another fight is exactly zero. We'll have to abandon ship and take to the lifeboats in the hope that at least one of us will be able to get through their lines. The technicians and specialists will take all the data they got from Rate Mini Ape. Descriptions, diagrams, pictures, evertebrifligit down, and put it on a spool of take. They will make thirty-nine copies of it, since there are just forty of us left, and one spool will be given to each man. There will be twenty boats, two men to a boat, we will start launching them after we have gone as far toward base as it is safe to go in this ship. Once away, use very little detectable power. Or, better yet, no power at all. Until you are sure that the parrots have chased the Britannia good many parsecs away from where you are. From then on you will be strictly on your own. Do it any way you can. But some way, in a way, get your spool back to base. There's no use in me trying to impress you with the importance of this stuck. You know what it means as well as I do. Boat mates will be drawn by lot. The quartermaster will write all our names on slips of paper and draw them out of a helmet two at a time. The only exception to this is that if two navigators, such as Henderson and Dyke, are drawn together, both names go back into the helmet. Get to work twice the name of Kinnison came out together with that of another skilled in astronautics and was replaced. The third time, however, it came out paired with Van Buskirk. To the manifest joys of the giant policeman and to the approval of the crowd as well. That was a break for me. Chief the sergeant called over the cheers of his fellows. I'm dead sure of getting back now pretty strong talk. I'm afraid but I don't know of any one I'd rather had at my back than you. Kinnison replied, with a boyish grin, 
The pairings were made. Delimeters, spare batteries, and other equipment were checked and tested. The spools of tape were sealed in their course for of containers and distributed, and Kinnison set talking with the chief technician. So they've solved the problem of the really efficient reception and conversion of cosmic radiation, Kinnison whistled softly through his teeth, and a sun venna small on radiates the energy given off by the annihilation of anti asterily million tons of matter per second some power that's the story. Skip. And it explains completely why their ships have been so much superior to ours. They could have installed faster drives even than the Britannia's. They probably will. Now that it has become necessary. Also, if the bus bars in that receptor optonic had been a few square centimeters larger in cross section, they could have held their wall shield, even against our Dudoic bomb. Then what they had plenty of intake, but not quite enough distribution. They have atomic motors, the same as ours, just as big and just as efficient. Kinnison cogitated. But those motors are all we have got. While they use them, and at full power, though, simply as first stage X tires for the Cosmic King Ricky screens, blinding blue blazes, what power some of us have to get back? Gurn, if we don't, Boscon's got the whole galaxy by the tail, and civilization is sunk without a trace. I say so. But also I'll say this for those of us who don't get back it won't be for lack of trying. Well, I'd better go check up on thy boat, if I don't see you again. Kim old man. Cleary for they shook hands briefly and fornd I strode away. En route. However, he paused beside the quartermaster and signaled to him to disconnect his communicator. Clever lad. Allergize fornd I whispered. With a grin. Kinda loaded the dice a trifle once or twice. Didn't you? I don't think anybody but me smelled a rat. Though, certainly neither the skipper nor Henderson did. Or you'd be headed to do over again. At least one team has got to get through. The quartermaster replied, quietly and obliquely. And the strongest teams we can muster will find the going none too easy. Any team made up of strength and weakness is a weak team. Captain Kinnison, our only lensman, is, of course, the best man aboard this was Buggy. Who would you pick for, Noel? To Van Buskirk. Of course, the same as you did. I wasn't criticizing you. And I was complimenting you. And thanking you. In a roundabout way. For giving me Henderson. He's got plenty of what it takes. Oh. It wasn't Van Buskirk. Of course, by any means. The quartermaster rejoined, It's mighty hard to figure either you or Henderson third, to say nothing of fourth, and any kind of company, however fast mentally or physically. However, it seemed to me that you fitted in better with the pallet. I could hand pick only two teams without getting caught at it as spotted me as it was, but I think that I picked the two strongest teams possible. At least one of you will get through. For all the tea there is in China. If none of you four can make it. Nobody could. Well, here's hoping. Anyway, thanks again. See you again sometime. Maybe. Cleary for Chief Pallet Henderson had. A few minutes since. Changed the course of the cruiser from right line flight to fantastic. Zigzag leaps through space. And now he turned frighteningly to Kinnison. We'd better begin dumping them out pretty soon now. I think, he suggested, we haven't detected anything yet. But according to the figures, it won't be long now. And after they get their traps set, we'll run out of time mighty quick. Right. And then, one after another, but even so several light years apart in space, eighteen of the small boats were launched into the void. In the control room there were left only Henderson and Forndike with Van Busfer and Kinnison, who were to be the last to leave. All right, Hen, now we'll try out your role if well director by chance, Kinnison said, then went on, in answer to Forndike's questioning glance, a bouncing ball on an oscillating table, 
Every time the bull caroms off a pin it shifts the course through a fairly large but entirely unpredictable angle. Pure Chanchwa thought it might cross them up a little. Hairline beams were connected from panels to pins, and soon four interested spectators looked on while, with no human guidance, the Britannia lurched and leapt even more erratically than she had done under Henderson's direction. But, however, the ecker-shanging vectors of her course were as unexpected and surprising to her passengers as to any possible external observer. One more life but left the enforcement vessel, and only the lensman and his giant aide remained, while they were waiting the required few minutes before their own departure. Kinnison spoke. Lusk, there's one more thing we ought to do, and I've just figured out how to do it. We don't want this ship to fall into the pirates' hands intact, as there's a lot of stuff in her that would probably be as new to them as it was to us. They know that we got the best of that ship of theirs, but they don't know what we did or how we did it. On the other hand, we want her to drive on as long as possible after we leave her. The farther away from us she gets, the better our chance of making our getaway. We should have something that will touch off those Dudoic torpedoes we have left all seven of them at Ansi at the first touch of a spy beam, both to keep them from studying her and to do a little damage if possible. They'll go inert and pull her up close as soon as they get a tracer on her. Of course, we can't do it by stopping the spy ray altogether. With a spy screen, but I think I can establish an rip since Vinster field outside our regular screens that will interfere with the Tescov and just announce they one tenth of one per cent for actuate a relay in the field's porting beam. One tenth of one per cent of one milliwatt is one microwatt. Isn't it not much power? I'd say. But that's a little out of my line. You can do it. And do it before they run out of time. Or you wouldn't have suggested it. Go ahead. I'll observe while you're busy. The sit came about that. A few minutes later, the immense sky over of the galactic patrol darted along entirely untenanted, and it was her non human helmsman, operating solely by chance, that prolonged the chase far more than even the most optimistic member of her crew could have herped, for the pilots of the pirate pursuers were intelligent, and assumed that their quarry also was directed by intelligence. Therefore, they aimed their vessels four points toward which the Britannia should logically go, only and maddeningly to watch her go somewhere else. Senselessly, she hauled herself directly toward enormous suns, once grazing one so nearly that the harrying parrots gasped at the full hardens of such exposure to lethal radiation. For no reason at all she shot straight backward, almost into a cluster of pirate craft, only to dash off on another unexpected tangent before the startled outlaws could lay a beam against her. But finally she did it once too often. Flying between two vessels, she held her line the merest fraction of a second too long. Two tractors latched out and the three vessels flashed together. Zone to zone to zone. Then, instantly, the two pirate ships became a note. Two anchor in space, their wildly fleeing prey. Then spy beams lipped out to explore the Britannia's interior. At the touch of those beams, light and delicate as they were, the relay clicked and the torpedoes let go. Those frightful shells were so designed and so charged that one of them could demolish any inert structure known to man. What of seven there was an explosion to stagger the imagination and which must be left to the imagination since no words in any language of the galaxy can describe it adequately the britannia literally blown to bits partially fused and even partially volatizzled by the inconceivable fury of the outburst was hurled in all directions in streamers droplets chunks and masses each component parturged away from the center of pressure by the ragingly compressed gases of detonation furthermore each component was now, of course, inert and therefore capable of giving up its full measure of kinetic energy to any inert object with which it should come in contact. One mass of wreckage, so fiercely sped that its victim had time neither to dodge nor become inertials, crashed full against the side of the nearer attacker, 
meteorite screens flared brilliantly violet and went down. The full driven wall shield held, but so terrific was the concussion that what few of the crew were not killed outright would take no interest in current events for many hours to come. Rather, slightly more distant attacker was more fortunate. Her commander had had time to render her inertials, and as she rode lightly away, ahead of the outermost, most tenuous fringe of vapor, he reported succinctly to his headquarters all that had transpired. There was a brief interlude of silence. Then a speaker gave tongue. Helmuth, speaking for Bospon, snapped from it. Your report is neither complete nor conclusive. Find, study, photograph, and bring into headquarters every fragment and particle pertaining to the wreckage, paying particular attention to all bodies or portions thereof. Helmuth, speaking for Boscon, roared from the general of Scramblin, commanders of all vessels, of every class and tonnage, upon whatever mission bound. Attention the vessel referred to in our previous message has been destroyed, but it is feared that some or all of her personnel were allowed to escape. Every unit of that personnel must be killed before he has opportunity to communicate with any patrol base. Therefore cancel your present orders whatever they may be, and proceed at maximum blast to the region previously designated. Scour that entire volume of space. Beam out of existence every vessel whose papers do not account unquestionably for every intelligent being aboard. Investigate every possible avenue of escape. More detailed orders will be given each of you upon your nearer approach to the neighborhood under search. If spaced what had complete, except for helmets, and with those ready at hand. Kinnison and Dan Busburg sat in the tiny control room of their life but as it drifted inert through interstellar space. Kinnison was poring over charts taken from the Britannia's pilot room. The sergeant gazed idly into a detector plate. No clearie for yet. I don't suppose. The captain remarked, as he rolled up a chart and tossed it aside. No let up for a second. They're not taking any chances at all. Found out where we are also cannot to be here about somewhere. Hadn't it I've got our coordinate truffly? Alsacan would be fairly close for a ship. But it's out of the question for us. Nothing much inhabited around here, either. Apparently, to say nothing of being civilized. Scarcely one to the block. Don't think I've been out here before. Have you off my beat entirely? How long do you figure it'll be before it's safe for us to blast off? Can't start blasting until your plates are clear. Anything we can detect can detect us as soon as we start putting out power. We may be in for a spell of waiting then, Van Busker broke off suddenly and his tone changed to one of tense excitement. Great blasts of fire, look at that blinding blue blaze, as Kinnison exclaimed, staring into the plate. With all Macrovernus, Wainel space and all the time and eternity to play around in. The blind god of chance had to bring her back here and now for there. Right in their laps, not a hundred miles away, lay the Britannia and her two parrot captors better go free. Hadn't we whispered Van Buskirk? Darrant grunted Kinnison. At this range they'd spot us in a split second. Acting like a hunk of loose metal's our only chance. We'll be able to dodge any flying chunks. I think. There she goes from their coign of vantage, the two patrolmen, so their gallant ship's terrific end. So the one pirate vessel suffer collision with the flying fragment. So the other escape in Oshals. So her disappeared. The note pirate vessel had now almost exactly the same velocity as the lifeboat, both in speed and in direction. Only very slowly were the large craft and the small approaching each other. Kinnison stood rigid, staring into his plate, his nervous hands grasping the switches whose closing, at the first sign of detection, would render them inertials and would pour full blast into their driving projectors. But minute after minute passed and nothing happened. Why don't they do something? He burst out. Finally, they know we're here. There isn't a detector made that could be badly enough out of order to miss us at this distance. Why, they can see us from there. 
with no detectors at all asleep, unconscious, or dead, than Busford diagnosed, and they certainly are not asleep. It believe me, him, that she was nudged. It's quite possible that she was hit hard enough to lay out most of her crew cold and why enough of them to put her out of control. And say, it's a practical certainty that she has a standard emergency inlet port. How about it? Huckinison's mind leapt eagerly at the daring suggestion of his subordinate, but he did not reply at once. Their first, their only duty, concerned the safety of two spools of tape. But if the lifeboat lay there inert until the pirates regained control of their craft, detection and capture were certain. The same fate was as certain should they attempt flight with all nearby space so full of enemy flyers. Therefore, harebrained though it appeared at first glance, Van Buskersing wild idea was actually the safest course all right. Lusk, we'll try it. We'll take a chance on going free and using a tenth of a dine of drive for a hundredth of a second. Get into the lock with your magnets. The lifeboat flashed against the parrot's armored side in the sergeant, by deftly manipulating his two small hand magnets, worked it rapidly along the steel plating toward the driving jets. There, in the conventional location just forward of the main driving projectors, was indeed the emergency inlet port with its gallop tad and ticked controls. Illustration. There in the conventional location just forward of the main driving projectors was the emergency inlet port. In a few minutes the two warriors were inside, dashing toward the control room. There Kinnison glanced at the board and heaved a sigh of relief. Fine same type as the one we studied. Same race. Oh, he went on, eyeing the motionless forms scattered about the floor. Seizing one of the bodies, he propped it against a panel, thus obscuring a multiple lens. That's that I overlooking the control room. He explained unnecessarily. We can't cut their headquarters visibams without creating suspicion. But we don't want them looking around in here until after we have done a little stage setting for them. But they'll get suspicious anyway when we go free. Van Buskirk protested. Sure. But we'll arrange for that later. First thing we've got to do is to make sure that all the crew, except possibly one or two in here, are really dead. Don't beam unless you have two. We want to make it look as though everybody got killed or fatally injured in the crash. A complete tour of the vessel, with a grim and distasteful accompaniment, was made. Not all of the pirates were dead, or even disabled. But an armator as they were and taken completely by surprise. The survivors could offer but little resistance. A cargo port was opened and the Britannia's lifeboat was drawn inside, then back to the control room, where Kinnison picked up another body and strode to the main panels. This fellow, he announced, was hurt badly, but managed to get to the board. He threw in the free switch, like this, and then Fulbisit drive. So, then he pulled himself over to the steering globe and tried to lay the pointers back toward headquarters, but could it quite make it? He died with the course set right there, not exactly toward the solar system. You noticed hate would be too much of a currency it did close enough to help a lot. His bracelet got caught in the guard. Like this, there is clear evidence as to exactly what happened. Now we'll get out of range of that eye and let the body that scovering it float away naturally. Now what asked Van Buskirk, after the two had hidden themselves? Nothing whatever until we have two, was the reply, which we could go on like this for a couple of weeks. But there's not a chance. Headquarters will get curious pretty quick as to why we're shoving off. Even as he spoke a furious burst of noise erupted from the communicator, a nurse which meant, Vessel Fort Yusuf and Steer 109 to Kis, where are you going? And where report at that brusque command one of the still forms struggled weakly to its knees and tried to frame words, but fell back dead. Perfect Kinnison breathed into Van Busker's year. Couldn't have been better. Now they'll probably take their time about rounding us up. Listen, here comes some more. 
the communicator was again sending. See if you can get a direction on their transmitter if there are any survivors able to report. Do so at once, Kinnison understood the dynamic call to say. Then the voice moderating. As though the speaker had turned from his microphone to someone nearby. It went on. No one answers. So, nest, you know, is the ship that was lying closest to the new patrol ship when she exploded. So close that her navigator did not have time to go free before collision with the debris. The crew were apparently all killed or incapacitated by the shock. If any of the officers survive, have them brought in for trial. A more distant voice commanded. Savagely, Boscon has no use for bunglers except to serve as examples. Have the ship seized and returned here as soon as possible. Could you trace it? Buskinison demanded. Even one line on their headquarters would be mighty useful. No. It came in from Blust and separated it from the rest of the static out there. Now what now we eat and sleep? Particularly and most emphatically. We sleep. Watch is no need. I'll be awakened in plenty of time if anything happens. My lens. You know. They ate Ravens we and slept prodigiously. Then Nathan slept again. Rested and refreshed. They studied charts. But Van Buskersing mind was very evidently not upon the maps before them. You understand that jargon. And it doesn't even sound like a language to me. He pondered. It's the lens. Of course. Maybe it's something that shouldn't be talked about no sex renter among us. At least. Kinnison assured him. The lens recedes as pure thought any pattern of force which represents or is in any way connected with, quote, my brain receives this thought in English, since that is my native language. At the same time, my ears are practically out of circuit, so that I actually hear the English language instead of whatever noise is being made. I do not hear the foreign sounds at all. Therefore, I haven't the slightest idea what the parrot's language sounds like. Since I have never heard any of it, Conversely, when I want to talk to someone who doesn't know any language I do, I simply think into the lens and direct its force at him. He thinks I'm talking to him in his own mother tongue. Thus, you are hearing me now in perfect Illyrian Dutch, even though you know that I can speak only a dozen or so words of it, and those with a vile American accent. Also, you are hearing it in my voice, even though you know I am actually not saying a word, since you can see that my mouth is wide open and that neither my lips, tongue, nor vocal cords are moving. If you were a Frenchman, you would be hearing this in French. Or, if you were a mannerkin and couldn't talk at all, you would be getting it as regular mannerkin telepathy. Oh, he seemed to think. The astounded Dutchman gulped. Then why couldn't you talk back to them through their phones because the lens, although a mighty fine and versatile thing, is not omnipotent? Kinnison replied, Freily, it sends out only thought, and thought waves, lying below the level of the ether, cannot affect a microfern. The microfern, not being itself intelligent, cannot receive thought. Of course, I can broadcast a thought at Rafid Dusk. More or less, but even with the full amplification of the lens, the range is very limited. In lens Solon's communication, we can cover real distances. But without a lens at the other end, I can cover only a few thousand kilometers. Of course, power increases with practice. And I'm not very good at it yet. You can receive a thought ever to be broadcast, and you can read minds, Van Busburg stated. Rather than asked, when I so will it. Yes, that was what I was doing while we were mopping up. I demanded the galactic coordinates of their base from every one of them alive. But none of them knew them. I got a lot of pictures and descriptions of the buildings. Mayed, arrangements and personnel of the base. But not a hint as to its location in space. The navigators were all dead. And not even the Rishans understand deck. But that's getting pretty deeply into philosophy, and it's time to eat again. Let's go days passed uneventfully. 
but finally the communicator again began to talk. Two pirate ships were closing in upon the supposedly derelict prosor, discussing with each other the exact point of convergence of the three courses. I was hoping that we'd be able to communicate with base before they caught up with us, Kinnison remarked, but I guess it's no Daesha Peathers as full of interference as ever. They're a suspicious bunch, and they aren't going to let us get away with a single thing if they can help it. You've got that duplicate of their communications and scrambling built, yes. That was it you just listened to. I built it out of our own stuff, and I've gone over the whole ship with a cleaner. As far as I can see, there isn't a trace, not even a fingerprint, to show that anybody except her own crew has ever been aboard. Good work, this course takes us right through a planetary system in a few minutes, and we'll have to unload there. Let's see. This chart marks planets two and three as inhabited, but with a red reference number, 27. That means practically unexplored and unknown. No patrol representation or conscientious commerce citist of civilization and of Stantic only once. In the Fur Galactic Survey, that was in the days of the Seminert Drive, when it took years to cross the galaxy, not so good. A parentule, but maybe all the better for us. At that, anyway, it's a forced landing, so get ready to shove off. They boarded their lifeboat, placed it in the cargo locked, opened the outer port upon its automatic block, and waited. At their awful galactic speed, the diameter of a solar system would be traversed in such a small fraction of a second that observation would be impossible. To say nothing of computation, they would have to act first and compute later. They flashed into the strange system. A planet loomed terrifyingly close, ate their frightful velocity almost invisible even upon their ultravision plates. The lifeboat shot out, becoming a note as it passed the screen. The cargo ports won shut. Luck had been with them. The planet was scarcely a million miles away. While Van Buskirk drove toward it, Kinnison made hasty observations. Could have been better, but could have been a lot worse. He reported. This is Planet 4, uninhabited, which is very good. 3, though, is clear over across the sun, and 2 isn't any too close for a space in flight bare than 80 million miles. Easy enough as far as distance scopes, we all made longer hops in hours wise, but we'll be open to detection for at least 20 minutes. Can't be helped, though. Here we are going to land her free. Haven Busker whistled. What a chance it'd be a bigger one to take the time to land her a note. Her power will hold a hope. We'll inert her and match velocities with her when we come back. We'll have more time then. The lifeboat stopped instantaneously. And a free landing. Upon the uninhabited, desolate, rocky soul of the strange world. Without a word, the two men leapt out, carrying fully packed knapsacks. A portable projector was then ragged out and its fierce beam directed into the base of the hill beside which they had landed. A cavern was quickly made, and while its glassy walls were still smoking hot, the lifeboat was driven within it. With their delimeters, the two wayfarers then undercut the hill, so that a great slide of soil and rock obliterated every sign of the visit. Kinnison and Van Busker could find their vessel again, from their accurately taken bearings. Above, they haped. No one else could. Illustration. With their delimeters, they undercut the hill so that a great slide of soil and rock obliterated every sign of their visit. Then, still without a word, the two adventurers flashed upward. The atmosphere of the planet, tenuous and cold though it was, nevertheless, so sorely impeded their progress that minutes of precious time were required for the driving projectors of their suits to force them through its thin layer. Eventually, however, they were in interplanetary space and were flying at quadruple the speed of light. Then Van Muspark spoke, landing the boat, hiding it, and this strip are the danger spots. Heard anything yet? No. And I don't believe we will. I think probably we've lost them completely. Won't know definitely. Though, 
until after the cash is shipped, and that won't be for ten minutes yet. We'll be landed by then. A wold now loomed beneath them, a pleasant, earthly purring wold of scattered clouds, green forests, rolling plains, wooded and snow-pad mountain ranges, and drolling oceans. Here and there were to be seen what looked like cities, but Kinnison gave them a wide berth, electing to land upon an open meadow in the shelter of a towering black and glassy cliff, at just in time. They're beginning to talk, Kinnison announced, an important stuff yet, opening the ship and so on. I'll relay that Auk as nearly verbatim as possible when it gets interesting. He fell silent, then went on in a sing-song tone, as though he were resetting from memory, which, in effect, he was. Captains of ships fort quote hundred six strife and decks been a hundred sixteen bis trinting calling Helmuth we have stopped and have boarded the fort use of and steer hundred sixteen scene. Everything is in order and as deduced and reported by your observers. Every one aboard is dead. They did not all die at the same time. But they all died from the effects of the collision. There is no trace of outside interference and all the personnel are accounted for. Helmuth speaking for Boscon, your report is inconclusive search the ship minutely for tracks prints scratches note any missing supplies or misplaced items of equipment study carefully all mechanisms particularly converters and communicators for signs of tampering or dismantling we whistled kinnison they'll find where you took that communicator apart Lusk just as sure as hell's a man trapped no they won't declared van buskirk as positively i did it with rubberness pliers and if i left a spratchorous car or a print on it i leet it tubes and all a pause we have studied everything most carefully o oh, helmuth and find no trace of tampering or visit helmuth again your report is still inconclusive Whoever did what has been done is probably a lensman, and certainly has brains. Give me the present recorded serial number of all port openings, and the exact number of times you have opened each port. Oat groaned Kinnison. If that means what I think it does, all hell's out for noon. Did you see any numbering recorders on those ports I didn't? Of course, neither of us thought of such a thing. Shut up. Here comes some more stuff. Portapenning recorder serial numbers are as follows. They don't mean a thing to us. We have opened the emergency and let port once and the starboard lock twice. No other port at all. And here's Helmuth again. At as I thought, the emergency port was opened once by outsiders, and the starboard cargo port twice. The lensman came aboard, headed the ship towards Saul took his lifeboat aboard, listened to us, and departed at his leisure, and this in the very midst of our fleet, the entire personnel of which was supposed to be looking for him how supposedly intelligent spacemen could be guilty of such utter and indefinite stupidity he's tellin' and plenty. Lusk, but there's no use repeating it. The tone can't be reproduced, and it's simply taking the hide right off their backs. Here's some more. General broadcast ship fort use of Insteer 109 to Keys in its supposedly derelict condition flew from the point of destruction of the patrol ship on course longitude 351.27 degrees, latitude 5.23 degrees, distance 24,700 parsecs. Cancel all previous orders and investigate. No use repeating it. Lusk. He's simply giving directions for scouring our whole line of flight, fading out higher going on, or backed. This outfit, of course, is good for only the closest kind of close-up work, and we route of the frying pan into the fire. Ho! Oh, no, we were a lot better off than we were. We run a planet and not using any power that they can trace. Also, They've got to cover so much territory that they can't comb it very fine, and that gives the rest of the fellows a break. Furthermore, a crushing weight descended upon his back, and the two found themselves fighting for their lives. 
from the bear, supposedly safe rock face of the cliff there had emerged drote of protected monstrosities and a raven's we attacking swarm. In the raving blasts of Delameter's hundreds of the gargoyle horde vanished in vivid flashes of radiance. But on they came, by thousands and, it seemed, by millions, dashing madly toward them. Eventually, the batteries energizing the projectors became exhausted, then flailing coal measuring steel. Fierce bear and parrot beaks clanged against spaced ported armor, bulbous heads pulped under hard swan axes. But not for the fractional second necessary for inertial's flight could the two patrolmen win clear. Then Kinnison sent out his SOS. A lensman calling help, a lensman calling help, he broadcast with the full power of mind and lens. Immediately a high, gaulish voice poured into his brain. Coming, wearer of the lens, coming at speed to the cliff of the cat lats. Hold until I come, I arrive in thirty thirty with what possible intelligible relative measure of that known and unknowable concept. Find, can be conveyed by photo alone, keep slugging. Buskinison panted. Help is on the way. A local coach sounds like a woman will be here in thirty some things. Don't know whether it's thirty minutes or thirty days. But we'll still be here. Maybe so and maybe not. Grunted the Dutchman. Something's coming besides help. Look up and see if you see what I think I do. Kinnison did. Through the air from the top of the cliff there was hurtling downward toward them a veritable dragon. A nightmare's horror of hideously reptilian head. Of leathern wings. Of viciously fanged jaws. Of frightfully taloned feet. Of multiple knotty arms. Of long, sinuous, heavily scaled serpent's body. In fleeting glimpses through the writhing tentacles of his opponent's Kinnison perceived, little by little, the full picture of that unbelievable monstrosity. If, accustomed as he was to the outlandish denizens of worlds even yet scarcely known to man, his very senses reeled at the sight. As the quasitrigneal organism descended, the cliff dwellers went mad, their attack upon the two patrolmen, already vicious became insanely frantic, abandoning the gigantic Dutchman entirely. Every ketlet within reach threw himself upon Kinnison and so enwrapped the lensman's head, arms, and torso that he could scarcely move a muscle. Then entwining captors and helpless man moved slowly toward the largest of the openings in the cliff subsidian face. Upon that slowly moving melling then Buskirk hold himself, deadly space axe swinging, above Hugh and smite as he would. He could neither free his chief from the grisly horde enveloping him nor impede. Measurably, that horde's progress toward its bowl. However, he could and did cleave away the comparatively few cables confining Kinnison's legs. Clamp a leadlock around my waist. Kim, he directed. The flashing thought in no whit interfering with his prodigious ex-play. And as soon as I get a chance, before the real tussle comes, I'll couple us together with all the belt snaps I can reach. Wherever we are going, we are going together. Wonder why they haven't ganged up on me. Oh, and what that lizard is doing, been too busy to look. But thought he'd have been on my back before this. He won't be on your back. That's Warsaw, the lad who answered my call. I told you his voice was funny. They can't talk or hurroo's telepathy. Like the mannerkins. He's cleaning them out in great shape. If you can hold me for three minutes, he'll have the lot of them whipped. I can hold you for three minutes against all the vermin between here and Andromeda. Van Buskirk declared. There, I've got four snaps on you. Not too tough. Lusk, Kinnison cautioned. Leave enough slack so that you can cut me loose if you have two. Remember that the spools are more important than any one of us. Once inside that clit we'll all be washed up of an worsel can't help us there's a drop me rather than go in yourself. But, grunted the Dutchman, noncommitlity, there, I've tossed my spool out onto the ground. Tell worsel that if they get as he is to pick it up and carry on, we'll go ahead with yours. Inside the cliff if necessary. I said cut me loose if you can't hold me, innocent snacked, and I meant it. 
that's an official order. Remember it official order be dance snorted Van Buskirk, still plying his ponderous mace. They won't get you into that hole without breaking me in two, and that will be a job of breaking in anybody's language. Now shut your pen, he concluded grimly. We're here, and I'm going to be too busy, even to think. Very shortly, he spoke truly. He had already selected his point of resistance, and as he reached it he thrust the head of his mace into the crack behind the open trap-door, jammed its shaft into the shoulder socket of his armor, set blocky legs and Herculean arms against the side of the cliff, arched his mighty back, and held, and the surprised cat lats, now inside the gloomy fastness of their tunnel, thrust anchoring tentacles in the wall and pulled harder, ever harder, under the terrific stress Kinnison's heavy armor creaked as its airtight joints accommodated themselves to their new and unusual positions. That armor, of space port now, would, of course, not give way but what of its human anchor well it was for Kimball Kinnison that day, and well for our present civilization, that the Britannia's quartermaster selected Peter Van Buskirk for the Lensman's mate, for death, inevitable and horrible, resided within that cliff, and no human frame of earthly upbringing, however armored, could have borne, for even a fraction of a second, the violence of the catlight spull, but Peter von Buskirk, although of earthly Dutch ancestry, had been born and reared upon the planet Valeria, and that massive planet's gravator V2 and one half times Earth had given him a physique and a strength almost inconceivable to a slight flung dwellers upon small, green terror. His head, as has been said, towered seventy inches above the ground, but at that he appeared squatty because of his enormous spread of shoulder and his startling girth. His bones were elephantine he had to be to furnish adequate support and leverage for the incredible masses of muscle overlaying and surrounding them. But even Ben Buskersing Valyrian strength was now being taxed to the termost. The anchoring chains hummed and snarled as the clamps bit into the rings. Muscles ribbed and knotted. Tendons stretched and threatened to snap. Sweat rolled down his mighty back. His jaws locked in agony and his eyes started from their sockets with an effort. But still Van Buskirk held. Cut me loose, commanded Kinnison at last. Even you can't take much more of that. No use letting them break your back. Cut. I tell you. I said cut. New but Gum. Valerian ape, but if Van Buskirk heard or felt the savagely voiced commands of his chief, he gave no heed. Straining to the very ultimate fiber of his being, Exerting every iota of loyal mind and every atom of Brobdingnagian frame, grimly, tenaciously, stubbornly the gigantic Dutchman held, held wild worsel of Valanche, that grotesquely hideous, that fantastically reptilian ally, ploughed toward the two patrolmen through the horde of catlats, a veritable tornado of rending fang and shearing talon, of beating wing and crushing snout, of mailed hand and trenchant tail, held while that demon incarnate drove closer and closer, hurling entire catlats and numberless dismembered fragments of catlights to the four winds as he came, held while the raging tumult, whose center was Worsel, swept over his rigid body like an ocean wave breaking over an immovable rock, held until Worsel's snake-like body, a supple and sentient cable of living steel, kicked with its double-edged, resorkeen, Simic to Lurstin, slipped into that unnel beside Kinnison and wrought grisly havoc among the catlets close packed there as the terrific tension upon him was suddenly released Van Busker's own efforts hold him away from the cliff. He fell to the ground, his overstrained muscles twitching uncontrollably, and on top of him fell the fettered lensman. Kinnison, his hands no freak. Unfastened the clamps linking his armor to that of Van Busker and rolled to confront the fur. But the fighting was over. The Catlats had had enough of Worsel of the Lanchet. If, shrieking in baffled rage, the last of them were disappearing into their caves, he turned back to Van Buskirk, who was getting shakily to his feet. Thanks a lot, 
Wassel, we were just about to run out of time, Van Buskirk began, only to be silenced by an insistent thought from the grotesque stranger. Stop that radiating, do not think at all if you cannot screen your minds, came the urgent mental commands. These catlites are a very minor pest of this planet, Delvin. There are others worse by far. Fortunately, your thoughts are upon a frequency never used. Terrify had not been so very close to you, I would not have heard you at all, but should the overlords have a listener upon that band. Your shielded thinking may already have done irreparable harm. Follow me. I will slow my speed to yours. But hurry all possible illustration. Stop that radiating, do not think at all if you cannot screen your mind. Came the mental command. You tell them. Shift. Van Buskirk said, and fell silent. His mind as nearly a perfect blank as his iron will could make it. This is a screen thought. Through my lens, Kinnison took up the conversation. You don't need to slow down on our account. We can develop any speed you wish. Led on the Valanchian leapt into the air and flashed away in headlong flight. Much to his surprise. The two human beings kept up with him effortlessly upon their inertials drives, and after a moment Kinnison directed another thought. If time is an object, Wassel, know that my companion and I can carry you anywhere you wish to go at a speed hundreds of times greater than this that we are using. He vysked It developed that time was of the utmost possible importance and the three closed in. Mighty wings folded back. Hands and talons gripped armor chains. Of the group, a nurtial Zoll shot away at a pace that Wurzel of Valancia had never even imagined in his wildest dreams of speed. Their goal, a small, featureless tent of fin sheet metal, occupying a barren spot and arriving, crawling expanse of lushly green jungle, was reached in a space of minutes. Once inside, Orsel sealed the opening and turned to his armored guests. We can now think freely in open converse. This wall is the carrier of a screen through which no fuck can make its way. This wall do call by a name I have interpreted as Delbin. Kinnison began. Smaller, you are a native of Delancia, a planet now beyond the sun. Therefore, I assumed that you were taking us to your space ship. Where is that ship? I have no ship. The Valanchian replied, Compositely, nor have I need of one. For the remainder of my life, which is now to be measured in a few of your horths, with stent is my only no ship and bus for broken. I hope we won't have to stay on this god for gas planet for Verand. I'm not very keen on going much farther in that lifeboat. Either. We may not have to do either of those things. Kinnison reassured his sergeant. Worsel comes of a long live tribe and the fact that he thinks his enemies are going to get him in a few hours doesn't make it true. By any means, there are three of us to reckon with now. Also, when we need a spaceship, we'll get one. If we have to build it. But let's find out what this is all about. Wassel, start at the beginning and don't skip a thing. Between us, we can surely find a way out. For all of us. Then the Valanchian told his story. There was much repetition, much roundabout thinking, as some of the concepts were so bizarre as to defy transmission. But finally the Earthman had a fairly complete picture of the situation within that strange solar system. The inhabitants of Delvin were bad, being characterized by a type and a depth of depravity impossible for a mind of Earth to visualize. Not only were the Delgonians enemies of the Valanchians in the ordinary sense of the word, not only were they parrots and robbers, not only were they their masters, taking them both as slaves and as food cattle, but there was something more, something deeper and worse, something only partially transmissible from mind to mind, a horribly and repulsively Saturnalian type of mental and intellectual, as well as biological, parasitites. This relationship had gone on for ages. Finally, however, a fast strength had been devised, behind which Valancia developed a high science of her own. The students of this science lived with but one purpose in life, to free Valancia from the tyranny of the overlords of Delden. Each student, 
as he reached the zenith of his mental power, went to Delgan, to study and if possible destroy the tyrants, and after disembreaking upon the soul of that dread planet Nova Lantian, whether student or scientist or private adventurer, had ever returned to Valantia. But why don't you lay a complaint against them before the council demanded Van Buskirk? They'd straighten things out in a hurry. We have not heretofore known, save by the most unreliable and roundabout reports, that such an organization as your galactic patrol really exists. The Valantian replied, obliquely, nevertheless, many years since, we launched a spaceship toward its nearest reputed base. However, since that trip requires three normal lifetimes, with deadly peril in every moment, it will be a miracle if the ship ever completes it. Furthermore, even if the ship should reach its destination, our complaint will probably not even be considered, because we have not a single shred of real evidence with which to support it. No living Valanchian has ever seen a Dolgonian, nor can anyone testify to the truth of anything I have told you. While we believe that that is the true condition of affairs, our belief is based not upon evidence admissible in a court of law, but upon deductions from occasional thoughts radiated from this planet. Nor were these thoughts alike in tenor skip that for a minute will take the picture as correct. Kinnison broken. Nothing you have said so far shows any necessity for you to die in the next few hours. The only object in life for a trained Valanchian is to liberate his planet from the horrors of subjection to Delden. Many such have come here, but not one has found a workable idea. Not one has either returned to or even communicated with Valanchian after starting work here. I am a Valanchian. I am here. Soon I shall open that door and get in touch with the enemy. Since better men than I am have failed, I do not expect to succeed, nor shall I return to my native planet. As soon as I start to work, the Dolgonians will come and me to come to them. In spite of myself, I will obey that command, and very shortly thereafter I shall die. In what fashion I do not know. Snap out of it. Wurzel barked Kinnison. Roughly, that's the rankest kind of defeatism. And you know it. Nobody ever got to the first check station on that kind of fuel. You are talking about something now about which you know nothing whatever. For the first time Worsell's thoughts showed passion. Your thoughts are idle vagrination. You know nothing whatever of the mental power of the Delgonians. Maybe no T make no claim of being a mental job and I do know that mental power alone cannot overcome a definitely and positively opposed will. Anarchism could probably break my will. But I'll stake my life that no other mentality in the known universe can do it, you think so. Earthling and deceiving sphere of mental force encompassed the Tellurian's brain. Kinnison's sense is real at the terrific impact. But he shook off the attack and smiled. Come again. Wassel. That one jarred me to the heels. But it didn't quite ring the bell. You flattered me. The Valanchian declared in surprise. I could scarcely touch your mint cald not penetrate even its outermost defences. And I exerted all my force. But that fact gives me hope. My man is, of course, inferior to theirs. But since I could not influence you at all, even in direct contact and at full power, you may be able to resist the minds of the Delgonians. Are you willing to hazard the stake you mentioned a moment ago, or rather, I ask you, by the lens you wear, so to hazard it with the liberty of an entire people dependent upon the outcome. Why not the spools come first? Of course, but without you our spools would both be buried now inside the cliff of the cat lights. Fix it so that your people will find these spools and carry on with them in case we fail. And I'm your man. There no tell me what we wrapped to be up against. And then let loose your dobs. That I cannot do. I know only that they will direct against you mental forces such as you never even imagined. I cannot forewarn you in any respect whatever as to what forms those forces may appear to assume. I know, however, that I shall succumb to the first bolt of force. Therefore, bind me with these chains before I open the shield. Physically, 
I am extremely strong, as you know. Therefore, be sure to put on enough chains so that I cannot possibly break three, for if I can break away I shall undoubtedly kill both of you. I come all these things here. Ready to hand asked Van Buskirk. As the two patrolmen so loaded the passive Valanchian with chains, manacles, handcuffs, leg irons and straps that he could not move even his tail. It has been tried before. Many times, Worsell replied bleakly, but the rescuers, being the Lanchans, also succumbed to the force and took off the irons. Now I caution you, with all the power of mime and denbo matter what you see, no matter what I make a man you or beg of you, no matter how urgently you yourself may wish to do so, do not liberate me under any circumstances unless and until things appear exactly as they do now and that door is shut. Know fully and ponder well the fact that if you release me while that door is open it will be because you have yielded to Dolgonian force, and that not only will all three of us die, lingeringly and horribly, but also, and worse, that our deaths will not have been of any benefit to civilization, do you understand? Are you ready? I understand. I am ready, thought Kinnison and Van Buskirk as one. Open that door. Kinnison did so. For a few minutes nothing happened. Then Friedemann Hill and pictures began to form before their eyes pictures which they knew existed only in their own minds, yet which were composed of such solid substance that they obscured from vision everything else in the material world. At first hazy and indistinct, the cesspirit was in no sense now a picture beam clear and sharp, if piling horror upon horror, sound was at a two sight, and directly before their eyes, blotting out completely even the solid metal of the wall only a few feet distant from them. The two outlanders saw and heard something which can be represented only vaguely by imagining Dante's inferno and actuality and raised to them the power in a dull and gloomy cavern there lay, set, and stood hordes of things. These bane to nobility of Delg and Directilian bodies, somewhat similar to Worsel's, but they had no wings and their heads were distinctly apish rather than crocodilian. Every greedy eye in the vast throng was fixed upon an enormous screen which, like that in a Moshepentikran theatre, walled off one end of the stupendous cavern. Slowly, shudderingly, Kinnison's mind began to take in what was happening upon that screen, and it was really happening. Kinnison was sure of that. This was not a picture any more than this whole scene was an illusion. It was all an act to Shalafershu. Upon that screen there were stretched out victims. Hundreds of these were Valanchians. More hundreds were winged Dilgonians. And scores were creatures whose like Kinnison had never seen. And all these were being tortured. Tortured to death both in fashions known to the inquisitors of old and ways of which even those experts had never an inkling. Some were being twisted outrageously in 3D Hill in frames. Others were being stretched upon racks. Many were being pulled horribly apart. Chains intermittently but relentlessly extending each helpless member. Still others were being lowered in two pits of constantly increasing temperatures or were being attacked by gradually increasing concentrations of some folly corrosive vapor which ate away their tissues. Little by little, if apparently the peace de resistance of the hellish exhibition. One luckless Valanchian, in a spot of hard, cold light, was being pressed out flat against the screen, as an insect might be pressed between two panes of glass. Thinner and thinner he became, under the influence of some awful, invisible force, in spite of every exertion of inhumanly powerful muscles driving body, tail, wings, arms, legs, and head in every frantic maneuver which grim and imminent death could call forth, physically nauseated, brain sick at the atrocious visions blasting his mind and at the screaming of the damned assailing his ears. Kinnison strove to wrench his mind away, but was curbed savagely by Worsell. You must stay, you must pay attention, commanded the Valanchian. This is the first time any living being has seen so much you must help me now they have been attacking me from the first. But, braced by the powerful negatives in your mind, 
I have been able to resist and have transmitted a truthful picture so far, but they are surprised at my resistance and are concentrating more force. I am slipping fast. You must brace my mind, and when the picture changes is change, it must. And Sudno not believe it. Hold fast, brothers of the lens, for your own lives and for the people of the Lanchet. There is more and worse Kinnis in state. So did Van Buskirk, fighting with all his stubborn Dutch mind, revolted, outraged, nauseated as they were at the sights and sounds. They stayed, flinching with the victims as they were fed into the hoppers of slowly turning mills, wincing at the unbelievable acts of the boilers, the beaters, the scourgers, the flayers, suffering themselves every possible and many apparently impossible nightmares, the light in the cavern now changed to a strong, grinny, seashelly glare, and in that hard illumination it was to be seen that each dying being was surrounded by a palely glowing aura. And now, crowning horror of that terribly horrible orgy of sadism resubblement, from the eyes of each one of the monstrous audience there leapt out visible beams of force. These beams touched the war of the dying prison sorted and clung, and as they clung the war shrank and disappeared. The overlords of Delvin were actually feeding upon the ebbing life forces of their tortured, dying victims by, gradually and so insidiously that the Valanchians' dire warnings might as well never have been uttered. The scene changed, or rather, the scene itself did not change, but the observer's perception of it slowly underwent such a radical transformation that it was in no sense the same scene it had been a few minutes before and they felt almost abjectly apologetic as they realized how unjust their previous ideas had been. For the cavern was not a torture chamber, as they had supposed. It was, in reality, a hospital, and the beings they had thought victims of brutalities unspeakable were, in reality, patients undergoing treatments and operations for various ills. In proof, wary of the patty newts, her should have been dead by this time with the molly ideas well friend down now being released from the screen like operating theatre. And not only was each one completely whole and sound in body, but he was also possessed of a mental clarity, power, and grasp and reamed of before his hospitalization and treatment by Delvin supersurgeons also. The intruders had misunderstood completely the audience and its behavior. They were really medical students, and the beams which had seemed to be devouring rays were simply visibands, by means of which each student could follow, in close-up detail, each step of the operation in which he was most interested. The patients themselves were living, vocal witnesses of the visitor's mistaken sins, for each, as he made his way through the assemblage of students, was voicing his thanks for the marvelous results of his particular treatment or operation. Kinnison now became acutely aware that he himself was in need of immediate surgical attention. His body, which he had always regarded so highly, he now perceived to be sadly inefficient. His mind was in even worse shape than his physique, and both body and mind would be improved immeasurably if he could get to the Dolgonian hospital before the surgeons departed. In fact, he felt an almost irresistible urge to rush away toward that hospital instantly, without the loss of a single precious second, if, since he had had no reason to doubt the evidence of his own senses, his conscious mind was not arised to active opposition. However, in his subconscious, or his essence, or whatever you choose to call the ultimate something of his that made him a lensman, of that, Slow bell began to sound. Release me and we'll all go. Before the surgeons leave the hospital. Came an insistent thought from Wurzel. But Hurry, we haven't much time, Van Busburg. Completely under the influence of the frantic compulsion, leapt toward the Valanchian, only to be checked bodily by Kinnison, who was foggily trying to isolate and identify one thing about the situation that did not ring quite true. Just a minute. Plus, shut that door first, he commanded. Never mind the door, Wurzel's thought came in a roaring crescendo. Release me instantly, hurry, or it will be too late. For all of us, all this terrific crush doesn't make any kind of sense at all. 
Kinnison declared, closing his mind resolutely to the clamor of the Valanchian's thoughts. I want to go just as badly as you do. Lusk. Or maybe more so, but I can't help feeling that there's something screwy somewhere. Anyway, remember the last thing Wurzel said, and let's shut the door before we unspan a single taint. Then something clicked in the lensman's mind. Hypnotism. For Wurzel he barked. Opposition now in flame. So gradual that it never occurred to me to build up a resistance. Holy rackets. What a fool I've been fighting. Biftsem don't let em kid you any more. And pay no attention to anything Wurzel sends at you whirling around. He leapt toward the open door of the tent. But as he leapt his brain was invaded by such a concentration of force that he fell flat upon the floor. Physically out of control. He must not shut the door. He must release the Valanchian. They must go to the Dolgonian cavern. Fully aware now, however, of the source of the waves of compulsion, he threw the sum total of his mental power into an intense negation and struggled, in twice, toward the opening. Upon him now, in addition to the Dolgonian's compulsion, beat at point blank range the full power of Wurzel's mighty mind, demanding release and compliance, also, and worse. He perceived that some powerful mentality was being exerted to make Ben Busker kill him. One blow of the Valyrian's ponderous mace would shatter helmet and skull. And all would be over. Once more the Dolgonians would have triumphed. But the stubborn Dutchman, although at the very verge of surrender, was still fighting. He would take one step forward. Bludgeon posed aloft, only to throw it convulsively backward, Again and again Van Buskirk repeated his futile performance, while the lensman struggled nearer and nearer the door. Finally, he reached it and kicked it shut. Instantly, the mental turmoil ceased and the two white and shaking patrolmen released the limp. Unconscious the lantern from his bonds. Wonder what we can do to help him revive, gasped Kinnison. But his solicitude was unnecessary. The Valanchian recovered consciousness as he spoke. Thanks to your wonderful power of resistance. I am alive and harmed, and know more of our foes and their methods than any other of my race has ever learned. Wurzel thought, feelingly, but it is of no value whatever unless I can send it back to Valancia. The Faust train is carried only by the metal of these walls. And if I make an opening in the wall to think through, however small. It will now mean death. Of course, the science of your patrol has not perfected an apparatus to drive through such a screen. No. Anyway, it seems to me that we'd better be worrying about something besides fout screens. Kinnison suggested. Surely, now that they know where we are, they'll be coming out here after us, and we haven't got much of any defense. They don't know where we are. Or care began the Valanchian. Why not broken Van Buskirk? An espire capable of such scanning as you showed Dewey never saw anything like it. Beffer will certainly be as easy to trace as an outnut gas blast I sent out no spire or anything of the canned. Wurzel thought, carefully, since Cyrus science is so foreign to yours, I am not sure that I can explain satisfactorily, but I shall try to do so. First, as to what you saw. When that door is open, no barrier to thought exists. I merely broadcast a thought, placing myself and rapport with the Delbonian overlords in their retreat. This condition established. Of course I heard and saw exactly what they heard and saw, and so, equally of course, did you, since you were also in rapport with me. That is all. That soul echoed Van Buskirk. What a system you can do a thing like that without apparatus of any kind, and yet say that solid is results that point. Wurzel reminded him gently, while it is true that we have done Muttis is the first time in history that any Valanchian has encountered the mind of a Delgonian overlord and lived, it is equally true that it was the willpower of you patrolmen that made it possible, not my mentality. Also, it remains true that we cannot leave this room and live, why won't we need weapons? asked Kinnison. 
Returning to his previous line of thought, foot screens are the only defense we will require, Worsell stated, positively, for they use no weapons except their minds. By mental power alone they make us come to them. If, once there, their slaves do the rest. Of course, if my race is ever to rid the planet of them, we must employ offensive weapons of power. We have sucked, but we have never been able to use them. For, in order to locate the enemy, either by telepathy or by spiray, we must open our metallic shield and the instant we release those screens we are lost. From those conditions there is no escape. Worsell concluded, hopelessly, don't be such a pessimist. Kinnison commanded, there are a lot of things not tried yet. For instance, from what I have seen of your generator equipment and that screen, you don't need a metallic conductor any more that a snake needs hips. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think we're a bit ahead of you there. If a devil bis projector can handle that screen, and I think it can, with special tuning naphs, curbins, and I can fix things in an hour so that all three of us can walk out of here in perfect safety me at mental interference. At least, while we're trying it out, tell us all the new stuff you got on them just now, and anything else that, by any possibility, may prove useful. And remember you said this is the first time any of you had been able to cut them off. That fact ought to make them sit up and take notice. Probably they'll stir around more than they ever did before. Come on. Bull stairs tear into it the devil bis projectors were rigged and tuned. Kinnison had been right. They worked. Then plan after plan was made. Only to be discarded as its weaknesses were pointed out. Whichever way we look there are too many ifs and buts to suit me. Kinnison summed up the situation finally. If we can fan them and if we can get up close to them without losing our minds to them, we could clean them out if we had some power in our accumulators. So I'd say the first thing for us to do is to get our batteries charged. We saw some cities from the air, and cities always have power. Led us to power. Worse almost any kind of powered, and we'll soon have it in our guns. There are cities... Yes, Willis was not at all enthusiastic places of the ordinary Dalgonians. The people you saw being eaten in the cavern of the overlords. As you saw, they resemble us Valanchians to a certain extent, since they are of lower culture and are much weaker in life force than we are. However, the overlords perforce to their own slave races. To visit any city of Delgan is out of the question. Every inhabitant of every city is an abject slave, and his brain is an open book. Whatever he sees, whatever he thinks, is communicated instantly to his master. And I now perceive that I may have misinformed you as to the overlord's ability to use weapons. While the situation has never risen, it is only logical to suppose that as soon as we are seen by any Dilgonian, the controllers will order all the inhabitants of the city to capture us and bring us to them. What a guy interjected Van Buskirk. Did you ever see his top four looking at the bright side of life only in conversation? The Lensman replied, When the ether gets crowded, you notice? He's right in here, blasting away and not saying a word. But there's one thing we haven't thought of. Power. I got only eight minutes of free flight left in my battery, and with your mass, you must be about out. Come to think of it. Didn't you land a trifle hard when we set down here practically a note? That means we've got to get some power. Well, it's not so bad. At that, there's a city right close. Yes, but as far as I'm concerned, it might as well be on Mars. You know as well as I do what's between here and there. You can take my batteries and I'll wait here. On your emergency food. Water. And dare that's out what else. Then I can spread my field to cover all three of us. Proposed Kinnison. That will give us at least one minute of free flight home stuff. If not quite. Enough to clear the jungle. They have night here. If. Like us. The Dilgonians are night sleepers. We start at dusk, and to night we recharge our batteries. 
the following hour, during which the huge hot sun dropped to the horizon, was spent in intense discussion, but no significant improvement upon the Lentzman's plan could be devised. It is time to go, Worsell announced, curling out one extensile light toward the vanishing orb. I have recorded all my findings. Already I have lived longer and, for you, have accomplished more than any one believed possible. I am ready to die. I should have been dead long since. Living on borrowed times a lot better than not living at all. Kinnison replied, with a grin. Link up. Ready go, he snapped his switches in the clothes like a group of three shot into the air and away. As far as the night could reach in any direction extended the sentient, ravenous growth of the jungle. But Kinnison's eyes were not upon that fantastically inimical green carpet. His whole attention was occupied by two alma print meters and by the task of so directing their flight as to gain the greatest possible horizontal distance with the power at his command. Fifty seconds of flashing flight. Then, all right. Wassel, get out in front and get ready to pull Kinnison snapped. Ten seconds of drive left. But I can hold us three, four, five seconds after my driver quits. Pull Kinnison's driver expired its small accumulator completely exhausted, and Worsell, with his mighty wings, took up the task of propulsion, inertial still, with Kinnison and Ben Busker grasping his tail, each beat a mile or leap. He struggled on, but all too soon the battery powering the neutralizers also went dead and the three began to plummet downward at a sharper and sharper angle, in spite of the Valanchian's Herculean efforts to keep them aloft, some distance ahead of them the green of the jungle ended in a sharply cut line, beyond which there was a heavy growth of fairly open forest. A couple of miles of this and there was the city. Their object eaves so near and yet so far we'll either just make the timber or we just want. Kinnison, mentally plotting the course, announced dispassionately, just as well if we land in the jungle. I think it'll break our fall. Anyway, and hitting solid ground inert at this speed might be pretty serious. If we land in the jungle, we will never leave it. Wurzel's thought did not slow the incredible tempo of his prodigious pinions to vent. It makes little difference whether I die now or later. It does to us. You pessimistic proper flared Kinnison. Forget that dying complex of yours for a minute. Remember the plan and follow it. We are going to strike the jungle about ninety or a hundred meters in. If you come in with us, you die at once. And the rest of our scheme is all shot to pieces. So when we let go, you go ahead and land in the woods. We'll join you there. Never fear. Our armor will hold long enough for us to cut our way through a hundred meters of any jungle that ever grew in this one. Get ready. Lusk. Meadow they dropped. Through the lush secluence of close specked upper leaves and tentacles, they crafts or do the heavier wooded main branches below, through to the ground, and there they fought for their lips. For those voracious plants nourished themselves not only upon the soil in which their roots were embedded, but also upon anything organic and lucky enough to come within reach. Flabby but tough tentacles encircled them, ghastly sucking discs, exuding a potent corrosive slobbered wetly at their armor. Nobbit and spiky bludgeons wonged against tempered steel as the monstrous organisms began inly to realize that these particular titbits were encased in something more resistant for than skin, scales, or bark. But the Lensman and his giant companion were not quiescent. They came down oriented and fighting. Van Buskirk, on the dan, swung his frightful space axe as a reaper swings his siphon a solid, short step forward with each swing, and close behind the Valyrian strode Kinnison, his own flying axe guarding the giant's head and back. Masses of that obscene vegetation crashed down upon their heads from above, revolting cuptorophyses sucking and smacking, and they were showered continually with floods of the cake, corrosive sap to the action of which even their armor was not entirely immune. Above, hampered as they were and almost blinded. They struggled indomitably on, 
while behind them an ever lentinging corridor of demolition marked their progress. Ain't we got fun grunted the Dutchman, in time with his swing. But we're quite a team at that. Chef Reigns and Braun. Paul ha dissented Kinnison, his flying weapon a solid disc of steel to the knife. Grace and pose. Bort, if you want to be really romantic. Hammond eggs. Rack and ruin will be more like it if we don't break out before this confounded goo eats through our armor. But we are making it he stops spinning out and I think I can see trees up ahead. It is well if you can. Came a cold. Clear thought from Warsaw. For I am sorely beset. Hasten or I perish at that thought the two patrolmen forged ahead in a burst of furious activity. Crashing through the finning barriers of the jungle's edge, they wiped their lenses partially clear, glanced quickly about, and so the Valanchian. That worthy was sorely beset indeed. Six animashliage, reptilian. But lie the dact of it him down. So helplessly immobile was Warsaw that he could scarcely move his tail, and the monsters were already beginning to gnaw at his scaly. Armored hide. I'll put a stop to that, Warsaw called Kinnison referring to the fact, well known to all us moderns, that any real animal, no matter how savage, can be controlled by any wearer of the lens. For, no matter how long the scale of intelligence that animal is, the lensman can get in touch with whatever mind the creature has in reason with it. But these menstruosities, as Kinnison learned it immediately, were not really animals, even though of animal form and mobility, they were purely vegetable in motivation and behavior, reacting only to the stimuli of food and of reproduction, weirdly and completely inimical to all other forms of created life. They were sorterly noisome, so completely alien that the full power of mind and lens failed entirely to gain rapport. Upon that confused old driving heat the patrolmen flung themselves, terrible axes destructively a swing, and turn. They were attacked viciously. But this battle was not long to endure. Dan Busfersing first terrific blow knocked one adversary away, almost spinning end over end. Kinnison took out one, the Dutchman another, and the remaining three were no match at all for the humiliated and furiously raging Valanchian. But it was not until the monstrosities had been gruesomely carved and torn apart, literally limb from hideous limb, that they ceased their incense to leave voracious attacks. They took me by surprise, explained Warsaw, unnecessarily, as the three made their way through the night toward their goal, and six of them at once were too much for me. I tried to hold their minds, but apparently they have none. How about the overlords? asked Kinnison. Suppose they have received any of our thoughts. We patrolmen at least have been doing a lot of unguarded radiating lately. No. Wurzel made positive reply. The Faust trained batteries, while small and of very little actual power, have nevertheless a very long service life. Now let us again go over the next steps of our plan of action, since no more toward events marred their progress toward the Dilgonian city. They soon reached it. It was for the most part dark and quiet, its somber buildings merely blacker blobs against a background of black. Here and there, however, were to be seen not a motor vehicles moving about, and the three invaders crouched against a convenient wall, waiting for one to come along the street in which they were. Eventually one did. As it passed them, Worsel sprang into headlong, gliding flight. Kinnison's heavy knife in one gnarled fist, and as he sailed he struck fully. Before that luckless Dilgonian's brain could radiate a single thought it was in no condition to function at all, for the head containing it was bouncing in the gutter. Worsel backed the peculiar conveyance along the curb and his two companions leapt into it, lying flat upon its floor and covering themselves from sight as best they could. Wassel, Familiar with things Dolgonian and looking enough like a native of the planet to pass a casual inspection in the dark, drove the car. Streets and thoroughfares he traversed at reckless speed, finally drawing up before a long, 
low building, entirely dark, he scanned his surroundings with care. In every direction, not a preacher was in sight. All is clear. Friends, he thought, and the three adventurers sprang to the building's entrance. The Durit had a door. Of sorts was locked. But Van Buspersing Axe made short work of that difficulty. Inside, they graced the wrecked door against intrusion. Then Worsell led the way into the lighted interior. Soon he flashed his lamp about him and stepped upon a black, peculiarly marked tile set into the floor, whereupon a harch, white light illuminated the room. Cut it. Before somebody takes alarm, snapped Kinnison. No danger of that, replied the Valanchian. There are no windows in any of these rooms. No light can be seen from outside. This is the control room of the city's power plant. If you can convert any of this power to your uses, help yourselves to it. In this building is also Delvin's closest approximation to a munitions plant. Whether or not anything in it can be of service to you is, of course, for you to say, I am now at your disposal. While the Valanchian was thinking these things, Kinnison had been studying the panels and instruments. Now he and Van Busker tore open their armor fee had already learned that the atmosphere of Delgan, while not as wholesome for them as that in their suits, woved, for a time at least, support human life and wrought diligently with pliers, screwdrivers, and other tools of the electrician. Soon their exhausted batteries were upon the floor beneath the instrument panel, greedily absorbing the electrical fluid from the buspers of the Dolgonians. But, while they're getting filled up, let's see what they mean by munitions in these parts. Kinnison ordered, lead and, Worsel vied, with Worsel in the lead. The three interlopers hastened along a corridor, past branching and intersecting hallways, to a distant wing of the structure. There, it was evident, manufacturing of weapons was carried on, but a quick study of the queer-looking devices and mechanisms upon the benches and inside the storage racks lining its walls convinced Kinnison that the room could yield them nothing of permanent benefit. There were high-powered beam projectors. It was true, but they were so heavy that they were not even semi-portable. There were also hand weapons of various peculiar patterns, but without exception they were ridiculously inferior to the delameters of the patrol in every respect of power. Range controllability, and storage capacity. Nevertheless, after testing them out sufficiently to make certain of the above findings, Kinnison selected an armful of the most powerful models and turned to his companions. Let's go back to the power room. He urged, I'm nervous as a cat. I feel stark naked without my batteries. And if any one should happen to drop in there and do away with them, we be sunk without a trace, loaded down with Delgonian weapons. They hurried back the way they had come. Much to Kinnison's relief he found that his forbiddings had been groundless. The batteries were still there, still absorbing Miriara Tower after Miriara Tower from the Delgonian generators. Staring fixedly at the Nokwasonkaping containers, he frowned and thought, Better we insulate those leads a little heavier and put the cans back in our armor. He suggested finally. They'll charge just as well in place. And it doesn't stand to reason that this drain of power can go on for the rest of the night without somebody noticing it. And when that happens those overlords are bound to take plenty of step check nature of none of which we can even guess at. We must have power enough now so that we can all fly away from any possible trouble. Worsell suggested. But that's just exactly what we are not going to do, Kinnison declared. With finality, now that we've found a good charger, we aren't going to leave it until our accumulators are chocklebock. It's coming in faster than full draft will take it out. And we are going to get a full charge if we have to stand off all the vermin of Delvin to do it. For longer than Kinnison had thought possible, they were unmolested. But finally a couple of Delgonian engineers came to investigate the unprecedented shortage in the output of their completely automatic generators. At the entrance they were stopped. 
for no ordinary tools could force the barricade Van Buskirk had erected behind that portal. With leveled weapons the patrolmen stood, awaiting the expected attack. But none developed, or by or the long night wore away, uneventfully. At daybreak, however, a storming party appeared and massive battering mares were brought into play. As the dull, heavy concussions reverberated throughout the building, the patrolmen each picked up two of the weapons piled before them, and Kinnison addressed the Valanchian. Drag a couple of those metal benches across that corner and coil up behind them, he directed. They'll be enough to ground any stray charges. If they can see you, they won't know you're here. So probably nothing much will come your way direct. The Valanchian demurred declaring that he would not hide while his two companions were fighting his battle. But Kinnison silenced him fiercely. Don't be a fool, the lensman snapped. One of these beams would fry new to a crisp in ten seconds, whereas the defensive fields of our armor could neutralize a thousand of them. From nay on, do as I say, and do it quick, or I'll be mew unconscious and toss you in there myself, realizing that Kinnison meant exactly what he said, and knowing that, unarmador as he was, he was utterly unable to resist either the Telluria nor their common foe. Worsell unwillingly erected his metallic barrier and coiled his sinuous length behind it. He hit himself just in time. The outer barricade had fallen, and now a wave of reptilian forms flooded into the control room. Nor was this any ordinary investigation. The overlords had studied the situation from afar, and this wave was one of heavily armed Earth Delgon Distillery. And they came, projectors fiercely aflame, confident in their belief that nothing could stand before their blasts. But har on they were the two repulsively erect backs before them neither burned nor fell. Beams, no matter how powerful, did not reach them. Illustration The two repulsively erect backs before them neither burned nor fell. Beams, no matter how power fell, did not reach them at all, nor were these outlandish beings inoffensive, utterly careless of the service life of the pitifully weak Dilgonian projectors. They were using them at maximum drain and at extreme aperturidant in the resultant beams the Dilgonian soldier slaves fell in scorched and smoking heaps. On came reserves, platoon after platoon, only and continuously to meet the same fate, for as soon as one projector weakened the invincibly armored man would toss it aside and pick up another. But finally the last commandeered weapon was exhausted and the beleaguered pair brought their own Delametish most powerful portable weapons known to the military scientists of the Galactic Patrol Interplay. And what a difference in those beams the attacking reptiles did not smoke or burn. They simply vanished in a blaze of flaming light. So did also the nearby walls and a good share of the building beyond the Dilgonian hordes having disappeared. Van Buskirk shut off his delimeter. Kinnison, however, left his eye, angling its beam sharply upward, blasting into fiery vapor the ceiling and roof over their heads, remarking, While we were at it we might as well fix things so that we can make a quick getway if we want to. Then they waited. Waited watching the needles of their meters creep ever closer to the full charge marks, waited while, as they shrewdly suspected, the distant, cowardly hiding overlords planned some other, more promising line of physical attack. Nor was it long in developing. Another small army appeared, armored this time, or, more accurately, advancing behind metallic shields, knowing what to expect, Kinnison was not surprised when the beam of his Delameter not only failed to pierce one of those shields, but did not in any way impede the progress of the Dulgonian column. Well, we rolled on here. Anyway, as far as I'm concerned, Kinnison grinned at the Dutchman as he spoke. My cans have been showing full back pressure for the last five minutes. How about your same here? Van Buskirk reported and the two leapt lightly into the Valanchian's refuge. Then, inertial Zol, the three shot into the air at such a pace that to the slow senses of the Dilgonian slaves they simply disappeared. Indeed, it was not until the barrier had been blasted away in every room. Luck, 
and cranny of the immense structure had been literally and minutely combed that the Dalgoni and in through their enslaved minds the overworld smocked convinced that their prey had in some uncanny and unknown fashion eluded them now high in the air the three troopers traversed in a matter of minutes the same distance that had cost them so much time and strife the day before over the monster finted forest base fed over the deceptively peaceful green lushness of the jungle to slant down toward Worsell's fought protent. Inside that refuge they snapped off their felt screens and Kinnison yawned prodigiously. Working days and nights both is all right for a while, but it gets monotonous in time. Since this seems to be the only really safe spot on the planet, I suggest that we take a day or so off and catch up on our reeds and sleeps. They slept in date. Slept in date again. The next thing on the program, Kinnison announced then, is to clean out that den of overlords. Then Worsell will be free to help us get going about our own business. You speak lightly indeed of the impossible. Wassel, again all glum despondency, reproved him. I have already explained why the task is, and must remain, beyond our power. Yes, but you don't quite grasp the possibilities of the stuff we've got to work with now. The Tellurian replied, Listen, you could never do anything because you couldn't see through or work through your thought screens. Neither we nor you could, even now, enslave a Delgonian and make him lead us to the cavern. Because the overlords would know all about it way ahead of time and the slave would let us anywhere else except to the cavern. However, one of us can cut his screen and surrender possibly keeping just enough screen up to keep the enemy from possessing his mind fully enough to learn that the other two are coming along. The big question you wish of us is to surrender that is already decided. Worsell made instant reply. I am the logical in fact. The only onu to do it. Not only would they think it perfectly natural that they should overpower me, but also I am the only one of us three sufficiently able to control his thoughts so as to keep from them the knowledge that I am being accompanied. Furthermore, you both know that it would not be good for your minds, unaccustomed as they are to the practice, to surrender their control voluntarily to an enemy. I'll say it wouldn't Kinnison agreed. Feelingly, I might do it if I had to, but I wouldn't like it and don't think I'd ever quite get over it. I hate to put such a horrible job off onto you, Wassel, but you're undoubtedly the best equipped to handle light and even you may have your hands full. Yes, the Valanchian said, thoughtfully, while the undertaking is no longer an absolute impossibility, it is difficult, Lordy. In any event, you will probably have to be me yourselves. If we succeed in reaching the cavern, the overlords will see to that it's so. Do it without regret. Know that I expect it and am well content to die in that fashion. Thousands of better men than I am would be only too glad to be in my place. Meaning what it does to all the lanchon. Know also that I have already reported what is to occur, and that your welcome to the lanchon is assured. Whether or not I accompany you there, I don't think I'll have to kill you. Wassel. Kinnison replied. Slowly. Picturing in detail exactly what that steehard reptilian body would be capable of doing when, unshackled, its directing mind was completely taken over by an utterly soulless and conscientious overlord. If we can't keep from going off the deep end, of course you'll get pretty tough, and I know that you're hard to handle. However, as I told you back there, I think I can beam you unconscious without killing you. I may have to burn off a few scales. But I'll try not to do any damage that can't be repaired. If you can so stop me, it will be wonderful indeed. Are we ready? They were ready. Worsell opened the door and in a moment was hurtling through the air. His giant wings arrowing him along at a pace no winged creature of earth would even approach. If, following him easily at a little distance, floated the two patrolmen upon their inertials drives. During that long flight, scarcely a thought was exchanged even between Kinnison and Van Busburg. To direct a thought at the Valanchian was, of course, out of the question. 
all lines of communication with him had been cut if furthermore his mind able as it was was being taxed to the ultimate cell in doing what he had set out to do and the two patrolmen were reluctant to converse with each other even upon their tight beams reviews or sounders for fear that some slight leakage of thought energy might reveal their presence to the ever tructual overlords if this opportunity were lost they knew another chance to wipe out that hellish horde might never present itself land was traversed and seed but finally a stupendous range of mountains reared before them and worsel folding back his tireless wings shot downward in a screaming full white dive in his line of flight kinnison saw the mouth of a cave a darker spot of blackness in the black rock of the mountain side upon the ledged approach there lay at elgonegin guard or lookout of course the lensman's delimeter was already in his hand and at sight of the guardian reptile he sighted and fired in one incredibly fast motion but rapid as it was it was still too slow the overlords had seen that the valanchian had companions of whom he had been able to keep them in ignorance theretofore instantly worsel's wings again began to beat bearing him off at a wide angle if although the patrolmen were insulated against his thought the meaning of his antics was very plain he was telling them in every possible way that the hole below was not the cavern of the overlords that it was over this way that they were to keep on following him to it then as they refused to follow him he rushed upon kinnison in mad attack beam him down kim van buskirk yelled don't take any chances with that bird he levelled his own delimeter may ulf must the lensman snapped i can handle him a lot easier out here than on the ground and so it proved inertials as he was the buffetings of the valanchian affected him not at all and when worsel coiled his supple body around him and began to apply pressure kinnison simply expanded his faust rein to cover them both thus releasing the mind of his temporarily inimical friend from the overlord's grip instantly the valanchian became himself snapped on his own shield and the three continued as one their interrupted downward course illustration inertials as he was the buffetings of the valanchian affected him not at all and he simply expanded his faust trained corsal came to a halt upon the ledge beside the practically incinerated corpse of the lookout knowing a narmader as he was that to go farther meant sudden death the armored pair however shot on into the gloomy passage at first they were offered no opposition the overlords had had no time to muster an adequate defense scattering handfuls of slaves rushed them only to be blasted out of existence as their hand weapons proved useless against the armor of the galactic patrol defenders became more numerous as the cavern itself was approached but neither were they allowed to stay the patrolman's progress finally a palely shimmering barrier of metal appeared to bar their way its fields of force neutralized or absorbed the blasts of the delimeters but its material substance offered but little resistance to a turn to pounce ledge won by one of the strongest men ever produced by any planet colonized by the humanity of earth now they were in the cavern its full centum sanctum of the overlords of delvin there was the hellish torture screen with its burden of mental and physical pain there was the horribly avid audience now milling about in a mob frenzy of panic there upon a raised balcony were the big shots of this nauseous clan now doing their utmost to marshal some force able to cope effectively with this and dohoff violation of their radial immunity a last wave of dilgonian slaves hold themselves forward futile projectors furiously aflame only to disappear in the delimeter's fans of force the patrolmen hated to kill those mindless slaves but it was a nasty job that had to be done the slaves out of the way those ravening beams bored on into the massed overlords and now kinnison and van busker killed if not joyously at least relentlessly mercilessly and with neither sign nor sensation of compunction 
for this unbelievably monstrous tribe needed killing. Root and branch, not a scion or shoot of it should be allowed to survive. To continue to contaminate the civilization of the galaxy, back and forth, to and fro, up and down swept the raging beams of the Delameters, playing on until in all the vast volume of that gruesome chamber nothing lived save the two grim figures in its portal, assured of this fact, but with Delameters still in hand. The two destroyers retraced their way to the tunnel's mouth, where Worsell anxiously awaited them. Lines of communication again established. Kinnison informed the Valanchian of all that had taken place, and the latter gradually cut down the power of his first rank. Soon it was at zero strength, and he reported jubilantly that for the first time in untold ages, the overlords of Delgan were off there, but surely the danger isn't over yet, protested Kinnison. We couldn't have got them all in this one raid. Some of them must have escaped, and there must be other dens of them on this planet somewhere, possibly. Possibly. The Valanchian waved his tail Lara life first sign of joyousness he had shown. But their power is broken. Definitely and forever. With these new screens, and with the alarms and armament which, thanks to you, we can now fabricate. The task of wiping them out completely will be comparatively simple. Now you will accompany me to Valanche where, as sure, the resources of the planet will be put solidly behind you in your own endeavors. I have already summoned a space ship. In less than twelve days we will be back in Valanche and at work upon your projects. In the meantime twelve days holy jumping rockets Van Buskirk exploded. Kinnison said, Shorio forget that they knew nothing of our free drive. We'd better hop over and get our lifeboat. I think it's not so good. Either way, but in our own boat we'll be open to detection less than two hours. As against twelve days in the Valanchians. And the pirates may be here any minute. It's as good as certain that their ship will be stopped and searched long before it gets back to Valancha. And if we were aboard it would be just too bad. If since the crew knows about us, the pirates soon will, and it'll be just too bad. Anyway, Dan Busker creasoned. Not at all. Interposed Worsall. The few of my people who know of you have been instructed to seal that knowledge. I must admit, however, that I am greatly disturbed by your conceptions of these pirates of space. You so. Until I met you I knew nothing more of the pirates than I did of your patrol. What a world Van Buskirk exclaimed. No patrol and no pirates, but at that, life might be simpler without both of them and without the free space drive more like it used to be in the good old airplane days that the novelists rave about. Of course, I could not judge as to that. The Valanchian was very serious. This in which we live seems to be a night for the section of the galaxy. Or it may be that we have nothing that the pirates want. More likely it's simply that, like the patrol, they haven't but organized into this district yet, suggested Kinnison. There are so many millions of solar systems in the galaxy that it will probably be thousands of years yet before the patrol gets into them all. But about these pirates, Worsell went back to his point. If they have such minds as those of the overlords, they will be able to break the seals of our minds. However, I gather from your thoughts that their minds are not of that strength not so far as I know. Kinnison replied, You folks have the most powerful brains I've ever heard of, short of their origins, and speaking of mental power. You can hear thoughts a lot farther than I can, even with my lens or with this pirate receiver I've got. See if you can find out whether there are any pirates in space around here. Will you while the Valanchian was concentrating? Then Busker casked. Why, if his mind is so strong, could the overlords put him under so much easier than they could us weakmen if humans you are confusing mind with will? I think ages of submission to the overlords made the Valanchian's willpower zero. As far as the bosses were concerned, on the other hand, you and I could raise stubbornness to sell to most people. In fact, if the overlords had succeeded in really breaking us down, back there, 
I believe that we would have been insane for the rest of our lives. Probably you're right. We break, but don't bend. How then the Valanchian was ready to report. I have scanned space to the nearest star some eleven of your like years and have encountered no intruding entities. He announced. Eleven like Yusha's to range, Kinnison exclaimed. However, that's only a shade over two minutes for a pirate ship at full blast. But we've got to take a chance some time. And the quicker we get started, the sooner we'll get back. We'll pick you up here. Wassel, no use in you going back to your tent. We'll be back here long before you could reach it. You'll be safe enough, I think, especially with our spare delimeters. Let's get going. Bus again they shot into the air. Again they traversed fearless depths of interplanetary space. To locate the temporary tomb of their life but required only a few minutes. To disinter her only a few more. Then again they braved detection in the verd. Kinnis intense at his controls. Van Busper constrained attention listening to and staring at his inscramblums and detectors. But the ether was still blank as they materialized in an inertial's landing beside the waiting Valanchian. All right. Wassel. Snap it up, Kinnison called, and went on to Van Buskirk. But, you but, flat-footed Balerian space hound. I hope that that spaceman's god of yours will see to it that our look holds good for just seven minutes more. We've had more look already than we had any right to expect, but we can't put a little more to most goshawful good use in a shabby cage does bring spacemen luck, insisted the giant, grimacing a peculiar salute toward a small, golden image set inside his helmet. And the fact that you warty, wanty little space fleas of Tellus haven't got sense enough to know it, doesn't change matters at all. That's tell and damn. Buskinis and applaud of, but if it helps charge your batteries, go to it. Ready to blast, lift the Valanchian had come aboard. The tiny airlock was again tight, and the little vessel shot away from Delgan toward Far Valanche. And still the ether remained empty as far as the detectors could reach. Nor was this fact surprising, in spite of the lensman's fears to the contrary. For the patrolman had given the pirates such an extremely long line to cover that many days must yet elapse before the minions of Boscarn would get around to visit that an important, unexplored, and almost unknown solar system. En route to his home planet, Wurzel got in touch with the crew of the Valanchian vessel already in space, ordering them to return to Port Post Hast and instructing them in detail what to think and how to act should they be stopped and searched by one of Boscarn's raiders. By the time these instructions had been given, the lanche loomed large beneath the flying midget. Then, with Worsel as guide, Kinnison drove over a mighty ocean upon whose opposite shore lay the great city in which Worsel lived. But I would like to have them welcome you as befits what you have done. And have you go to the dome, mourned the Valanchian. Think of it, you have done a thing which for ages the massed power of the planet has been trying vainly to accomplish. And yet you insist that I alone take full and complete credit for it. I don't insist on any such thing, argued Kinnison, even though it's practically all yours. Anyway, I insist only on your keeping us and the patrol out of it. And you know as well as I do why you've got to do that. Tell them anything else you want to. So that a couple of pink-headed Chicladorians helped you and then beat it back home. That planet's far enough away so that if the pirates chase them, they'll get a real run for their money. After this blows over, you can tell the truck, but not until then. And as for us going to the dome for a grand haucus boostus, that is completely and definitely out. We're not going anywhere except to the biggest space yard you've got. You're not going to give us anything except a lot of material and a lot of highly trained help that can keep their costs sealed. We've got to build a lot of heavy stuff fast, and we've got to get started on it just as quickly as the gods of space will let us be. Worsel knew his council of scientists, as well he might, since it developed that he himself ranked high in that select circle. True to his promises, the largest spaceport of the planet was immediately emptied of its customary personnel. 
which was replaced the following morning by an entirely new group of workmen. Nor were these replacements ordinary laborers. They were young, keen, and highly trained, taken to a man from behind the fout screens of the scientists. It is true that they had no inkling of what they were to do, since none of them had ever dreamed of the possibility of such engines as they were to be called upon to construct. But, upon the other hand, they were well versed in the fundamental theories and operations of mathematics, and from pure mathematics to applied mechanics is but a step. Furthermore, they had brains burn how to think logically, coherently, and effectively, and needed neither driving nor supervisionally instruction, and best of all, practically every one of the required mechanisms already existed, in miniature, within the Britannia's life boat, ready at hand for their dissection, analysis, and enlargement. It was not lack of understanding which was to slow up the work. It was simply that the planet did not boast machine tools and equipment large enough or strong enough to handle the necessarily huge and heavy parts and members required, while the construction of this heavy machinery was being rushed through. Kinnison and Van Buskirk devoted their efforts to the fabrication of an ultra-sensed of its receiver, tunable to the parrot's scrambled wave bands, with their exactly detailed knowledge, and with the cleverest technicians and the choicest equipment of Villanche at their disposal, the set was soon completed. Kinnison was giving its exceedingly delicate corals their final alignment when Worsell wriggled blithely into the radio laboratory. Why? Kimball Kinnison of the lens he called gaily, throwing some twenty feet of his serpent's body in lightning loops about a convenient pillar, he made a horizontal bar of the rest of himself and dropped one wing tip to the floor. Then, nonchalantly upside down, he thrust out three or four eyes and culled their stalks over the lensman's shoulder, the better to inspect the results of the mechanic's efforts. Gone was the morose, pessimistic, deaf out and worsel who had wrought and fought beside the armored pair upon fantastically inimical Delgan. This was a new worsel entirely. May, happy, carefree, and actually frolic, Kim a few can imagine a thirty faulting, crocavillated, leather winged python as being frolic, Kim hide. Your royal snakeship, Kinnison retorted in kind. Still here. I thought you'd be back on Delvin by this time, cleaning up the rest of that mess. The equipment is not ready, but there's no hurry about that. The playful reptile unwrapped ten or twelve feet of tail from the pillar and waved it airily about. Their power is broken. Their race is done. You are about to try out the new receiver yeg zone out after them right now. Kinnison began deftly to manipulate the micrometric verniers of his dials. As fixed upon meters and gauges, he lit Sintelst in his power and listened again. More and more power he applied to his apparatus listening continually. Suddenly he stiffened, his hands becoming rockstall. He listened, if possible even more intently than before, and as he listened his face grew grim and granahittered. Then the micrometers began again, crawlingly, to move, as though he were tracing a beam. Thus hook on the focusing beam antenna he snapped. It's going to take every millibit of power we've got in this hookup to tap his beam, but I think that I've got Helmuth direct. Instead of through a parish to prelay again and again, he checked the readings of his dials and of the directors of his antenna, each time noting the exact time of the Valanchian day. There as soon as we get some time. Wassel, I'd like to work out these figures with some of your astronomers. They'll give me a right line through to Helmuth's heat core trustbury hope. Some day, if I'm spared, I'll get another. What kind of news did you get? asked Van Busper. Good and bad both, replied the lensman. Good in that Helmuth doesn't believe that we stayed with his ship as long as we did. He's a suspicious devil, you know, and is pretty well convinced that we tried to run the same kind of a blazer on him that we did the other time. Since he hasn't got enough ships on the job to work the whole line, he's concentrating on the other end. That means that we've got plenty of days left. 
the bad part of it is that they've got four of our boats already and are bound to get more lord how i wish i could call the rest of them some of them could certainly make it here before they got caught might i then offer a suggestion asked worsell suddenly diffident surely the lensman replied in surprise your ideas have never been any kind of poppycock by so bashful all at once because this one is so hazo peculiarly personal since you men regard so highly the privacy of your minds our two sciences as you have already observed are vastly different you are far beyond us in mechanics physics chemistry and the other applied sciences well on the other hand have delved much deeper than have you into psychology and the other introspective studies for that reason i know positively that the lens you wear is capable of enormously greater things than you are at present able to perform of course i cannot use your lens directly since it is attuned to your own ego however if the idea appeals to you i could with your consent occupy your mind and use your lens to put you in rapport with your fellows I have not volunteered the suggestion before because I know how averse your mind is to any foreign control. Not necessarily to foreign control. Kinnison corrected him. Only to enemy control. The idea of friendly control never occurred to me. That would be an entirely different breed of cats. Go to it, Kinnison relaxed his mind completely. And that of the Valanchian came welling in. Wave upon friendly surging wave of benevolent power and not only or not precisilurite it was more than power it was a calm cool placid certainty a depth and clarity of perception that kinnison in his most cogent moments had never dreamed a possibility the possessor of that mind knew things chemicolor and microscopic detail which the keenest minds of earth could perceive only as to tickly and distinct masses of mental light and shade of no recognizable pattern whatever give me the thought pattern of him with whom you wish first to converse came worsell's thought this time from deep within the lensman's own brain kinnison felt a subtle thrill of uneasiness at that new and ultra strang dual personality but fought back steadily sorry's can't excuse me i should have known that you cannot think in our patterns think then of him as a person and individual that will give me i believe sufficient data into the earthman's mind there leapt a picture of henderson sharp and clear he felt his lens actually tingle and throb as a concentration of vital force such as he had never known poured through his whole being and into that almost filling creation of the regions and immediately thereafter he was in full mental communication with the chief pilot of the ill-fated britannia and there seated across the tiny mess table of their lifeboat was forndyke the master technician henderson came to his feet with a yell as the telepathic message bombarded into his brain and it required several seconds to convince him that he was not the victim of space insanity or suffering from any other form of hallucination once convinced however he acted his lifeboat shot toward for valentian at maximum blast then nelson allergy stompson jenkins zool and hit smith chatwick innocent called the role of the survivors nelson the britannia's communications officer answered his captain's call so did allergy the jubbling quartermaster so did doing hit a technician so did those in three other boats two of these three were apparently well within the danger zone and might get nicked in their dash but their crews elected without hesitation to take the chance. Four boats, it was already known, had been captured by the pirates. The remaining eight were either so distant as to be out of range of even the worst Lidrivnan lens, or they had been taken by pirates who had not yet reported to Helmuth. Eight out of twenty, Kinnison mused, not so good, but it could have been a lot worse. They might very well have taken us all by this time. Then he turned to the Valanchian, who had withdrawn his mind as soon as its task was done. Thanks, Wassel, he said simply. Some of those lads coming in have got plenty of just what it takes. 
and how we can use them one by one the lifeboats of the Britannia came into port, where their crews were welcomed briefly, but feelingly, before they were put to work. Nelson, the communications officer, among the last who arrived, was to the lensmen particularly welcome. Yells, we need you badly, Kinnison informed him as soon as greetings had been exchanged. The pirates have a beam, carrying a peculiarly scrambled wave that they can receive and decode through any kind of ordinary blanketing interference, and you're the best man of us all to study their system. Some of these Valanchian scientists can probably help you a lot on Fatney race that can develop a screen against foot figures to know more than somewhat about vibration in general. We've got working models of the pirates' instruments, so that you can figure out their patterns and formulas. That ought to be simple. When you've done that, I want you and your Valanchians to design something that will scramble all the pirates' communicator beams in space. From here to the near rim of the galaxy, if you can fix things so that they can't talk any more than we can, it'll help a lot. Believe me, Kiche. Shift. We'll give it the works. And the radio man called four tools. Apparatus and electricians. Then throughout the great spaceport the many Valanchians and the handful of patrolmen labored mightily. Side by side. And to very good effect indeed. Slowly, the port became ringed about by, and studded everywhere with monstrous mechanisms. Everywhere there were projectors, refractoratory demons ready to vomit forth every force known to the expert technicians of the patrol. There were absorbers, though backed by their bleeder resistors, air caps, ground rods, and racks for discharged accumulators. There, though were receptors and converters for the cosmic energy which was to empower many of the devices. There were, of course, atomic motor generators by this core, and battery upon battery of gigantic accumulators, and Nelson's high-powered scrambler was ready to go to work. These machines appeared crude, bluffed, and finished, for neither time nor labor had been wasted upon non essentialists but inside each one the moving parts fitted with micrometric accuracy and with hairspring balance. Ort, without exception, functioned perfectly. At Worsell's call, Kinnison climbed a pout of a great beam prith pit, the top of whose wall was practically composed of truck torbian projectors, pausing only to make sure that a sticking switch on one of the screen dime generators had been replaced. He hurried to the heavily armored control room, where his little force of fellow patrolmen awaited him. They're coming. Boys, he announced. You all know what to do. There are a lot more things that we could have done if we'd had more time. But as it is, we'll just go to work on them with what we've got. And Kinnison, again all brisk captain, bent over his instruments. In the ordinary course of events, the parrot would have flashed up to the planet with spirays out and issuing a peremptory demand for the planet to show a clean bill of health for to surrender instantly such fugitives as might lately have landed upon it. But Kinnison did not old not wot for that. The spirays, he knew, would reveal the presence of his armament. And such armament most certainly did not belong to this planet. Therefore, the instant that the pirate ship came within range of his detectors he acted, and forthwith everything happened at once, with furious swiftness. A tracer latched out, the pilot tray of the rim battery of extraordinarily powerful tractors. Under the verge of those beams the inertial ship flashed toward their center of action, which was the geometrical center of the spaceport's deep rayproof pit, at the same moment Nelson's scrambler burst into activity, a dumsreken against cosmic ingeriki intake, and a full circle of superpowder attacking rays. All these things occurred in that winkling of an eye, and the vessel was being slowed down by the atmosphere of Valancha before her startled commander could even realize that he was being attacked. Only the presence of automatically reacting defensive screens saved that ship from instant destruction, but they did so save it, and in seconds the pirate's every weapon was furiously ablaze. In vain, 
the defenses of that pit could take it. They were driven by mechanisms easily able to absorb the output of any equipment mountable upon a mobile base, and to his consternation the pirate found that his cosmic king Ricky intake was at, and remained at, zero. He sent tight call after call for help, but could not make contact with any other parrot station. Efer and Subifer alike were closed to him. His signals were blanketed completely. Nor could his drivers, even though operating at ruinous overload, move him from the geometrical center of that incandescently flaming pit. So inconceivably rigid were the tractor's clamps upon him, and soon his power began to fail. His vessel, designed to operate upon cosmic ingeric intake, carried only enough accumulators for stabilization of power flow, an amount ridiculously inadequate for a combat as profligate of energy as this. But, strangely enough, as his defense weakened, so lessened the power of the attack. It was no part of the Lensman's plan to destroy the super of the Boyard. That was one good thing about the old Britannia. He gritted as he cut down. Step by step. The power of his beams. Nobody could block her off from what power she had soon the stored up energy of the battleship was exhausted and she lay there, quiescent. Then giant pressers went into action and she was lifted over the wall of the pit to settle down in an open space beside it pond, but still under the domes of force. Kinnison had no needle rays as yet, the time at his disposal having been sufficient only for the construction of the absolutely essential items of equipment. But, while he was debating with his fellows as to what part of the vessel to destroy in order to wipe out its crew, the pirates themselves ended the debate. Ports yawned in the vessel's armored side and they came out fighting, for they were not a breed to die like rats in a trap and they knew that to remain inside their vessel was to die whenever and however their captors willed. They knew also that die they must if they could not conquer. Their surrender, even if it should be accepted, would mean only a somewhat later death in the lethal chambers of the law. In the open, they could at least take some of their foes with them. Furthermore, not being men as we know men, they had nothing in common with either human beings or Balanchans. Both of them were vermin, as they themselves were to the beings manning this surprisingly impregnable fortress here in this waste corner of the galaxy. Therefore, space-hardened veterans all, they fought, with the insane ferocity and desperation of the ultimately last stand, but they did not conquer. Instead, and to the last man, they dead, as soon as the battle was over, before the interference blanketing the pirates' communicators was cut off. Kinnison went through the captured vessel, destroying the headquarters' visiplates and every automatic sender which could transmit any kind of a message to any pirate base. Then the interference was stopped. The domes were released. The ship was removed from the field of operations. Then, while Thorndike and his reptilian eighty Fesmolts, now radio experts of no mean items, Matubri and themselves at installing a hypard scrambler aboard her, Kinnison and Wurzel scanned space in search of more prey. Soon they find it, more distant than the first one had been to her solar systems away and in an entirely different direction. Tracers and tractors and interference and domes of force again became the order of the day. Projectors again raved out in their incandescent might, and soon another immense cruiser of the void lay beside her sister ship, another and another. Then, for a long time, space was blank. The Lensman then energized his ultraverse, pointing his antenna carefully into the galactic line to helm of space, as laid down for him by the Valanchian astronomers. Again, so tight and hard was helm of speed. He had to drive his apparatus so immersively that the tube noise almost drowned out the signals. But again he was rewarded by hearing faintly the voice of the parrot director of operations. Four vessels, all within or near one of those five solar systems, have ceased communicating, each cessation being accompanied by a period of blanketing interference of a pattern never before registered. 
you two vessels who are receiving these orders are instructed to investigate that region with utmost care go with screens out and everything on the trips and with automatic recorders set on me here it is not believed that the patrol has anything to do with this as ability has been shown transcending anything it has been known to possess as a working hypothesis it is assumed that one of those solar systems hitherto practically unexplored and unknown is in reality the seat of a highly advanced race which perhaps has taken offence at the attitude or conduct of our first ship to visit them therefore proceed with extreme caution with a thorough spiry search at extreme range before approaching at all if you land you stacked in diplomacy instead of the customary tactics find out whether our ships and crews have been destroyed or are only being held and remember automatic reporters on at all times helmuth speaking for boss confoff four minutes guinnison manipulated his micrometer in vain he could not get another sun what are you trying to get kim asked forndyke wasn't that enough the message had been rebroducts to the minds of the others by worsel as fast as it had entered the lensman's ears no that's only half of it kinnison returned helmuth's nobody's full he's certainly trying to plot the boundaries of our interference and i want to see how he's coming out with it but no dice he's so far away and his beams so hard that i can't work him unless he happens to be talking almost directly toward us well it won't be long now until we'll give him some real interference to plot now we'll see what we can do about those two other ships that are heading this way on your toast everybody carefully as those two ships investigated and sedulously as they sought to obey helmut's instructions all their precautions amounted to exactly nothing as ordered they began a spiral survey at extreme range but even at that range kinnison's tracers were effective and those two ships also ceased communicating in a blaze of interference then recent history repeated itself the details were changed somewhat since there were two vessels instead of one but the pit was of ample size to accommodate two ships and the tractors could hold two as well and as rigidly as one the conflict was a little longer the beaming a little hotter and more coruscant but the ending was the same scramblers were quickly installed and kinnison addressed his men already in the ships well we were about ready to shove off again running away has worked twice so far with very good wrestleston in the old britannia and once in the pirates own ships it should work again if we can ring in enough variations on the theme to keep helmuth guessing a while longer maybe if the supply of pirate ships speaks up we'll be able to make helmuth furnish us transportation all the way back to base here's the idea we've got six ships and there's enough of us to drive them some of the younger valanchians have joined us in spite of the fact that i've told them the chances are against them ever getting back enough of them in fact to make up almost full crews of us all but six ships isn't enough of a squadron to fight through the fleets that helmuth will have organized if we go in a body so we'll spread out radially covering thousands of parsecs before we get halfway to base and broadcasting every watt of interference we can put out all along the way in as many different shapes and powers as our apparatus will permit we can't talk to each other of course but nothing else can talk anywhere in the same sector of the galaxy either and that will give us the edge each ship will be on its own as we were before in the boats the big difference being that we'll be in super drawings instead of lifeboats but wassel if the pirates check up and follow the disturbance we are going to make sure they won't bother you folks at all in fact if they ever succeed in finding the center of that interference there will be nothing there except empty space but if they don't follow you and helmuth is apt to insist upon a thorough study of this region before he does anything else you folks are due for an inspection and the next inspection will mean a real battle instead of a slaughter the first spirey will reveal this stuff here 
but I don't suppose you want to hide it or destroy it, we do not. The Valanchian replied, Positively, let them come, in whatever force they care to bring. The more that attack here, the less there will be to halt your progress. This armament represents the best of that possessed by both your patrol and the pirates, with improvements developed by your scientists and ours in full cooperation. We understand fully its construction, operation, and maintenance. You may rest assured that the pirates will never levy tribute upon us, and that any pirate visiting this system will remain in it permanently aids a knock. Were so long may you wiggle Kinnison exclaimed. Then, more seriously, maybe, after this is all over, I'll see you again sometime. It dot. Goodbye. Goodbye. All the lanch all set. Bose Cleary for and light landings to you all blast off six ships. One spirit craft. Now vessels of the Galactic Patrol. Hold themselves into and fru air. Into and fru interplanetary space. Out into the larger. Wyvern. More unobstructed emptiness of the interstellar void. Six. Each broadcasting with prodigious power and volume and allendless skip interference through which no pirate communicator or visere beam could possibly be driven nix. Kimball Kinnison sat at his controls, smoking a rare, festive cigarette and smiling, at peace with the entire universe. For this new picture was in every element a different one from the old. Instead of being in a pitifully weakened defenseless lifeboat, skulking and hiding, he was in one of the most powerful battleships afloat, driving boldly at full blast almost directly toward home. Instead of only two, the patrolmen were now three in number, and Lavone Forndike, master technician, was a telling addition to their force. Also, they had under them almost a normal crew of alert and highly trained Valanchians. Best of all, the enemy, instead of being a close contact group, keeping Helmuth informed moment by moment of the situation and instantly responsive to his orders, were now entirely out of communication with each other and with their headquarters, groping helplessly, literally, as well as figuratively. The pirates were in the dark, absolute blackness of interstellar space. Then Forndike entered the room. Frightening slightly, you look like the fabled Cheshire Cat. Him, he remarked. I hate to spill such perfect bliss, but I'm here to tell you that we ain't out of the woods yet, by seven thousand rows of trees. Maybe not, the lensman returned, blithely, but compared to the jam we were in a while ago, we are not only sitting on top of the world, we are perched right on the exact apex of the Nunibos. They can't send or receive reports or orders, and they can't communicate, even their detectors are mighty lame. You know how far they can get on electromagnetic detectors and visual apparatus. Furthermore, there isn't an identification number, symbol, or name on the outside of this buzz buddy. If it ever had won the friction and attrition have worn it off, clear down to the armor, what can happen that we can't cope with these engines can happen. The technician responded, bluntly, the Bergenholm is developing a meter jump that I don't like a little bit. Does she not or even tick? demanded Kinnison. Not yet. Forndike confessed, reluctantly. How big a jump? Pretty near two thousandths maximum. Average a thousand and a half. That's hardly a wiggle on the recorder line. Drivers run four months with bigger jumps than that. Eve Rivers. But of all the troubles anybody ever had with Bergen Holmes, a meter kick was never one of them and that's what's got me guessing as to the wishness of the why. I'm not trying to scare night. I'm just telling you. The machine referred to was the neutralizer of inertia, the sine qua non of interstellar speed, and it was not to be wondered at that the slightest irregularity in its performance was to the technician a matter of grave concern. Day after day passed, however, and the huge converter continued to function taking in and sending out its wanted torrents of power. It developed not even a tick, and the meter jump did not grow worse. 
and during those days that put an inconceivable distance behind them. During all this time their visual instruments remained blank. To all optical apparatus space was empty save for the normal tendency of celestial bodies. From time to time something invisible or beyond the range of vision registered upon one of the electromagnetic detectors. But so slow were these instruments that nothing came of their signals. In fact, by the time the warnings were recorded, the objects causing the disturbances were probably far astern. One day, however, the Bergen home quit called. There was no laboring, no knocking, no heating up, no warning at all. One instant the ship was speeding along in free flight. The next she was lying inert in space. She was practically motionless. For any possible velocity built up by inert acceleration is scarcely a crawl. As free space speeds go then the whole crew labored like mad. As soon as they had the mass of covers off, Forndaux scanned the interior of the machine and turned to Kinnison. I think we can patch her up, but it'll take quite a while. Maybe you'd be of more use in the control room thighs ain't quite as safe as a church. Is it? Lying here inert most of the stuff is on automatic trip. But maybe I'd better keep an eye on things. At that, let me know occasionally how you're getting along. And the lensman went back to his control snow too soon. For one pirate ship was already beaming him viciously. Only the fact that his defensive armament was upon its automatic trips had saved the stolen battleship from practically instantaneous destruction. As Kinnison had already remarked more than once, Helmuth was far from being a fool, and that new and amazingly effective blanketing of his every means of communication was a problem whose solution was of paramount importance. Almost every available ship had been, four days, upon the fringe of that interference, observing and reporting continuously. So rapidly was it moving. However, so peculiar was its apparent shape, and so contradictory were the directional readings obtained, that Helmuth's computers had been baffled. Then Kinnison's Bergenholm failed and his ship went to note. In a space of minutes the location of one center of interference was known. Its coordinates were determined and half a dozen warships were ordered to rush that spot. The raider first to arrive had signaled, visually and audibly. Then, obtaining no response, had anchored with a tractor and had loosed his bolts. Nor would the result have been different had every one aboard, instead of no one, been in the control room at the time of the signaling. Kinnison could have read the messages, but neither he nor anyone else than aboard the erstwhile pirate craft could have answered them in kind. Soon the two spaceships attacking the turncut became three, then four, and still the lensman sat and worried at his board, his meters showed no overload. His noble craft was easily taking everything her sister ships could send. Then Forndike stepped into the room. No longer an Eddie officer of space. Instead, he was stripped to sweet's cake undershirt and overalls. He was covered with grease and grime. And what of his thickly smeared face was visible was almost haggard with fatigue. He opened his mind to say something, then snapped it shut as his eye was caught by a flaring disaplate. Holy jumping rockets, he exclaimed. At us already, why didn't you yell how much good would that have done Kinnison wanted to know? Of course, if I had known that you were loafing on the job and could have snapped it up a little. I would have. But there's no particular hurry about this. It'll take more than four of them to break us down. And I was hoping that before they can overload us, you'd have us traveling. What was on your mind I came up parody. To tell you that we're ready to blast. Oh, to suggest that you hit her easy at first. And three, to ask if you know where there's any grease soak. But you can cancel two and three. We don't want to play around with these bows much longer replay to rough and I ain't going to wash up until I see whether she holds together or not. Blast away and won't those guys be surprised I'll say sir. We were. Oh, when the Valanchians showed us how to compute a screen that would cut a tractor like so much cheese. Here she goes, the lensment whirled a couple of knobs, then punched down hard upon three buttons. 
as he did so the flaring plates became dark they were again alone in space to the dumbfounded pirates a note as they were and with their supposedly unbreakable tractors locked in full grip it was as though their prey had slipped off into the fourth dimension their tractors gripped nothing whatever their ravening beams bored unimpeded through the space occupied an instant before by resisting screams they did not know what had happened or how f being deep in the field of interference they could neither report to nor be guided by the master mind of boscon four minutes foreign dyke van buskirk and kinnison waited tensely for they knew not what would happen but nothing happened and the tension gradually relaxed what was the matter with it kinnison asked finally overloaded was forndyke's reply over lovely snapped the lensman how could they overload a berg in Holmond? even if they could why in all the nine hells of Illyria would they want to they could do it easily enough in just the way they did do it be banking accumulators onto it in serious parallel as to why i'll let you do the guessing with no load on the bergen whom you've got full inertia with full load you've got zero inertia we can't go any farther it looks just plain dumb to me but then i think all pirates are short a few jets somewhere if they weren't they wouldn't be pirates i don't know whether you're right or not up so but afraid not personally i don't believe these folks are pirates at all in the ordinary sense of the word but what are they then piracy implies similarity of culture i would think the lensman said thoughtfully ordinary parrots are usually renegades deficient somehow as you suggested rebelling against a constituted authority which they themselves have at one time acknowledged and of which they are still afraid that pattern doesn't fit into this matrix at all anywhere so what now i say we write by cat you anyway why worry about it not worrying about it exactly but somebody has got to do some thinking about it or else i don't like to think it makes my head ache interrupted van buskirk besides we are getting away from the bergen home you will get a real headache there cousin and laugh back so i'll bet a good tellurian beefsteak that the pirates were trying to set up a negative inertia when they overloaded the bergen home and thinking about that state of matter is enough to make anybody's headache i knew that some of the dippier ph mm. s and higher mechanics have been speculating about it for and i coffered but it can't be done that way can it nor any other way that anybody has tried yet and if such a thing is possible the results may prove really startling but you two had better shove off you're dead from the neck up the bird's spinning like it opa's smooth as that much green velvet you'll find a can of soap in my locker i think maybe she'll hold together long enough for us to get some sleep the technician eyed a meter dubiously although its needle was not wavering a hair's breadth from the green line but i'll tell the cockeyed universe that that was a jury rigging we gave it if there ever was one you can't depend on it for an hour until after it's been pulled and gone over and that you know as well as i do takes a real shock with plenty of equipment if you take my advice you'll sit down somewhere while you can and as soon as you can that bogan home is in bad shape believe me we can hold her together for a while by main strength and awkwardness but before very long she's going out for keeps and when she goes out you don't want to find yourself fifty years from a machine shop instead of fifty minutes i'll say not the lensman agreed but on the other hand we don't want those birds jumping us the minute we land either let's see where are we and where are the bases um you stecker bases are white rings you know subsector bases red stars three heads bent over charts the nearest red straw marker seems to be in system two hundred fortis cavestinter kinnison finally announced don't know the name of the plaint and wetter been there and too far interrupted forndike we'll never make it might as well try direct for prime base on tellus if you can find a red closer than that look for an orange or a yellow Bases of any kind seem to be scarce out here, the lensman commented. 
which they had scattered them around a little thicker. Here's a violet star. But that wouldn't help you just deck an outpost. Guess that purple one there's our best bet, concluded Forndike. It's probably several breakdowns away. But maybe we can make it if we have two. Purples are pretty low-grade spaceports, but they've got tools. Anyway, what's the name of it? Kim, or is it only a number? It's that very famous planet. Trenko, the Lensman announced, after looking up the reference numbers in the atlas. Trenko exclaimed Forndike in disgust, the nuttiest, doppiest, wooziest planet in the galaxy we would draw something like that to sit down on for repairs. Wouldn't we whelk? I'm on minus time for sleep. Call me if we go a note before I wake up. Will you? I sure will. And I'll try to figure out a way of getting down to ground without bringing all the pirates in space along with us. Then Forndike and Van Busbrook slept. Kinnison planned, and the mighty Bergenholm continued to hold the vessel in nurshals. In fact, all three men were thoroughly rested and refreshed before the expected breakdown came, and when it did come they were more or less prepared for it. The delay was not sufficiently long to enable the parrots to find them again. The sweating, grunting, swearing engineers made one seemingly impossible repair after another. By dint of what dodge, improvisation, and makeshift only the fertile brain of Laverne Forn ever did know, the master technician, one of the keenest and most highly trained engineers of the whole Solarian system, was not used to working with his hands, although none in years. He was wont to use only his head, in directing the labors and the energies of others. Nevertheless, he was now working like a stevedore. He was permanently grimy and gray spire one can of mechanics soap had been used up long since, his fingernails were black and broken. His hands and face were burned, blistered and cracked. His muscles ached and shrieked at the unaccustomed effort. Until now they were on the build. But through it all he had stuck uncomplainingly, even buoyantly, to his task. One day, during an interlude of free flight, he strode into the control room and glanced at the cursed paltigoniometer, then stared into the tank, still on the original course. I sue. Have you get anything doped out yet nothing very good? That's why I'm staying on this course until we reach the point closest to Trenko. I've figured until my alleged brain backfighter on me. And here's all I can get. I've been shrinking and expanding our interference zone, changing its shape as much as I could with reflectors, and cutting it off entirely now and then to cross up their surveyors as much as I could. When we come to the jumping forth place, we'll simply cut off everything that is sending out traceable vibrations. The bird will have to run, of course, but it doesn't radiate much and we can ground out practically all of that. The drive is the bad feature. It looks as though we'll have to cut down to where we can ground out the radiation. How about the flare for night took the inevitable slide rule from a pocket of his overalls and began to work it? I've already had the Valanchians build us some bathless. We've got lots of spare tantalum, tungsten, carboloid, and refractory. You know, just in case we should want to use them. Darius Minto squared fetu milk at point thirty. The engineer mumbled, operating his calculator. We'll have to cut down to about ten or twelve lights. Light is slow, but we would get there Soames time a bit. Now about the baffles. And he went into another bout with his slide rule, during which could be distinguished a few such words as temperature and corcusplus juveniles point where beer is constant, then he said, It figures that at about fourteen lights your baffles go out. Pretty close check with the radiation limit. Pite. I guess, but I shudder to think of what we may have to do to that Bergen home to hold it together that long. It's not so hot. I don't think much of the scheme myself, admitted Kinnison frankly. Probably you can think up something better before who? Me what with Forndike interrupted. With a laugh. Looks to me like our best bet. Anyway, ain't you the master mind of this outfit blast off this it came about that? Long later. The lensman cut off his interference. 
put off his driving power, put off every mechanism whose operation generated vibrations which would reveal to enemy detectors the location of his cruiser. Spaced watted mechanics emerged from the stern lock and fitted over the still white hut vents of the driving projectors the baffles they had previously built. It is, of course, well known that all ships of space are propelled by the inert projection, by means of high potential static fields, of nascent forfeiter particles or corpoxels, which are formed to note inside the notial's projector by the conversion of some form of energy into matter. This conversion liberates some heat and a vast amount of light. This light, or flare, shining as it does directly upon and through the highly tenuous gas formed by the projected corpuscles, makes of a speeding spaceship one of the most gorgeous spectacles known to man. And it was this very spectacular effect that Kinnison and his crew must do away with if their bold scheme was to have any chance at all of success. The baffles were in place. But, instead of shooting out in telltale luminescence, the light was shut in its serve. Alas, was approximately three per cent of the heat, and the generation of heat must be cut down to a point at which the radio chamber shul in temperature of the baffles would be below the point of fusion of the refractories of which they were composed. This would cut down their speed tremendously. But, on the other hand, they were practically safe from detection and would reach Trenko eventually along the Bergenholm held doubt. Of course, there was still the chance of visual or electromagnetic detection, but that chance was vanishingly small. The proverbial task of finding a needle in a haystack would be an easy one indeed, compared to that of seeing in a telescope or a pond as a plate or magnaplated edblet. Lightless ship in the infinity of space. No. The Bergenholm was their great, their only concern, and the engineers lavished upon that monstrous fabrication of metal a devotion to which could be likened only that of a corps of nurses attending the ailing baby of a multimillionaire. This concentration of attention did get results. The engineers still found it necessary to sweat and to grunt and to swear, but they did somehow keep the thing rungent off of the time. Nor were they detectifant for the tension of the pirate Hackham and was very much taken up with that fast firming, that ever penzenting, that peccaluprachashapling volume of interferental forenigmatic as it was, and impenetrable to their very instrument of communication. Its centre was moving toward the Solorian system, and that system was the prime base of the galactic patrol. Therefore, it was the Lensman's work noticeably the same Lensman who had conquered one of their super-ships and, after having learned its every secret, had escaped in a lifeboat through the fine mesh net set to catch him and, piling us upon Pelion. This same Lensman had must have ectarfied ship after inconarchable ship of their best and was even now sailing calmly home with them therefore, using as tools every pirate ship in that sector of space. Helmuth and his computers and navigators were slowly but grimly solving the equations of motion of that volume of interference. Smaller and smaller became the uncertainties. Then ship after ship bored into the subafreal murk. To match course and velocity with, and ultimately to come to grips with it. Each focus of disturbance as it was determined, thus in a sense, and although Kinnison and his friends did not then know it, it was only the failure of the Burgenton that was to save their lives, and with those lives our present civilization. Slowly, haltingly, if, for reasons already given, undetected, Kinnison made pitiful progress toward Trechnomater Chenille cursing his ship, the crippled generator, its designer and its previous operators as he went, but at long last Tranko loomed large beneath them and the lensman used his lens, Lensman of Trenko Spaceport, or any other Lensman within call he sent out clearly. Kinnison of Teleswell and Sykallen, my Bergenholm is almost out and I must sit down at Trenko Spaceport for repairs. I have avoided the pirates so far, but they may be either behind me or ahead of me. Or both. What is the situation there? I fear that I can be of no help. Came back a week for without the customary identification. I am out of control. 
However, Tregus knee is in the kinnison and felt a poignant and bearably agonizing mental impact that jarred him to the very core, a shock that, while of sledgehammer force, was still of such a keenly penetrant timber that it almost exploited every cell of his brain. Communication ceased, and the lensman knew, with a sick, shuddering certainty, that while in the very act of talking to him a lensman had died, X, judged by any earthly standards, the planet Trenko was indeed a peculiar one indeed, its atmosphere, which is not air, and its liquid, which is not water, are its two outstanding peculiarities and the sources of most of its others. Almost half of that atmosphere and by far the greater part of the liquid phase of the planet is a substance of extremely low latent heat of vaporization, with a boiling point such that during the daytime it is a vapor and at night a liquid, to make matters worse. The other constituents of Trenko's gaseous envelope are of very feeble blanketing power, low specific heat, and of high permeability, so that its days are intensely hot and its nights are bitterly cold. At night, therefore, it rains. Words are entirely inadequate to describe to anyone who has never been there just how it does rain during Tranko's nights. Upon off one inch of rain fall in an hour is a terrific downpour. Upon Tranko that amount of precipitation would scarcely be considered a mist, for along the equatorial belt, in less than thirteen Tellurian hours. It rains exactly four teaspoon feet and five inches every night, no more and no less, each and every night of every year. Also there is lightning, not in terror's occasional flashes, but in one continuous, blinding glare which makes night as we know it and known there in Novorkinik. Battering, sense dystyroid discharges which make ether and subifer alike impenetrable to any ray or signal short of a full-driven power beam. The days are practically as bad. The lightning is not so violent then, but the bombardment of Trenko's monstrous sun through that outlandably peculiar atmosphere, produces almost the same effect, because of the difference in pressure set up by the enormous precipitation. Always and everywhere upon Tranku there is wind, and what a wind except at the very poles, where it is too cold for even Trenokian life to exist. There is hardly a spot in which or a time at which an earthy gale would not be considered a dead calm, and along the equator. At every sunrise and at every sunset, the wind blows from the day side to the net side at the rate of a trifle over eight hundred miles an hour through countless thousands of years. Wind and wave have planed and scoured the planet Trenko to a geometrically perfect oblate spheroid. It has no elevations and no depressions. Nothing fixed in an earthly sense grows or exists upon its surface. No structure has ever been built there able to stay in one place through one whole day of the cataclysmic meteorological phenomena which constitute the natural Trinokian environment. There live upon Tranko two types of vegetation, each type having innumerable subdivisions. One type sprouts in the mud of the morning, flourishes flatly, by dint of deeply scent and powerful roots, during the wind and the heat of the day, comes to full fruit in late afternoon and at sunset dies and is swept away by the flood. The other type is free-flating. Some of its genera are remotely like footballs. Others resemble tumbleweds. Still others fistled down. Hundreds of others have not their remotest counterparts upon earth. Essentially, however, they are alike in habits of life. They can sink in the water of Trancoat. They can burrow in its mud, from which they derive part of their sustenance. They can emerge there from into the sunlight. They can, undamaged, float in or roll along before the ever present Trinoki and wind, and they can enrop, entangle, or otherwise seize and hold anything with which they come in contact which by any chance may prove edible. Animal life, though, while abundant and diverse, is characterized by three qualities. From lower to very highest, it is amphibious. It is streamlined, and it is omnivorous. Life upon Tranko is hard, and any form of life to evolve there must of stern necessity be willing, yes, even anxious, to eat literally anything available. 
and for that reason all surviving forms of life, vegetable and animal, have a veracity and a fecundity almost unknown anywhere else in the galaxy, thionate, the noxious drug referred to earlier in this narrative, is the sole reason for Trenkow's galactic importance, as chlorophyll is to earthly vegetation, so is thionate to that of Trenkow. Trenko is the only planet thus far known upon which this substance occurs. Nor have our scientists even yet been able either to analyze or to synthesize it. Thionet is capable of affecting only those races who breathe oxygen and possess warm blood, red with hemoglobin. However, the planets peopled by such races are legion, and very shortly after the drug's discovery hordes of addicts, smugglers, peddlers, and outmid pirates were rushing toward the new bonanza. Thousands of these adventurers died, either from each other's ray guns or under an avalanche of hungry Trinokian life. Above, Thionet being what it is, thousands more kept coming. Also came the patrol, to curve the evil traffic at its source by beaming down ruthlessly any being attempting to gather any Trinokian vegetation. Thus, between the patrol and the drug syndicate, there rages a bitterly continuous battle to the death. Arrayed against both factions is the massed life of the Nosum planet, omnivorous as it is, eternally ravenous, and of an individual power and ferocity and a collective aggregate of numbers, none of which is to be despised, and eternally raging against all these contending parties are the wind, the lightning, the rain, the flood and the hellish vibratory output of Trenko's enormous, malignant, blue height sen, nest, men, was the planet upon which Kinnison had to land in order to repair his crippled Bergen Holmond in the end how well it was to be that such was the case Kinnison of Tellus. Greetings, Tregus Knee of Rigel of calling from Trenko spaceport. Have you ever landed on this planet before? No. But what's picked that for a time? It is most important that you land here quickly and safely. Where are you in relation to this planet? Your apparent diameter is a shade under six degrees. We are near the plane of your ecliptic and almost in the plane of your terminator. On the morning side, that is well. You have ample time. Place your ship between Tranco and the sun. Enter the atmosphere exactly fifteen jeep minutes from Tech at twenty degrees after meridian, as nearly as possible on the ecliptic, which is also our equator, go a note as you enter atmosphere, for a free landing upon this planet is impossible. Synchronize with our rotation, which is twenty skies point to g powers. Descend vertically until the atmospheric pressure is seven hundred millimeters of mercury, which will be at an altitude of approximately one thousand meters. Since you rely largely upon that sense called sight, allow me to caution you now not to trust it. When your external pressure is 700 millimeters of mercury, your altitude will be 1,000 meters. Whether you believe it or not, stop at that pressure and inform me of the fact. Meanwhile, holding yourself as nearly stationary as you can. Texofartite. But do you mean to tell me that we can't locate each other at a thousand meters? Kinnison's amazed thought escaped him. What kind of I can locate you? But you cannot locate me, came the dry reply. Every one knows that Tranco is peculiar. But no one who has never been here can realize even dimly how peculiar it really is. Detectors and spires are useless. Electromagnetics are practically paralyzed and optical apparatus is distinctly unreliable. You cannot trust your vision here. Do not believe all that you see. It used to require days to land a ship at this port, but with our lenses and my sense of perception, as you call it, it will be a matter of minutes. Kinnison had flashed his ship to the designated position. Cut the bird. Forndike. We were all done with it. I've got to build up an inert velocity to match the rotation. And land inert. Thanks be to all the gods of space for that. The engineer heaved a sigh of relief. I've been expecting it to blow its stop for the last hour. And I don't know whether we'd ever have got it meshed in again or not. Kiche on location in Darbit. 
Kinnison reported to the as yet invisible spaceport a few minutes later. But what about that lensman what happened the usual faint? Came the motionless response. It happens to altogether too many lensmen who can see, in spite of everything we can tell them. He insisted upon going out after his Wilmix in a ground car. If, of course, we had to let him go. He became confused, lost control, let something as piously as Wilnick's bomb it under his leading edge, and the wind and the trancos did the rest. He was late sent of Mercator Vave a good man. Though, what is the pressure now, five hundred millimeters? Slow down. But, if you cannot conquer the tendency to believe your eyes, you had better shut off your visiplates and watch only the pressure gauge. Being warned, I can disbelieve my eyes. I think, for a minute or so, communication ceased at a startled oath from Van Busburg. Kinnison glanced into the plate. It needed all his self control to keep from wrenching savagely at the controls, for the whole planet was tipping, lurching, spinning, gyrating madly in a frenzy of impossible motions. Shirov, Kim yelled the Valyrian, halt it. Lusk, cautioned the lensman. That's what we've got to expect. You know, I passed all the stuff along as I got it. Everything, that is, except that as Wilnick is anything or anybody that comes after Fionnit, and that a Trenko is anything, animal or vegetable, that lives on the planet. Pite, Tregusness in hundred, and I'm holding steady, I hope steady enough. But you are too far away for our landing bars. Direct a fog, rotating the prime axis of your lens while inclining it somewhat downward. Stop mark that line on your circles. Now think of the alignment of your ship in relation to that line. Swing your prow away from that line. Clear around to approach it from the other side. Slow. Hold it. Apply normal acceleration. In a few minutes, the crew felt a gentle. Snubbing shock, and Kinnison again translated to his companions the stranger's thoughts. We have grasped you with our landing bars. Cut off all your power and set all controls in neutral. Do nothing more until I instruct you to come out. Kinnison obeyed. F. Released from all duty, the three visitors stared in fascinated incredulity into the visiplate. For that at which they stared was and must forever remain impossible of duplication upon earth, and only in imagination can it be even faintly pictured. Imagine all the fantastic and monstrous creatures of Adeliritsum's vision incarnate and actual. Imagine them being hurled through the air, borne by a dustlet and gale more severe than any the great American Dust Bowl or Africa's Sahara Desert ever endured. Imagine this scene as being viewed not in an ordinary, solve, distorting mirror, but in one whose falsely reflecting contours were changing constantly, with no logical or intelligible rhythm, in two new and ever more grotesque corps. If imagination has been equal to the task, the resultant is what the three patrolmen tried to see. At first they could make nothing whatever of it, upon nearer approach. However, the ghastly distortion grew less in the flatly level expanse of sun-baked Matukan semblance of rigidity. Directly beneath them they made out something that looked like an immense, flat blister upon the otherwise featureless terrain. Their ship was drawn toward this blister, a poor topend, dwarfed in apparent size to a mere window by the immensity of the structure. Through this port the vast bulk of the spaceship was wafted upon the landing bars and behind it the mighty bronsidenstal gates clanned shut. The lock was pumped to a vacuum. There was a hiss of entering air. A spray of vaporous liquid bathed every inch of the vessel's surface, and Kinnison felt again the convos of Tregusneek, the regalian lensman. You may now open your airlock and emerge. If I have read aright, our atmosphere is sufficiently like your own in oxygen content so that you will suffer no ill effects from it. It may be well, however, to wear your armor until you have become accustomed to its considerably greater density. That'll be a relief, growled Van Buskers in deep bass, when his chief had transmitted the thought. 
I've been breathing this fin stuff so long I'm getting light-headed. That's gratitude, Forndike retorted. We've been running our air so heavy that all the rest of us are thick-headed now. If the air in this space port is any heavier than what we've been having, I'm going to wear armor as long as we stay here, Kennison had opened the airlock. Found the atmosphere of the spaceport satisfactory, and now stepped out, to be greeted cordially by Tregasneet. The lensman, fist was apparition was at least erect, which was something. His body was the size and shape of an oil drum. Beneath this massive cylinder of a body were four short, blocky legs upon which he waddled about with surprising speed. Midway up the body, above each lud, there sprited out a tenth tulf, writhing, boneless, tentacular arm, which toward the extremity branched out in two dozens of lesser tentacles, ranging in size from hair-like tendrils up to mighty fingers two inches or more in diameter, Tregus knee's head was merely a necklace, a mobile, bulging dome in the center of the flat, upper surface of his body a dome bearing neither eyes nor rears, but only four equally spaced toothless mouths and four single, flaring nostrils. But Kinnison felt no qualm of repugnance at Tregus knee's monstrous appearance, for embedded in the leathery flesh of one arm was the lens. Here, the lensman knew was in every essential a man and probably a superman. Illustration. Herfet Lensman knew was in every essential a man and probably a superman. Welcome to Trenkov. Kinnison of Tellus. Tregesny was saying, while we are near neighbors in space, I have never happened to visit your planet. I have encountered Tellurians here, of course, but they were not of a tap to be received as guests. No. As Wilnick is not a high type of Tellurian. Kinnison agreed. I have often wished that I could have your sense of perception, if only for a day. It must be wonderful indeed to be able to perceive a thing as a whole. In sight and doubt, instead of having vision stopped at its surface, as is ours, and to be independent of light or darkness, never to be lost or in need of instruments. To know definitely where you are in relation to every other object or thing around you, I think, is the most marvelous sense in the universe. Just as I have wished for sight and hearing, those two remarkable and to us entirely unexplainable senses, I have dreamed, I have studied volumes, on color and sound, color and art and in nature, sound and music and in the voices of loved ones, but they remain meaningless symbols upon a printed page. However, such thoughts are vain, and all probability neither of us would enjoy the other's equipment if he had it, and this interchange is of no material assistance to you. In flashing thought, Skinnison then communicated to the other lensman everything that had transpired since he left Prime Base. I perceive that your Bergenholm is of standard fourteen rating, Trevis Nee said. As the Tellurian finished his story, we have several spares here. If, while they all have regulation patrol mountings, it would take much less time to change mounts than to overhaul your machine. That's so. Though, I never thought of the possibility of your having spare machined, and we've lost a lot of time already. How long will it take one night of labor to change mounts at least eight to rebuild yours enough to be sure that it will get you home? We'll change mates. Then, by all means, I'll call the boys. There is no need of that. We are amply equipped. And neither of you humans nor the Valanchians could handle our tools. Tregus Nee made no visible motion, nor could Kinnison perceive a break in his thought. But while he was conversing with the Tellurian, half a dozen of his blocky regalians had dropped whatever they had been doing and were scuttling toward the visiting ship. Now I must leave you for a time as I have one more trip to make this afternoon. Is there anything I can do to help you? asked Kinnison. No, came the definite negative. I will return in three hours. As well before sunset the wind makes it impossible to get even a ground car into the port. I will then show you why you can be of little assistance to us. Kinnison spent those three hours watching the regalians work upon the Bergenholm. There was no need for direction or advice. 
They knew what to do, and they did it. Bows tiny, hair-like fingers, literally hundreds of them at once, performed delicate tasks with surpassing nicety and dispatch. When it came to heavy tasks, the larger digits or even whole arms wrapped themselves around the work and, with the solid bracing of the four block-like legs, exerted forces that even Van Busker's in giant frame could not have approached. As the end of the third hour neared, Kinnison watched with a spiray. There were no windows in the Trenko space, poor fate leeward groundway of the structure, in spite of the weird antics of Trenko's sunch rating. Jumping, appearing and disappear of knew that it was going down. Soon he saw the ground car coming in, sputtling crabwise, nose into the wine, but actually moving backward and sidewise, although the seeing was very clear. At this close range the distortion was minimized, and he could see that, like its parent craft, the ground car was in the shape of a blister. Its edges actually touched the ground all around, sloping upward and over the top in such a smooth reverse curve that the harder the wind blew the more firmly was the vehicle pressed downward. The ground flap came up just enough to clear the car stop, and the tiny craft crept up, but before the landing bars could seize for the ground car struck an eddy from the flake and eddy in a medium which, although Vasus, was at that velocity practically solid, earth blasted away in torrents from the leading edge. The car leapt bodily into the air and was flung away, and over end, but tread a knee, with consummate craftsmanship, forced her flat again, and again she crawled up toward the flap. This time the landing bars took hold and, although the little vessel fluttered like a leaf in a gale, she was drawn inside the port and the flap went down behind her. She was then sprayed, and Trevis' knee came out. Illustration. Although the seeing was very poor at this close range, the distortion was minimized and the spy ray revealed the ground car just as it struck an eddy from the flap while the spray thought Kinnison. As the regalian entered his control room, Trancos. Much of the life of this planet starts from almost imperceptible spores. It develops rapidly, attains considerable size, and consumes anything organic it touches. This port was depopulated time after time before the lethal spray was developed. Now turn your spiray again to the lee of the port. During the few minutes that had elapsed, the wind had increased in fury to such an extent that the very ground was boiling away from the trailing edge in the tumultuous city formed there. Ultra smelled me though the spaceport was, and that eddy, for surpassing in violence any storm known to earth, was to the denizens of Trenko a miraculously appearing quiet spot in which they could stop and dress, eat and be eaten. A globular monstrosity had thrust Pseudopodia deep into the burling dote. Other limbs now shut out. Grasping a tumbler faker growth, the latter fought back viciously, but could make no impression upon the rubbery integument of the former. Then a smaller creature, slipping down the polished curve of the shield, was enmeshed by the tumbleweed. There ensued the amazing spectacle of one half of the tumbleweed devouring the newcomer, even while its other half was being devoured by the globe, now look out for her still farther, directed Tregus knee. I can't. Things take on impossible motions and become so distorted as to be unrecognizable. Exactly. If you so as will look out there. Where would you shoot at him? I suppose. Why, because if you shot at where you think you see him, not only would you miss him, but the ray might very well swing around and enter your own back. Many men have been killed by their own weapons in precisely that fashion, since we know not only what the object is, but exactly where it is. We can correct our beams for the then existing values of distortion. This is, of course, the reason why we regalians and other races possessing the sense of perception are the only ones who can efficiently police this planet reason enough i'd say from what i'd seen silence fell four minutes the two lensmen watched while creatures of a hundred kinds streamed into the lee of the spaceport and killed and ate each other finally something came crawling upward and against that unimaginable gale a flatly streamlined creature somewhat resembling a turtle 
but shaped as was the ground car. Thrusting down Lonk, hooked flippers into the dirt it inched along, paying no attention to the scores of lesser creatures who hold themselves upon its armored back, until it was close beside the largest footblofsted creature in the eddy. Then, lightningly, it drove a dindle horse storgan at least eight inches into the leathery mass of its victim, struggling convulsively. The stricken thing lifted the turtle a fraction of an inch and both were holed instantly out of sight, the living bull still leaking a luscious bit of sorrel. Good Lord! What was that exclaimed Kinnison? The flat that was a representative of Tranco's highest life form. It may develop a civilization in time. It is quite intelligent now. But the difficulties protested the Tellurian. Building cities. Even homes in neither cities nor homes are necessary. Nor even desirable. Here. Why build nothing is or can be fixed on this planet? And since one place is exactly like every other place, why which to remain in any one particular spot they do very well, in their own mobile way. Here, you will notice, comes the rain. The rain came for French's per hour of rain had the lightning. Such rain and such lightning must be seen to be even dimly appreciated. There is no use in attempting to describe the indescribable. The dirt first became mud then muddy water being driven in fiercely flying gouts and masses. The water grew deeper and deeper. Its supper surface now whipped into frantic sheets of spray. The structure was now afloat, and Kinnison saw with astonishment that, small as was the exposed surface and flatly curved, yet it was pulling through the water at frightful speed the wides raping steel sea anchors which were holding its head to the gale, with no reference points how do you know where you're going he demanded we know not nor care responded tregus knee with a mental shrug we are like the natives in that since one spot is like every other spot why choose between them what a wall how to the world however i am beginning to understand why thyan it is so expensive if overwhelmed by the ever in psychers and fury raging outside Kinnison sought his bank. Morning came. A reversal of the previous evening. The liquid evaporated. The mud dried. The flate-growing vegetation sprang up with shocking speed. The animals emerged and again ate and were eaten. And eventually came Tregus Knee's announcement that it was noon, and that now, for an hour or so, it would be calm enough for the spaceship to leave the port. You are sure that I would be of no help to you, asked the regalian. Half plevingly. Sorry. Tregus knee. But you would fit into my matrix just as I would into yours here. But here's the spool I told you about. If you will take it to your base on your next relief, you will do civilization and the patrol more good than you could by coming with us. Thanks for the Bergen home, which is covered by credits. And thanks a lot for your help and courtesy which can't be covered. Goodbye. The now entirely space-worthy craft shot out through the port, through Tranco's noxiously peculiar atmosphere, into the vacuum of space. She chaply holds that these star clusters, under the gravitatic control of the larger system, vibrate back and forth through the galaxy. That elements of astronomy. Both. Two hundred ninety sin at some distance from the galaxy, yet chappled to it by the flexible yet powerful bonds of gravitation. The small but comfortable planet upon which was Helm of Space circled about its parent sun. This planet had been chosen with the utmost care, and its location was a secret guarded jealously indeed. Scarcely one in a million of Boscones steaming millions knew even that such a planet existed, and of the chosen few who had ever been asked to visit it. Fewer still by far had been allowed to leave it. Grand Base covered hundreds of square miles of that planet's surface. It was equipped with all the arms and armament known to the military genius of the age, and in the exact center of that immense citadel there rose a glittering metallic dome. Illustration. It was equipped with all the arms and armor quantalizes and communicate suitables to the military genius of the age. 
then side surface of that dome was lined with visiplates and communicators hundreds of thousands of them miles of catwalks clung precariously to the indraverking wall control panels and instrument boards covered the floor in banks and tiers with only narrow runways between them and let the personnel there were solarians provenians syrians there were Antarians, Vandamarians, Arcturians. There were representatives of spores. Yes, hundreds of other solar systems of the galaxy. But whatever their external form, they were all brothers of oxygen and they were all nourished by warm, red blood. Also, they were all alike mentally. Each had won his present hat place by trampling down those beneath him and by pulling down those above him in the branch to which he had first belonged of the pirate organization. Kinnison had been eminently correct in his belief that Boscones was not a pirate outfit in any ordinary sense of the word, but even his ideas of its true nature fell far short indeed of the truth. It was a tyranny, an absolute monarchy, a despotism not even remotely approximated by the dictatorships of earlier ages. It had only one creed. The end justifies the means. And fight all shall any anything at all that produced the desired result was commendable. To fail was the only crime. Therefore, no weaklings dwelt within that fortress. And of all its called, hard, roofless crew far and away the coldest, hardest, and most ruthless was Helmuth, the speaker for Baskan, who sat at the great desk in the dome's geometrical center. This individual was almost human in form and build, springing as he did from a planet closely approximating Earth in mass, atmosphere, and climate. Indeed, only his general, all pervasive aura of blueness, bore witness to the fact that he was not a native of Tellus. His eyes were blue. His hair was blue, and even his skin was faintly blue beneath its coat of ultraviolet tan. His intensely dynamic personality fairly radiated blue sent the gentle blue of a nerfly sky, not the sweetly innocuous blue of an oafly flyer, but the keenly merciless blue of a delta ray, the cold and bitter blue of a polar iceberg, then yielding, inflexible blue of chilled and tempered steel, now a frown sat heavily upon his arrogantly patrician face as his eyes bored into the plate before him from the base of which were issuing the words being spoken by the assistant pictured in its deep surface the fifth dived into the deepest ocean of curvini in the depths of which all rays are useless the ships which followed have not as yet reconnected no trace of the sixth has been found and it is therefore assumed that she was destroyed upon Valancha, who assumes so demanded Helmuth. Coldly, there is no justification whatever for such an assumption. Go on the lensman. If there is one, must therefore be in the fifth ship, since he was not in any of the four which we have retaken. Your report is neither complete nor conclusive. I do not at all approve of your intimation that the lensman is simply a figment of my imagination. That there is a lensman is the only possible logical conclusion. None other of the patrol forces could have done what has been done. Postetailing his reality, it seems to me that instead of being a rare possibility, it is highly probable that he has again escaped us, and again in one of our own vestal's fist time in the one you have so conveniently assumed to have been destroyed. Have you searched the line of flight? Yes. So, everything in space and every planet within reach of that line has been examined with care. Except, of course, Valanchian Tranco. Valanchian is, for the time being, an important. It will be reduced later. Why Tranco and Helmuth pressed a series of buttons at Isu to recapitulate one ship, the one which in all probability is no carrying the lensman, is still unaccounted for. Where is it we assume that it left the lanchet? We know that it has not landed upon or near any Solarian planet. Incidentally, we must see to it that it does not so land, but I think. It has become necessary to have that planet Tranco combed, inch by inch. But so, how began the Anschewid Sunderling? 
when did it become necessary to draw diagrams and make blueprints for you demanded helmuth harshly we have ships manned by regalians and other races having the sense of perception find out where they are and get them there at full blast he flipped over to dubtal ware switches thus replacing the image upon his plate by another it has now become of paramount importance that we complete our knowledge of the lens of the patrol he began without salutation or preamble have you traced its origin yet i believe so but i do not certainly know it has proved to be a task of such difficulty if it had been an easy one i would not have made a special assignment of it to you gone everything seems to point to a planet named Rhesia. but of that planet i can learn nothing definite whatever except that just a moment helmuth punched more buttons and listened undicap's lorange went by all spacemen superstition and he snapped another of those haunted planets something more than ordinary spacemen superstition sowed but just what i have not been able to discover by combing my department i managed to make up a crew of those who either were not afraid of it or have never heard of it that crew is now in reef there whom have we in that sector of space i find it desirable to check your findings the department had reeled off a list of names and numbers which helmuth considered at length gildersleeve the valerian he announced finally he is a good man coming along fast aside from a firm belief in his own peculiar gods he has shown no signs of weakness you considered him certainly the henchman as cold as his icy chief knew that explanations would not satisfy helmuth therefore he offered none he is raiding at the moment but i will put you on him if you like dis so and upon helmuth's plate there appeared a deep safe scene of rapinian pillage the convoying patrol ships two of them had already been blasted out of existence only a few idly drifting masses of debris remaining to show that they had ever been needle rays were at work and soon the merchantmen hung inert and helpless the pirates scorning to use the emergency and let port simply blasted away the entire entrance panel then they boarded an armored swarm flaming delameters spreading death and destruction before them the sailors outnumbered as they were in dover rammed fought hero kybelated uselessly in groups and singly they fell those who were not already dead being callously tossed out into space in slitted spacesuits and with smashed motors only the younger remained stewardesses the nurses the one or two such among the few passigneers taken as beauty all others shared the fate of the crew then the ship plundered from nose to after jets and every article or thing of value transhacked. the raver drew off bathed in the blue height glare of the atomic bombs that were destroying every trace of the merchant ship's existence then and only then did helmuth reveal himself to gilder sleeve above clean job of work captain he commended but how would you like to visit theresia for for me direct the pallor overspread the normally ruddy face of the valerian and an uncontrollable tremor shook his giant frame but as he considered the implications resident in helmuth's concluding phrase he licked his lips and spoke i hate to say nay so if you order me to and if there was any way of making my crew do it but we were near there once so and we feet welt so i saw things so and i was was warned sir so what and was warned of what i can't describe what i saw so i can't even think of it in thoughts that mean anything as for the warning though it was very definite so i was told very plainly that if i ever go near that planet again i will die a worse death than any i have dealt out to any other living being but you will go there again i tell you so that the crew will not do it gildersleeve replied doffedly even if i were anxious to go every man aboard will mutiny if i tried it call them in right now and tell them that you have been ordered to Rhesia. the captain did so but he had scarcely started to talk when he was stopped in no uncertain fashion by his first fist rustle of course a valerie honey pulled his delameter and spoke savagely cut it 
chief we are not going to receive nor anywhere near there i was with you before you know point course within a quadrant of that accursed planet and i flash you where you sit helm of speaking for boscon ripped from the headquarters speaker this is rankest's mutiny you know the penalty do you not certainly i do what of it the first officer snapped back suppose that i tell you to go to Risi a helmet's voice was now soft and silky but instinct with deadly menace in that case i tell you to go to hell or to Risi. a million times worse snapped the officer what you dare speak thus to me demanded the arkwrights sheer amazement at the fellow's audacity blanketing his rising anger i so dare declared the rebel brazen defiance and unalterable resolve in every line of his hard body and in every lineament of his hard face all you can do is kill us you can order out enough ships to blast us out of the ether but that's all you can do that would be a claim quick death and we would have the fun of taking a lot of the boys along with us if we go to Risia, though it would be different very different believe me no hell move and i say this to your face if i ever go near Risi again it will be in a ship in which you hell move in person are sitting at the controls if you think this is an empty dare and don't like it you don't have to take it send on your dogs that will do report yourselves to base d under than helmuth's flare of anger passed and his cold reason took charge here was something utterly unprecedented an entire crew of the hordestabit were orders in space offering open and barefastmuti nino not mutiny but actual rebellion yo him helmuth in his very teeth and not a typical sculping carefully planned uprising but the immovably brazen desperation of men making an ultimately last ditch stand truly it must be a powerful superstition indeed to make that crew of hardbolt hellions choose certain death rather than face again the imaginary must be a magnerialis of a planet known to and unexplored by boscarn's planetorix but they were after all ordinary spacemen of little mental force and of small real ability even so it was clearly indicated that in this case precipitate action was to be avoided therefore he went on calmly and almost without a break cancel all this that has been spoken and that has taken place continue with your original orders pending further investigation helmuth switched his plate back to the department head i have checked your conclusions and have found them correct he announced as though nothing at all out of the way had transpired you did well in sending a ship to investigate no matter where i am or what i am doing notify me instantly at the first sign of irregularity in the behavior of any member of that ship's personnel nor was that call long in coming the carefully selected cree selected for complete lack of knowledge of the dread planet which was their objective all the long in blissful ignorance both of the real meaning of their mission and of what was to be its ghastly end soon after helmuth's unsatisfactory interview with gildersleeve and his mate the luckless exploring vessel reached the barrier which the risions had set around their system and through which no uninvited stranger was allowed to pass the free-flying ship struck that frail barrier and stopped in the instant of contact a wave of mental force flooded the mind of the captain oh gibbering with sheer stark panic terror flashed his vessel away from that horror gramping barrier and hold call after frantic call along his beam back to headquarters his first call in the instant of reception was relayed to helmuth at his central desk steady and report intelligently that worthy snapped and his eyes large now upon the cowering captain's plate bored steadily hypnotically into those of the expedition's leader pull yourself together and tell me exactly what happened everything well so when we struck some action screen of some sort and stopped something came aboard it was how his verse rose to a shriek but under helm of dominating glare he subsided quickly and went on a monster so if there ever was one 
a fire-brating demon, sewed, with teeth and claws and cruelly barbed tail. He spoke to me in my own Provinian language. He said never mind what he said. I did not hear it, but I can guess what it was. He threatened you with death in some horrible fashion. Did he not the coldly ironical tones did more to restore the shaking man's equilibrium than reams of remonstrance could have done? Well, yes, that was about the size of it. So, he admitted. And does that sound reasonable to you? The commander of a first school's battleship of Boscone's fleet sneered Helmuth. Well, so, put in that way, it does seem a bit farfetched. The captain replied sheepishly it is farfchid the director in the safety of his dome could afford to be positive we do not know exactly what caused that hallucination apparition or whatever it was you were the only one who could see it apparently it certainly was not visible on our master plates here at base it was probably some form of suggestion or hypnotism and you know as well as we do that any suggestion can be thrown off by a definitely opposed will. But you did not oppose it. Did you know? So, I didn't have time. Nor did you have your screens out. Nor automatic recorders on the trip. Not much of anything. In fact, I think that you had better report back here. At full blast. Oat. Dog. Sir, please, he knew what rewards were granted to failures and Helmuth's carefully chosen words had already produced the effect desired by their speaker. They took me by surprise then. But I'll go through this next time. Very well. We will give you one more chance. When you get close to the barrier, or whatever it is, go inert and put out all your screens. Man your plates and weapons. For whatever can hypnotize can be killed. Go ahead at full blast. With all the acceleration you can get, craft through anything that opposes you, and be many things that you can detect or see. Can you think of anything else that should be sufficient? So, the captain's equanimity was completely restored. Now that the warlike preparations were making more and more nebulous, the sudden but single thought wave of the origin proceed the plan was carried out to the letter. This time the pirate craft struck the frail barrier inert, and its slight force offered no tangible bar to the prodigious mass of metal. But this time, since the barrier was actually passed, there was no mental warning and no possibility of retreat. Many men have skeletons in their closets. Many have phobias, things of which they are consciously afraid. Many others have them, not consciously, but buried deep in the subconscious. Spectres which seldom or never rise above the threshold of perception. Every sentient being has, if not such spectres as these, at least a few active or latent dislikes, drugs, or outright fears. This is true. No matter how quiet and peaceful a life the being has led. These particular pirates, however, were the scum of space. They were beings of hardened criminal lives and of violent and lawless passions. Their hates and concisionsering deeds had been legion. Their count of crimes long, black, and hideous. Therefore, slight indeed was the effort required to locate in their conscious minstow say nothing of the noxious depths of their subconscious anevisians of horror fit to blast stronger intellects than theirs. And that is exactly what the Orision Guards man did. From each parrot's total mind, a veritable charnel pit, he extracted the foulest, most unspeakable dregs, the deeply hidden things of which the subject was in the greatest fear. Of these things he formed a whole of horror incomprehensible and incredible, and this ghastly whole he made incarnate and visible to the pirate who was its unwilling parent, as visible as though it were composed of flesh and blood, of copper and steel. Is it any wonder that each member of that outlaw crew, seeing such an abhorrent materialization, went instantly mad it is of no use to go into the horribly monstrous shapes of the things, even were it possible, for each of them was visible to only one man, 
and none of them was visible to those who looked on from the safety of the distant base to them the entire crew simply abandoned their posts and attacked each other senselessly and in insane frenzy with whatever weapons came first to hand indeed many of them fought barehanded weapons hanging in use in their belts gadging beating clawing biting until life had been rived horribly away and other parts of the ship delameters flamed briefly bars crashed crunchingly knives and axes sheared entrenchantly bit and soon it was over all masto the pilot was still alive unmoving and rigid at his controls then he oh, moved slowly haltingly as though in a trance without touching the controls of the bergenholm he nursed his driving projectors up to maximum spun his ship and steadied her on course and when helmy fred that course even his iron nerves failed him momentarily for the chick still inert was pointed not for its own home port but directly toward grand base the jealously secret plan of his spatial coordinates neither that pilot nor any other creature of the pirate's rank and file had ever known helmuth snapped out orders to which the pilot gave no heed his voice for the first time in his carol rise almost to a howl but the pilot still paid no attention instead eyes bulging with horror and fingers curved tensely into veritable talons he reared upright upon his bench and leapt as though to clutch and to rend some in a terribly appalling furrow he leapt over his board into thin and empty air he came down as sprawl in a maze of naked half potential buspers his body vanished in a flash of searing flame and a cloud of thick and greasy smoke the buspers cleared themselves of their gruesome shortened the great ship man now entirely by corpses bored on stinking clebets the lily vetter cowards the department head who had also been yelling orders was still pounding his desk and cursing if they're that afraid to mad and kill each other without being touch hilled have to go myself no Sensteed, Helmuth interrupted. Quietly, you will not have to go. There is, after all, I think, something therum sighting that you may not be able to handle. Yes, so, you missed the one essential key fact. He referred to the course, the setting of which had shaken him to the very core. Let the, he silenced the other's flood of question and protest. It would serve no purpose to detail it to you now. Have the ship taken back to port? Helmuth knew now that it was not superstition that made spaceman Shunarisia. He knew that, from his standpoint at least, there was something very seriously amiss. Jopi. Helmuth sat at his desk, thinking thickening with all the coldly analytical precision of which he was capable. This lensman was, in truth, a foeman worthy of his steel. The Cosmic King Ricky drive developed by the science of a world which the patrol did not know existed was boscone's one great item of superiority if the patrol could be kept in ignorance of that drive the struggle would be over in a year the culture of the iron hand would be unchallenged throughout the galaxy if however the patrol did manage to learn the secret of power to all intents and purposes and limited the war between the two cultures might well be prolonged indefinitely this lensman knew that secret and was still at large, of that he was all too certain. Therefore, the lensman must be destroyed, and that brought up the lens. What was it a peculiar bubble indeed, simple of ultimate quantitative analysis, but actually impossible of duplication because of some subtlety of intratocity arrangement? Also, it was of peculiar and dire potentiality not a man of his force could even wear one he had watched several of them die horribly in attempting to do so it must account in some way for the outstanding ability of the lensman and it must tie in somehow both with arisi and with the fat screens this lens was the one thing possessed by the patrol which his own forces did not have he must and would have it for it was undoubtedly a powerful arm not to be compared of course, with their own monopoly of cosmic energy, that monopoly was now threatened, 
and seriously, that Lentzman must be destroyed. But how it was easy to say Comtrenko, inch by inch, but doing it would prove a Herculean task. Suppose that the Lentzman should again escape. In that volume of so fantastically distorted media he had already escaped twice. In much clearer reefer than Trenko's. However, if this information should never get back to prime base, little harm would be done. Ships could and would be thrown around the Solarian system in such numbers that not even a grain of fested meteorite could pass that screen without detection. Nothing tossing what would wilt be allowed to enter that system until this whole affair had been settled. There were other patrol bases, of course, but with the prime base isolated. Nothing really serious could happen. So much for the lensman. Now about getting the secret of the lens. Again, hi, there was something upon Aresia, and that something was connected in some way with the lens and with Fotes, obviously also with the new Fotes screens. Whatever it was, it had mental power. Of that there was no doubt. Out of the full sphere of space, what was the mathematical probability that the pilot of that death ship would have set, by accident, his course so exactly upon this planet vanishingly small? Treachery would not explain the facts. The pilot had been insane when he had laid the course. As an explanation, mental force alone seemed fantastic, but none other as yet presented itself as a possibility. Also, it was supported by the unbelievable. The absolutely definite refusal of Gilder Sively's normally fearless crew even to approach the planet. It would take an Andohoff mental force so to affect such crema-hearted veterans. Helmuth was not one to underestimate an enemy. Was there a man beneath that dome? Save himself, of sufficient mental caliber to undertake the now necessary mission to Arisia there was not. He himself had the finest mind on the planet, else that other had deposed him long since and had sat at the control desk himself. He was sublimely confident that no outside thought could break down his definitely opposed will, and besides, there were the fout screens, his own personal property as yet. Of no other will could he say the same. No other would he trust with those screens. Of all his force, he was the only one whom he could be sure of. Therefore, he would go himself. It has already been made clear that Helmuth was not a fool. No more was he a coward. If he himself could best of all his force do a thing, that thing he did, with the coldly ruthless efficiency that marked alike his every action and his every thought, how should he go should he accept that challenge, and take Dilder Sibley's rebellious crew of Cutroffs to Arisia No? In the event of an outcome short of complete success, it would not do to lose face before that band of ruffians. Moreover, the idea of such a crew going insane behind him was not one to be relished. He would go alone. Warm Mark, come to the center. He ordered. When that worthy appeared, he went on. Be seated. As this is a serious conference, I have watched with admiration and appreciation as well as some mild amusement, the development of your lines of information, particularly those covering affairs which are most distinctly not in your department. They are, however, efficient. You already know exactly what has happened. A definite statement this is no wise a question. Yes, so, Walmark said quietly. He was somewhat taken aback, but not at all abashed. That is the reason you are here now. I thoroughly approve of you. I am leaving the planet for approximately twenty days. And you are the best man in the organization to take charge in my absence. I suspected that you would be leaving. So, I know you did. But I am now informing you. Merely to make sure that you develop no peculiar ideas in my absence. That there are at least a few things which you do not suspect at all. That safe, for instance, Helmuth said, nodding toward a peculiarly shimmering globe of force anchoring itself in air. Even your highly efficient spy system has not been able to loan a thing about that. No, so we have no TT. He could not forbear ratting. Nor will you. 
with any skill or force known to man. But keep on trying. It amuses me. I know, you so, of all your attempts, but to get on. And I say, and for your own good I advise you to believe, that failure upon my part to return to this desk will prove highly unfortunate for you. I believe that, so, any man of intelligence would make some such arrangement, if he could, but so, suppose that the risions if you're if he could implies it out, act upon it and learn wisdom. Helmuth advised him coldly, you should know by this time that I neither gamble nor bluff. I have made arrangements to protect myself, both from enemies, such as the risions and the patrol, and from friends, such as ambitious youngsters who are making arrangements to supplant me. If I were not entirely confident of getting back here safely, my dear Walmark, I would not go. You misunderstood me. So, really, I have no idea of supplanting you. Not until you get a good opportunity. You moaned. I understand you thoroughly. If, as I have said before, I approve of you, go ahead with all your plans. I have kept at least one lap ahead of you so far and if the time should ever come when I can no longer do so, I shall no longer be fit to speak for Baspan. You understand, of course, that the most important matter now in work is the search for the lensman, of which the combing of Trenko and the screening of the Solarian system are only two phases. Yes, so, very well. I can, I think, leave matters in your hands. If anything really serious comes up, such as a development in the Lensman case. Let me know at once. Otherwise do not call me. Take the desk. Helmuth strode away. He was whisked to the spaceport, where his special speedster awaited him. For him the trip to Aresia was neither long nor tedious. The little racer was fully automatic. And as it tore through space he worked as coolly and efficiently as he was wont to do at his desk. Indeed, more so, for here he could concentrate without interruption. Many were the matters he planned and the decisions he made. The while his portfolio of notes grew thicker and thicker, as he neared his destination he put away his work, actuated his special mechanisms, and waited. When the speedster struck the barrier and stopped, Helmuth wore a faint, hard smile. But that smile disappeared with a snap as a thought crashed into his supposedly shielded brain. You are surprised that your thought screens are not effective, the thought was coldly contemptuous. Well, ever, think you, originated those screens, we did not foresee your theft of them from Valancia. But think you that we would allow to remain at large a thing which we could not neutralize? No. Fool, once and for all. That Aresia does not want and will not tolerate uninvited visitors. Your presence is particularly distasteful, representing as you do a despotic, degrading, and antisocial culture, evil and godar, of course, purely relative. So it cannot be said in absolute terms that your culture is evil. It is, however, based upon greed, hatred, corruption violence, and fear, justice it does not recognize, nor Moser, nor truth except as a scientific utility. It is basically opposed to liberty, now liberty of person, of thought, of acting as the basis and the goal of civilization to which you are opposed, and with which any really philosophical mind must find itself in accord, inflated over when willing by your warped and perverted ideas by your momentary success in dominating your handful of minions, tied to you by bonds of greed, of passion, and of crime, you come here to wrest from us the secret of the land from us, who were already an ancient race when the remotest ancestors of your own were still wriggling in their planet's primordial slime. You consider yourself called hard, ruthless, comparatively you are weak, theft, tender as a child unborn. That you may learn and appreciate that fact is one reason why you are living at this present moment, nor lesson will not begin. Then Helmuth, 
starkly rigid, unable to move a muscle, felt delicate probes enter his brain. One at a time they pierced his innermost being, each to a definitely selected center. It seemed that each thrust carried with it the ultimate measure of exquisitely poignant anguish possible of endurance, but each successive needle carried with it an even more keenly unbearable thrill of agony. Helmuth was not calm and cold now. He would have screamed in wild abandon. But even that relief was denied him. He could not even scream. All he could do was sit there and suffer. Then he began to see things. There, actually materializing in the empty air of the speedster, he saw an endless procession. Things he had done, either in person or by proxy, both during his ascent in his present high place in the pirates' organization and since the attainment of that place. Long was the list, and black, as it unfolded his torment grew more and ever more intense, until finally, after an interval that might have been a fraction of a second or might have been in old hours, he could stand no more. He fainted, sinking beyond the reach of pain into a sea of black consciousness, he awakened white and shaking, wringing wet with perspiration and so weak that he could scarcely sit erect, but with a supremely blissful realization that, for the time being at least, his punishment was over. Thus, you will observed, has been a very mild treatment. The cold derision accents went on inside his brain. Not only do you still live, you are even still sane. We now come to the second reason why you have not been destroyed. Your destruction by us would not be good for that struggling young civilization which you oppose. We have given that civilization an instrument by virtue of which it should become able to destroy you and everything for which you stand. If it cannot do so, it is not yet ready to become a civilization and your obnoxious culture shall be allowed to conquer and to flourish for a time. Now go back to your dome. Do not return. We well know that you will not have the temerity to do so in person. Do not attempt to do so by any form whatever of proxy. There were no threats, no warnings, no mention of consequences. But the level and incisive tone of the derision put a fear into Helm of Scold Heart the like of which he had never before known. He walled his speedster about and hold her at full blast toward his home planet, it was only after many hours that he was able to regain even a semblance of his customary poise, and days elapsed before he could think coherently enough to consider, as a whole, the shocking, the unbelievable thing that had happened to him. He wanted to believe that the creature, whatever it was, had been bluffing taff it could not kill him, that it had done its worst. In a similar case he would have killed without mercy, and that poor seemed to him the only logical one to pursue. His cold reason, however, would not allow him to entertain that comforting belief. Deep down he knew that the Rision could have killed him as easily as it had slain the lowest member of his band, and the thought chilled him to the marrow. What could he do, what could he do endlessly? As the miles and light years reeled off behind his hurtling racer, this question reiterated itself, and when his home planet loomed close it was still unanswered. Since Rollmark believed implicitly Helmuth's statement that it would be poor technique to oppose his return, the planet's screens went down at Helmuth's signal. His first act was to call all the department heads to the center. For an extremely important council of war, there he told them everything that had happened, calmly and concisely, concluding, They are aloof disinterested, unpartisan to a degree I find it impossible to understand. They disapprove of us on purely philosophical grounds, but they will take no active part against us as long as we stay away from their solar system. Therefore, we cannot obtain knowledge of the lens by direct action, but there are other methods which shall be worked out in due course. The Erisians do approve of the patrol and have helped them to the extent of giving them the lens. There, however, they stopped. If the lensmen do not know how to use their lenses, Ephist and I gather that they do note we shall be allowed to conquer and to flourish for a time. We will conquer, 
and we will see to it that the time of our flourishing will be a long one indeed the whole situation then boils down to this our cosmic energy against the lens of the patrol ours is the much more powerful arm but our only hope of immediate success lies in keeping the patrol in ignorance of our cosmic ingriki receptors and converters one lensman already has that knowledge therefore gentlemen it is very clear that the death of that lensman has now become absolutely imperative we must find him if it means the abandonment of our every other enterprise throughout the galaxy give me a full report upon the screening of the solarian system it is done so came the quick reply that system is completely blockaded ships are spaced so closely that even the electromagnetic detectors have a five and warpshunt overlap visual detectors have at least five and fernal overlap nothing as large as one centimeter in any dimension can get through without detection and observation and how about the search of tranco results are still negative one of our ships or gallant with papers all in order visited tranco space court openly no one was there except the regular force of regalians. Our captain was in no position to be too inquisitive. But the missing ship was certainly not in the port, and he gathered that he was the first visitor they had had in a month. We learn it on Rigelid that Tregasneek, the lensman actually there, has been there for a month and will not be relieved for another month. He was the only lensman there. We are, of course, carrying on the search for the rest of the planet about half the personnel of each vessel to land has been lost but they started with double crews and replacements are being sent the lensmit revis knee's story may or may not be true helm of mused it makes little difference it would be impossible to hide that ship in the tranco space port from even a casual inspection and if the ship is not there the lensman is not he may be hiding somewhere else on the planet but I doubt it. Continue to search. Nevertheless, there are many things he may have done. I will have to consider them, one by one. But Helmuth had very little time to consider what Kinnison might have done. For the Lensman had left Tranko long since. Because of the flare baffles upon his driving projectors, his pace was slow. But to compensate for this condition, the distance to be covered was short therefore even as helmerth was cogitating upon what next to do the lensman and his able crew were approaching the far-flung screen of Basconian war vessels investing the entire solar system to approach that screen undetected was a physical impossibility and the four kinnison realized that he was in a danger zone six tractors had flipped tight had seized his ship and had jerked it up to combat range but the lensman was ready for anything and again everything happened at once. Warning screamed into the distant parrot base in Helmuth. Tense at his desk, took personal charge of his mighty fleet. On the field of action Kinnison screens flamed out in stubborn defense. Tracers and tractors snapped under his slashing shears. The baffles disappeared in an incandescent flare as he shot maximum blast into his drive and space again became suffused with the output of his now ultrapotered multiplex scrambler and through that murk the lensman directed a thought toward dearth with the full power of mind and lens port admiral haynes prime base port admiral haynes prime base surgeon kinnison calling from the direction of cyrus worst he sent out the fissler vidlin message it so happened that at prime base it was deep night and port admiral haynes was sound asleep but his ever vigantal lens received the message, and like the Trigurvand old space cat that he was, the admiral came instantly awake. Scarcely had an eye flicked open than his answer had been hauled back. Haynes acknowledging it. Send it. Kinnison coming in. In a pirate ship on Spurby. Forndike. And I. And a crew of the Lanchons. All the pirates in space are on our necks. But we are coming in in spite of hell and high water don't send up any ships to help us down they could blast you out of space in a second but they can't stop us get ready it won't be long now then 
after the port admiral had sounded the emergency alarm kinnison went on our ship carries no markings but there's only one of us and you'll know which one it is we'll be doing the dodging they'd be crazy to follow us down to base with all the stuff you've got but they act crazy enough to do almost anything if they do follow us down that ready to give em everything you've got here we are pursued and pursuers had touched the outermost fringe of the stratosphere f slowed down to optical visibility by even that highly rarefied atmosphere the battle raged in incandescent splendor one ship was spinning twisting looping gyrating jumping and darting hither and thither prafunger every weird maneuver that the fertile and agile mind of the lensman could improvise or shake off the horde of attackers the pirates on the other hand were desperately determined that whatever the cost that lensmen should not land tractors would not hold and the inertial ship could not be rammed therefore their strategy was that which had worked so successfully four times before in similar cassettoing globe the ship completely in the beam her down and while attempting this engulment they so massed their forces as to drive the lensman's vessel as far as possible away from the grim and tremendously powerful fortifications of the patrol's pram base almost directly below them but those four other patrolmen did pirate ships which the pirates had recaptured had not been driven by lensmen and in this ship kinnison the lensman was now calling upon his every resource of instantaneous nervous reaction of brilliant brain and of lightning hand to avoid that fatal trap and devoted he did by series after series of fantastic maneuvers never set down in any manual of space combat powerful as were the weapons of pram base in that tick atmosphere their effective range was less than fifty miles therefore the gunners idle at their controls and the officers of the super drawadings chained by definite orders to the ground fumed and swore as powerless to help their battling fellows they stood by and watched in their plates the furious engagement so high overhead but slowly so slowly kinnison won his way downward keeping as close over base as he could without being england finally he managed to get within range of the gigantic projectors of the patrol only the heaviest of the fixminced guns could reach that mad whirlpool of ships but each one of them raved out against the same spot at precisely the same instant in the inferno which that spot instantly became not even a full driven wall shield could endure and a vast hole yawned where pirate ships had been the beams flicked off f time by his lens kinnison shot his ship through that hole before it could be closed and arrowed downward toward base at maximum blast ship after ship of the pirate horde followed him down in madly suicidal last attempts to blast him out down toward the terrific armament of the base prime base itself the most dreaded the most heavily armed the most impregnable fortress of the galactic patrol nothing afloat could even threaten that citadel the overbold attackers simply disappeared in brief flashes of coruscant vapor kinnison flashed to ground in a free landing and called his commander did any of the other boys beat us in so he asked no so came the curt response congratulations felicitations and celebration would come later he was nay the port admiral receiving an official report then so I have the honor to report that the expedition has succeeded. And he could not help patting informally, youthfully exultant at the success of his first real mission. We've brought home the bacon Ziasik. A powerful fleet had been sent to rescue those of the Britannia's crew who might have managed to stay out of the clutches of the pirates. The wildly enthusiastic celebration inside Prime Base was over, outside the force walls of the reservation. However, it was just beginning. Forndike, then Buskirk, and the Valanchians were in the thick of it. No one on earth, except a few planetorops, had ever heard of Delancha, and those highly intelligent reptilian beings knew even less of Tellus. Nevertheless, simply because they had aided the patrolmen, 
the visitors were practically given the keys to the planet and they were enjoying the experience tremendously we want kinnison we want kinnison the festive crowd led by universal telenus men had been yelling and finally the lensmen came out but after one pose before a lens and a few words into a microphone he pleaded there is my colt honor tenton fled back inside reservation then the milling tide of celebrants rolled back toward the city taking with it every patrolman who could get leave engineers and designers were swarming through and over the pirate ship kinnison had driven home each armed with a sheaf of blueprints already prepared from the long rashid datus pool each directing a corps of mechanics in dismantling some mechanism of the great space rover it was to this hive of bustling activity that kinnison had been called he stood there answering as best he could the multitude of questions being fired at him from all sides until he was rescued by no less a personage than port admiral haynes you gentlemen can get your information from the data sheets better than you can from kinnison he remarked with a smile and i want to take his report without any more delay hand under arm the old lensman led the young one away but once inside his private office he summoned neither secretary nor recorder instead he pushed the buttons which set up a complicator of a shield and spoke but son open up out with it of writhing that you have been holding back ever since you landed i got your signal well yes i have been holding back kinnison admitted i haven't got enough jets to be sticking my neck out in fast company even if it were something to be discussed in public which it is not and glad you could give me this time so soon i want to go over an idea with you and with no one else it may be as cocked as trankow zephyr you are to be the sole judge as to fit but you will know no matter how goofy it is that i mean well that certainly is not an overstatement haynes replied fryly bow ahead the great peculiarity of space combat is that we fly three but fight a note kinnison began apparently irrelevant but choosing his phraseology with care to force an engagement one ship locks to the other first with tracers then with tractors and goes in note thus relative speed determines the ability to force or to avoid engagement but it is relative power that determines the outcome for to four the pirates and by the way we are belittling our opponents and building up a disastrous overconfidence in ourselves by calling them pirates it has been thought before that they were not pirates and now we know definitely that they are not it is more than a race or a system it is actually a black saudi culture it is an absolute despotism holding its authority by means of a rigid system of rewards and punishments in our eyes it is fundamentally wrong but it works how it works it is organized just as we are and is apparently as strong in bases vessels and personnel in my own mind i have been calling the whole culture bisconia since no one seems to know who or what boscon really is perhaps boscon really is the name of the entire organization but to get on with the thought bisconia has had all the best of it both in speed stacks for the britannia's momentary advancing and in power that advantage is not lost to them we will have men to immense powers each galactic in scope each tremendously powerful in arms equipment and personnel each having exactly the same weapons and defenses and each determined to wipe out the other a stalemate is inevitable an absolute deadlock a sheerly destructive war of attrition which will go on for centuries and which must end in the annihilation of both bisconi and civilization but our new cheers and screens protested the older man they give us an overwhelming advantage we can force or avoid engagement as we please you know the plan to crush them you helped to develop it yes i know the plan i also know that we will not crush them so do you we both know that our advantage will be only temporary the dumb lensman unimpressed 
was in deadly earnest. The admiral did not reply for a time. Deep down, he himself had felt the doubt. But neither he nor any other of his school had ever mentioned the thing that Kinnison had now so boldly put into words. He knew that whatever one side had, of weapon or armor or of equipment, would sooner or later become the property of the voters was witnessed by the desperate venture which Kinnison himself had so recently and so successfully concluded. He knew that the devices installed in the vessels captured upon Valancha had been destroyed before falling into the hands of the enemy. But he also knew that with entire fleets so equipped the new arms could not be kept secret indefinitely. Therefore, he finally replied, That may be true. He posed then went on like the indomitable veteran that he was. But we have the advantage now, and we'll drive it while we've got it. After all, we may be able to hold it long enough. I've just thought of one more thing that would help. Communication. Kinnison did not argue the previous point, but went ahead. It seems to be impossible to drive any kind of a communicator beam through the double interference seems to be barked Haynes, it is impossible nothing but a thought that sit exact at loaf interrupted Kinnison in turn. The Valanchians can do things with a lens that nobody would believe possible. Why not examine some of them for lensmen? I'm sure that Worsell could pass. And probably many others. They can drive thoughts through anything except their own Faustrenst and what communicators they would make that idea has distinct possibilities and will be followed up. However, it is not what you wanted to discuss. Lung, at Pite, Kinnison went into Lentzolan's communication. I want some kind of a shield or screen that will neutralize or nullify a detector. I asked Hotkiss, the communications expert, about it and weren't seal. He said that it had never been investigated, even as an academic problem in research, but that it was theoretically possible. This room is shielded. You know, Haynes was surprised at the use of the lenses. Is it that important? I don't know. As I said before, I may be cockeyed, but if my idea is any good at all, that nullifier is the most important thing in the universe. And if word of it gets out, it will be absolutely useless. You so, sowed, over the long route. The only really permanent advantage that we have over Biscania. The one thing that they cannot get is the lens. There must be some way to use it, if that nullifier is possible, and if we can keep it a secret. I believe that I have found it. At least, I want to try something. It may not work, probably it won't. It's a mighty slim chance, but if it does, we may be able to wipe out the Sconi in a few months, instead of carrying on forever a war of attrition. First. I want to go to hold on, Haynes snapped. I've been thinking. Oh, I can't see any possible relation between such a device and any real military weapon, or the lens, either. If I can't, not many others can. And that's a point in your favor. If there is anything at all in your idea, it is too big to share with any one. Even me. Keep it yourself. But it's a peculiar huck -huck and may not be any good at all. Protested Kinnison. You might want to cancel it. No danger of that, came the positive statement. You know more about the pirates opred me, about Boscanation, any other patrolman. You believe that your idea has some slight chance of success. Very well, that fact is enough to put every resource of the patrol back of you. Put your idea on a tape and seal the spool in your private box in the vault so that it will not be lost in case of your death. Then go ahead. If it is possible to develop that nullifier, you shall have it. Hatchkiss will take charge of it, and have any other lensman he wants. No one except lensman will work on it or know anything about it. Only one will be made and no records will be kept. It will not even exist until you yourself release it to us. Thanks. Sowed. And Kinnison left the room. Then four weeks prime base was the scene of an activity furious indeed. No apparatus was designed and tested. She used four tracers and tractors, generators of screens against cosmic ingrici intake, 
scramblers for the communicators of the enemy, and many other things. Each item was designed and tested, redesigned and retested, until even the most spectacle of the patrol's engineers could no longer find in it anything to criticize. Then, throughout the galaxy, the ships of the patrol were called into their sector bases to be rebuilt. There were two B2 great classes of vessels. Those of the first were to have speed in defense and channels. They were to be the fastest things in space, and able to defend themselves against attack. That was all. Vessels of the second class had to be built from the keel upward, since nothing even remotely like them had theretofore been conceived. They were to be huge, and gainly, slow smoothly storehouses of incomprehensibly vast powers of offense. They carried projectors of a size and power never before set upon movable foundations, nor were they dependent upon cosmic energy. They carried their own. In bank upon stupendous bank of gargantuan accumulators. In fact, each of these monstrous floating fortresses was to be able to generate screens of such design and power that no vessel anywhere near them could receive cosmic energy. This, then, was the bolt which civilization was preparing to hurl against Basconia. In theory, the thing was simplicity itself. The ultra fast cruisers would catch the enemy, lock on with tractors, and go inert, thus sankering in space. Then, while absorbing and dissipating everything that the opposition could send, they would put out a peculiarly patterned interference, the center of which could easily be located. The mobile fortresses would then come up, put off the Bosconians' power intake, and finish up the job. Not soon was that bolt forged, but in time civilization was ready to launch its stupendous end. It was generally hoped and believed. Conclusive attack upon Biscania. Every sector base in Subis was ready. The serial hour had been set at prime base Kimball Kinnison, the youngest Tellurian ever to wear the four silver straps of captain, set at the conning plate of the cruiser Bertani Neek, so named at his own request. He thrilled inwardly as he thought of her speed. Such was her force of drive that streamlined to the ultimate degree although she was. She had special wall shields, and special dissipators to radiate into space the heat of friction of the medium through which she tore so madly. Otherwise she would have destroyed herself in an hour of full blast. Even in the hard vacuum of interstellar space and in his office port Admiral Haynes watched a chronometer, minutes to go in seconds, clarifer and light landings, his deep voice was gruff with unexpressed emotion. Five seconds. Pite lifted the fleet shot into the air. The first objective of this Solarian fleet was to fold, and this first hop was to be a short one indeed, for the Bursconians had established bases upon both Pluto and Neptune, right here in the Solarian system. So close to prime base were these bases that only intensive screening and constant vigilance had kept their spy rays out. So powerful were they that the ordinary battleships of the patrol had been impotent against them. Now they were to be removed. Therefore the fleet, cruisers and mullers alike, divided into two parts, one part flashing toward Neptune, the other toward slightly more distant Pluto, Short as was the time necessary to traverse any interplanetary distance, the Solarians were detected and were met in force by the ships of Boscom. But scarcely had battle been joined when the enemy began to realize that this was to be a battle the like of which they had never before seen. And when they began to understand it, it was too late. They could not run. And all space was so full of interference that they could not even report to Helmuf what was going on. These first, peculiarly teared raptored vessels of the patrol did not fight at all. They simply held on like bulldogs, taking without response everything that the white-hot projectors could haul into them. Their defensive screens radiated fiercely, high into the violet, under the appalling punishment being dealt out to them by the batteries of ship and shore. But they did not go down, nor did the grip of a single tractor loosen from its anchorage, and in minutes the squat and monstrous mullers came up. 
Out went their cosmic hingeriki blocking screens. Out shot their tractor beams. And out from the refractory throats of their stupendous projectors there raved the most terrifically destructive forces generable by man. Bascone and outer screen scarcely even flickered as they went down before the measurable. The incredible violence of that crest. The second course offered a briefly brilliant burst of violet radiance as it gave way. The inner screen resisted stubbornly as it ran the spectrum in a wildly coruscant display of pyrotechnic splendor. But it, oh, went through the ultraviolet and into the black. Now the wall shield lights flatter in conceivably rigid fabrication of pure force, which only the instantaneous detonation of twenty metric tons of dudoic had ever been known to rupture was all that barred from the base metal of Bisconian walls the utterly indescribable fury of the Mars beams. Now force was streaming from that shield in veritable torrents. So terrible were the conflicting energies there at grips that their neutralization was actually visible and tangible, in sheets and masses, in terrific, ephoriking vortices, and in miles argand, pillaring streamers and flasses, those energies were being hold a herge to all the points of the sphere's full compass, filling and suffusing all nearby space. The Bisconian commanders stared at their instruments, first in bewildered amazement and then in sheer, stark, Unbelieving horror as their power intake dropped to zero and their wolf shields began to fail and still the attack continued in never licensing power. Surely that beaming must slacken down soon. No conceivable mobile plant could throw such a load for long but those mobile plants Cowdlin did. The attack kept up at the extremely high level upon which it had begun. No ordinary storage cells fed those mighty projectors. Along no ordinary buspers were their tight and a camperages born. Those mullers were designed to do just one thing to maul, and that one thing they did well. Relentlessly and furly, higher and higher into the spectrum the defending wall shields began to radiate. At the first blast they had leapt almost through the visible spectrum, in one unbearably fierce succession of red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and indebile up to a sultry, coruscating, blindingly hard violet. Now the doom shields began leaping erratically into the ultraviolet. To the eye they were already invisible. Upon the recorders they were showing momentary flashes of black. Soon they went down, and in the instant of each failure one vessel of Bisconia was no more. For that last defense bond, Nothing save in resisting metal was left to withstand the ardor of those ultra pullerf ravening beams. As has already been said, no substance, however refractory or resistant or inert, can endure even momentarily in such a field of force. Therefore, every atom, alike of vessel and of contents, went to make up the searing, seeking burst of brilliant incandescently luminous vapor which suffused also commute in bits space. Thus passed out of the scheme of things the vessels of the Solarian detachment of Bisconia. Not a single vessel escaped. The cruisers saw to that, and then the attack thundered on to the bases themselves. Here the cruisers were useless. They merely formed an observant fringe, the while continuing to so blank at all channels of communication that the doomed bases could send out no word of what was happening to them, the Mullers moved up and grimly, doffedly, methodically went to work, since a base is always much more powerfully armored than is a battleship. The reduction of these fortresses took longer than had the destruction of the fleet, but the bases could no longer draw power from the sun or from any other heavenly body and their other sources of power were comparatively weak. Therefore, their defenses also failed under that nevsi rissing assault. Course after course their screens went down, and with the last one went the base. The Mahler's beams went through metal and masonry as effortlessly as steaglidate bullets go through butter, and bore on deep into the planet's bedrock. Before their frightful force was spent, then around and around they spiraled, until nothing whatever was left of the Bisconian works, until only a seeking, 
wet hot lake of molten lava in the midst of the planet's frigid waste was all that remained to show that anything had ever been built there surrender had not been fought of quarter or clemency had not been asked nor offered victory of itself was not enough this was and of stern necessity had to be a war of utter complete and merciless extinction Zuv, the enemy strongholds so indulgently close to prime base having been obliterated the solarian fleet sailed on into space for a few weeks game was plentiful enough hundreds of raiding vessels were overtaken and held by the patrol cruisers then blasted to vapor by the maulers many visconian bases were also reduced the locations of most of these had long been known to the intelligence service others were detected or discovered by the fast flying cruisers themselves marauding vessels revealed the sights of others by succeeding in reaching them before being overtaken by the cruisers others were found by the tracers and loops of the signal corps very few of these bases were hidden or in any way difficult of access and most of them fell before the blasts of a single muller but if one muller was not enough others were summoned until it did fall one fortress a hitherto unknown and surprisingly strong sector base required the concentration of every muller of the solarian fleet but they were brought up in the fortress spell as has been said this was a war of extinction and every pirate base that was found was reduced but one day a cruiser found a base which had not even a spiray shield up and a cursory inspection showed it to be completely empty machinery equipment stores and personnel had all been evacuated suspicious the patrol vessels stood off and beamed it from afar but there were no untoward occurrences the structure simply slumped down into lava and that was all every base discovered the rafter was in the same condition and at the same time the ships of Boscon, formerly so plentiful disappeared utterly from space day after day the cruisers sped hither and thither throughout the vast reaches of the bird at the peak of their unimaginably high pace without finding a trace of any Bisconian vessel more remarkable still and for the first time in years the Nikar was absolutely free from Bisconian interference following an impulse kinnison asked and received permission to take his ship on scouting duty at maximum blast he drove toward the Valanchian system to the point at which he had picked up Helmuth's communication line along that line he drove Fort Wentwito solid dazed halting only when a considerable distance outside the galaxy ahead of him there was nothing whatever except one or two distant and nebulous star clusters behind him there extended the immensity of the galactic lens in all its splendor but captain kinnison had no eye for astronomical beauty that day he held the britannia there for an hour while he mulled over in his mind what the parrot facts could mean he knew that he had covered the line from the point of determination out beyond the galaxy's edge he knew that his detectors operating as they had been in clear and in distor to defer could not possibly have missed a thing as large as helmuth's base must be if it had been anywhere near that line that their effective range was immensely greater than the largest possible error in the determination or the following of the line there were he concluded three possible explanations and only three first helm of space might also have been evacuated this was almost unthinkable from what he himself knew of Helmuth, that base would be as nearly impregnable as anything could be made and it was no more apt to be vacated than was the prime base of the patrol second Helmuth might already have the device he himself wanted so badly and upon which Hotchkiss and the other experts had been at work so long had a tectern alpha fire. This was possible. Distinctly so. Possible enough, at least, to warrant filing the idea for future consideration. Footh, that base might not be in the galaxy at all, but in that star cluster out there straight ahead of the Brittany Me, or possibly in one even farther way. That idea seemed the best of the three it would necessitate alter-polar communicators 
of course, but Helmuth could very well have them. It squared up in other ways. Its pattern fitted into the matrix very nicely. But if that base were out there, it could stay there for a while. The Britannia just wasn't enough ship for that job. Too much opposition out there. And noting widths. Or too much ship, but he wasn't ready. Yet, anyway, he needed, and would get, another line on helm of space. Therefore, shrugging his shoulders, he walled his vessel about and set out to rejoin the fleet. While a full day short of junction, Kinnison was called to his plate, to see upon its lambent surface the visage of Port Admiral Haynes. Did you find out anything on your trip? he asked. Nothing definite. So, just a couple of things to think about, is all. But I can't say that I don't like this at all. I don't like anything about it or any part of it. No more do I, agreed the Admiral. It looks very much as though your forecast of a stalemate might be about to eventuate. Where are you headed for now back to the fleet? Don't do it. Stay on scouting duty for a while longer. If, unless something more interesting turns up, report back here to base. We have something that may interest you. The bows have been the admiral's picture was broken up into flashes of blinding light and his words became a meaningless. Jumbled drawer of nose. A distress call had begun to come in, only to be blotted out by a flood of the Bisconian static interference, of which the ether had for so long been clear. Got its center located, Kinnison barked at his communications officer. Their claws were to now relapse, yes. Sir, and the radio man snapped out numbers. Blast, the captain commanded, unnecessarily, for the alert pilot had already set the course and his levers were even then flashing across their rocks. I don't know what we can do, since we haven't got a thing to do anything with. If that baby is what I think it is, but believe me, we'll try toward the center of disturbance shop, Brit Annie Lee, herself emitting now a scream of peculiarly patterned interference which was not only a scrambler of all possible communication throughout that whole sector of the galaxy, but also an imperative call for any mauler within that sector. So close had the Brit Anini been to the scene of depredation that for her to reach it required only minutes. There lay the merchantman and her Bisconian assailant, emboldened by the cessation of piratical activities. Some shipping concern had sent out a freighter, loaded probably with highly urgent cargo, and this was the result. The moreover, a note, had gripped her with his tractors and was beaming her into submission. She was resisting, but feebly now. It was apparent that her screens were failing. Her crew must soon open ports in token of surrender, or roast to a man, and they would probably prefer to roast Thus the situation in one instant. The next instant it was changed. The Bisconian discovering suddenly that his beams, instead of boring through the weak defenses of the freighter, were not even exciting to aglow the mighty protective envelopes of a cruiser of the patrol. He switched from the diffused heat beam he had been using upon the merchantman to the hardest, hottest, most penetrating beam of annihilation he mount with but little more to show for it and with no better results. For the Brit NEI screens had been designed to stand up almost indefinitely against the most potent beams of any space ship. And they stood up. Increase power as he would. To whatever ruinous overload, the pirate could not break down Kinnison's screens. Four. Dodge as he would. Could he again get in position to attack his former prey? and eventually the muller arrived. Fortunately it, though, had been fairly close by, outreached its mighty tractors, outraved one of its tremendous beams, striking the Bosconian's defenses squarely amidships. That beam struck and the pirate ship disappeared not in a hazily incandescent flare of volatizzled metal. The raider disappeared bodily, and still all in one piece. He had put out shears of his own, snapping even the Muller's tractors like Fred's, and the velocity of his departure was due almost as much to the presser effect of the patrol beam as it was to the thrust of his own powerful drivers. 
It was the beginning of the stalemate Kinnison had foreseen. I was afraid of that, the young captain muttered, F, paying no attention whatever to the merchantman. He called the commander of the Muller. At this close range, of course, no possible for scrambler could interfere with visual apparatus, and there on his plate he saw the face of Clifford Maitland, the man who graduated, no, to in his own class. Why? Kim. You old space flea, Maitland exclaimed in delight. Oat. Pardon me. So, he went on in mock deference, with an exaggerated salute, to a guy with four jets. I should say, see all that. Cliff, or I'll climb up you like a squall. First chance I get, Kinnison retorted. So they've got you skippering one of the big battle wagons. A lucky stiff think of a mere infant like you being let play with so much high power. But what'll we do about this heap here, dem if I know? It isn't covered. So you'll have to tell me. Captain, who am I to be passing out orders, as you say? It isn't covered in the book. It's against G.I. regs for them to be cutting our tractors. But he's all yours. Not mine. I've got to flit. You might find out what he's carrying. From where? To where? And why? Then, if you want to, you can escort him either back where he came from or on to where he's going. Whichever you think quest, if this interference dies out, you'd better report to Prime Base and get some real orders. If it doesn't, use your own judgment. If any, clear reefer, cliff, I've got to buzz along. Free landings. Space hunt now. Bickizing in turn to his pilot wove got urgent business at base. And when I say urgent, I don't mean perchance. Let's see you burn a hole in the ether. And that worthy snapped his levers over to maximum blast. The Britannian made the run to prime base in a few days. And scarcely had she touched ground when Kinnison was summoned to the office of the port admiral. As soon as he was announced, Haynes brusquely cleared his office and sealed it against any possible form of intrusion or eavesdropping before he spoke. He had aged noticeably since these two had had that memorable conference in this same room. His face was lined and careworn. His eyes and his entire mien bore witness two days and nights of sleepsly continuous work. You were right. Kinnison. He began. Abruptly. A stalemate it is. A hopeless deadlock. I called you in to tell you that Hotchkiss has your Nulfa fire done, and that it works perfectly against all long-range stuff. It works fairly well on vision, except at close range, against Electromagnetskis. However, it is not very effective. About all that can be done, it seems, is to shorten the range. It has not been possible, as yet, to develop a screen against magnetism, Perhaps we expected too much. I can get by with that. I think I will be out of electromagnetic range most of the time. And nobody watches their electros very close. Anyway, thanks a lot. It's ready to install doesn't need installation. It's such a little thing you can put it in your pocket. It's self-contained and will work anywhere. Better and better. In that case, I'll need to have a ship. I would like to have one of those new automatic speedsters. For lots of lebs. Cruising range. In screens. Only one beam. But I probably won't use even that one so footnote four. Unlike the larger war vessels of the patrol, speedsters are very narrow in proportion to their length. And in their design nothing is considered safe speed and maneuverability. Very definitely they are not built for comfort. Thus, although their gravity plates are set for horizontal flight, they have braking jets, under jets, side jets, and top jets, as well as driving jets, so that in inert maneuvering any direction whatever may seem down, and that direction may change with bewildering rapidity. Nothing can be loose in a speedster. Everything, even to the food supplies in the refrigerators, must be clamped into place. Sleeping is done in hammocks, not in beds. All seats and resting places have heavy safety straps, 
and there are no loose items of furniture or equipment anywhere on board, because they are designed for the most possible speed in the free condition. Speedsters are extremely cranky and tricky in inert flight, unless they are being handled upon their underjets, which are designed and placed specifically and only for inert flight. Some of the ultra-fast vessels of the pirates, as will be brought out later, were also of this shape and design. Going alone interrupted Haynes. Better take a battle cruiser. At least. I don't like the idea of your going out there alone. I don't particularly relish the prospect. Either. But it's got to be that way. The whole fleet, Mollers and all, isn't enough to do by force what's got to be done. And even two men are too many to do it in the only way it can be done. Yes, so. So no explanations. Please. It's on the spool, where we can get it if we need it. Are you informed as to the latest developments? No. So, I heard a little coming in, but not much. We are almost back where we were before you took off in the Brittany We Commerce is almost at a standstill. All over the galaxy, all shipping firms are practically idle. But that is neither all of it nor the worst of it. You may not realize how important interstellar trade is, but as a result of its stoppage general business has slowed down tremendously, as is only to be expected. Perhaps complaints are coming in by the thousand because we have not already blasted the parrots out of space, and demands that we do so at once. They do not understand the true situation, nor realize that we are doing all that we can do. We cannot send a Mauler with every freighter and liner, and Muller extra vessels are the only ones to arrive at their destinations. But why with tractor shears on all ships? How can they hold the masked Kinnison? Magnet snorted Haynes. Planed. All fadash and electromagnets. Nopal to speak of. At a distance. Of course. But with the raider running free. A millionth of a dine is enough. Close up lock of Norden stormled on hems. That changes things. I've got to find a pirate ship. I was planning on following a freighter or liner out toward Alsican. But if there aren't any to follow, we'll have to hunt around some that is easily arranged. Lots of them want to go. We will let one go, with a muller accompanying her. But we'll outside detect a range. That covers everything. Then, except the assignment. I can't very well ask for leave, but maybe I could be put on special assignment, reporting direct to you something better than that. And Haynes smiled broadly, in genuine pleasure. Everything is fixed. Your release has been entered in the books. Your commission as captain has been cancelled. So leave your uniform in your former quarters. Here is your credit book and here is the rest of your kit. You are now an unattached lensman. The release, the goal toward which all lensmen strive, but which so comparatively few attain. Even after years of work, he was now a free agent, responsible to no one and to nothing save his own conscience. He was no longer of Earth, nor of the Solarian system, but of the galaxy as a whole. He was no longer a tiny cog in the immense machine of the Galactic Patrol. Wherever he might go, Throughout the immensity of the entire island universe, he would be the Galactic Patrol, yes. It's real. The older man was enjoying the youngster's stupefaction at his release, reminding him as it did of the time, long years ago, when he had won his own. You go anywhere you please and do anything you please, for as long as you please. You take anything you want, whenever you want it, with or without giving Ria Sonlacher, you will usually give a thumb bump and credit slip in return. You report if, as, when, where, thou, and to whom you please or not. As you please. You don't even get a salary any more. You help yourself to that, though, wherever you may be as much as you want. Whenever you want it. Bub. Sirely's mean that is Kinnison gulped three times before he could speak coherently. I'm not ready. So'd. Why? I'm nothing but a kid. 
I haven't got enough jets to swing it. Just the bare thought of it scares me into hysterics, it would. It always does. The Admiral was very much in earnest now. But it was a glad. Pridermistness. You are to be as nearly absolutely three an agent as it is possible for a living. Flesh no mooden creature to be. To the man on the street that would seem to spell a condition of perfect bliss. Only a grey lensman knows what a frightful load it really is. But it is a load that such a lensman is glad and proud to carry. Yes. So he would be. Of course. If he that fought will bother you for a time if it did not. You would not be here, but do not worry about it any more than you can help. All I can say is that in the opinion of those who should know, not only have you proved yourself ready for release, but also you have earned it. How do they figure that out, Kinnison demanded? Hotly, all that saved my bacon on that trip was luck of Bernard Bergen Holman at the time I thought that it was bad luck. At that and then Busker and Worsell and the other boys in heaven knows who else pulled me out of jam after jam. I'd like awfully well to believe that I'm ready. So, but I'm not. I can't take credit for pure dumb luck and for other men's abilities. Well, cooperation is to be expected, and we like to make gray lensmen out of the lucky ones. Haynes laughed deeply. It may make you feel better, though, if I tell you two more things, First, that so far you have made the best showing of any man yet graduated from Wentworth Hall. Second, that we of the court believe you would have succeeded in that almost impossible mission without Van Buskirk, without Worsell, and without the lucky failure of the Bergen home. In a different, and now, of course, unjustguessable fashion, but succeeded, nevertheless. Nor is this to be taken as in any sense a belittlement of the very real abilities of those others, nor a denial that luck, or chance, does exist. It is merely our recognition of the fact that you have what it takes to be an unattached lensman. Seal it now, and buzz off he commanded, as Kinnison tried to say something. If, clapping him on the shoulder, he turned him around and gave him a gentle shove toward the door. Clear reefer, lad, same to you. Several of it there is. I still think that you and all the rest of the court are cockeyed, but I'll try not to let you down. And the newly and attached lensman blundered out. He stumbled over the threshold, bumped against a stenographer who was hurrying along the corridor, and almost barged into the jam of the entrance door instead of going through the opening. Outside he regained his physical poise and walked on there toward his quarters. But he never could remember afterward what he did or whom he met on that long. Cast back, over and over, the one thought pounded in his brain. Unattached, 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 and behind him, in the port admiral's office, that high official sat and mused, smiling faintly with lips and eyes, staring insanely at the still open doorway through which Kinnison had staggered, the boy had measured up in every particular. He would be a good man. He would marry. He did not think so now. Of course, in his own mind, his life was consecration. He would, if necessary, the patrol itself would see to it that he did. There were ways. And such stock was altogether too good not to be propagated. If fifteen years or so from one if he lived when he was no longer fit for the granding, grueling life to which he now looked forward so eagerly. He would select the earthbound job for which he was best fitted and would become a good executive. For such were the executives of the patrol. But this day dreaming was getting him nowhere. Cast. He shook himself and plunged again into his work. Kinnison reached his quarters at last, realizing with a thrill that they were no longer his. He now had no quarters, nor residence no address, wherever he might be, throughout the whole of a limitable space. There was his home. But, instead of being dismayed by the thought of the life he faced, he was filled by a fierce eagerness to be actually living it. There was a tap at his door and an orderly entered, carrying a bulky package, nor grazed. So, he announced, with a crisp salute, Thanks, 
Kinnison returned the salute as smartly, if almost before the door had closed. He was stripping off the space black and spantergordiousness of the captain's uniform he wore, and was donning gray, the gray than of orned, neutral clorge leather that was the proud garb of that branch of the patrol to which he was thenceforth to belong. It had been tailored to his measurements, and he could not help studying with approval his reflection in the mirror. The round, almost visceral's cap, heavily and softly quilted in protection against the helmet of his armor. The heavy goggles, opaque to all radiation harmful to the eyes. The short jacket, emphasizing broad shoulders and narrow waist. The trim breeches and high last boots, encasing particle, tapering leads. What an outfit, it an outfit, he breathed. And maybe I ain't such a bad-looking ape. At that, in these greys he did not then, and never did realize that he was wearing the plainest, drabbest, most strictly utilitarian uniform in the known universe. For to him, as to all others who knew it, the sheer, stark simplicity of the unattached lensman's plain grey leather transcended by far the gaudy trappings of the other branches of the service. He admired himself boyishly, as men do, feeling a trifle ashamed in so doing. But he did not then and never did appreciate but a striking figure of a man he really was as he strode out of quarters and down the wide avenue toward the Britannia Eyes dock. He was glad, indeed, that there had been no ceremony or public show connected with this, his real and only important graduation, for as his fellows not only his own crew, but also his friends from all over the reservation about him, mauling and pummeling him in congratulation and acclaim. He knew that he couldn't stand much more. If there were to be much more of it, he discovered suddenly, he would either pass out cold or cry like a baby. He didn't quite know which. That whole hymning, chanting mob clustered about him, if, considering it an honor to carry the least of his personal belongings, formed a yelling, capped so escort. Traffic meant nothing whatever to that pleasantly mad crew. Four, temporarily, did regulations, let traffic detour, let pedestrians, no matter how august, cool their heels, let cars, trucks, yes, even trains, wait until they got past, let everything wait, or turn around and go back, or go some other way. Here comes Kinnison, Kinnison. Grail Ensman make way and way was made from the Britannia eyes dock clear across base to the slip in which the Lensman's new speedster lay. And what a ship this little speedster was trim. Triv. Streamlined to the ultimate she lay there, quiescent but searched with power. Almost sentient she was. This pipe rakes, ultras ace little fabrication of space tinged aloe, instantly ready at his touch to liberate those tremendous energies which were to hold him through the infinite reaches of the cosmic void. None of the mob came aboard. Of course, they backed off, still frantically waving and throwing whatever came closest to hand, and as Kinnison touched a button and shot into the air he swallowed several times in a vain attempt to dispose of an amazing lump which had somehow appeared in his throat. These it so happened that for many long weeks there had been lying in New York spaceport an urgent shipment for Alsekin. And not only was that urgency a one-way affair. For, with the possible exception of a few packets, whose owners had locked them in vaults and would not part with them at any price, there was not a single Alsekinaged cigarette left on oaf luxuries. When as now, soared feverishly in price with scarcity, only the rich smoked Tulsacanached cigarettes, and to those rich the price of anything they really wanted was a matter of almost complete indifference. And plenty of them wanted, and wanted badly, their Tulsacanached cigarettes. There was no doubt of that. The current market report upon them was, with 1,000 credits per packet of 10, offered none at any price. With that ecroplining figure in mind, a merchant prince named Matthews had been trying to get an Alzacan downship into the Neefer, 
he knew that one carbovalsicanaged cigarette safely landed in any tellurian spaceport would yield more profit than could be made by his entire fleet in ten years of normal trading therefore he had four weeks been pulling every wire and even every string that he could reapectulate financial even at times verging altogether too close for comfort upon the criminal without results for even if he could find a crew willing to take the risk to launch the ship without an escort would be out of the question there would be no profit in a ship that did not return to earth the ship was his to do with as he pleased but the escorting maulers were assigned solely by the galactic patrol and that patrol would not give his ship an escort in answer to his first request he had been informed that only cargoes classed as necessary were being escorted at all regularly that semine separacy loads were escorted occasionally when of a particularly useful or desirable commodity and if opportunity offered that luxury loads such as his were not being escorted at all that he would be notified if as and when the promifesh could be given escort then the merchant prince began his siege politicians of higher rank local and national sent in requests of varying degrees of diplomacy financiers first offered inducements then fret and to bear down then put on all the various kinds of pressure known to their press for euling ilk pleased demands threats and pressures were alike however futile the patrol could not be coaxed or bullied cajoled bribed or cowed and all further communications upon the subject from whatever source originating were ignored having exhausted his every resource of diplomacy politics guide and finance the merchant prince resigned himself to the inevitable and stopped trying to get his ship off the ground then like the proverbial bolt from the blue new york subis received from prime base an open message not even coded which read authorized spaceship promethesh to clear for alsican at will escorted by patrol ship before two twenty s eight hundred thirty whose present orders are hereby cancelled said haynes a demolition bomb dropped into that subis would not have caused greater excitement than did that message neither the base commander the captain of the Muller, the captain of the Pronifetch, nor the highly pleased but equally surprised Matthews could explain it. But all of them did whatever they could to expedite the departure of the freighter. She was, and had been for a long time, practically ready to sail. As the base commander and Matthews sat in the office, shortly before the scheduled time of departure, Kinnis and Aravetter, more correctly, let them know that he was there he invited them both into the control room of his speedster and invitations from gray lensmen were accepted without question or demur i suppose that you are wondering what this is all about he began i'll make it as short as i can i asked you in here because this is the only convenient place in which i know that what we say will not be overheard there are lots of spires around here whether you know it or not the Prometheus is to be allowed to go to Alcipint, because that is where pirates seem to be most numerous, and we do not want to waste time hunting all over space to find one. Nor vessel was selected, Mr. Matthews, for three reasons, and in spite of the attempts you have been making to obtain special privileges, not because of them, first because there is no necessary or semi separacy freight waiting for clearance into that region second because we do not want your firm to fail we do not know of any other large shipping line in such a shaky position as yours nor of any firm anywhere to which one single cargo would make such an immense financial difference you are certainly right there lensman matthews agreed hold her tedly it means bankruptcy on the one hand and a fortune on the other. Here's what is to happen. The ship and the Muller blast off on Spetel. Fourteen minutes from now, they get about to Valeriat, when they are both recaltergent orders for the Muller to go on rescue work. The Muller comes back. 
but your captain will in all probability keep on going saying that he started out for alsekin and that's where he's going but he wouldn't he wouldn't dare gasped the ship owner sure he would kinnison insisted cheerfully enough that is the third good reason your vessel is being allowed to set out because it certainly will be attacked you didn't know it until now but your captain and over half of your crew are pirates themselves and what pirates matthews bellowed i'll go down there and you'll do nothing whatever mr matthews except watch things and you will do that from here the situation is entirely under control but my ship my cargo the shipper wailed will be ruined if let me finish please the lensman interrupted as soon as the muller turns back it is practically certain that your captain will send out a message letting the pirates know that he is easy prey within a minute after sending that message he does so does every other pirate aboard your ship lands on the leary and takes on a crew of space fighting wildcats headed by peter van buskirk then it goes on toward alsikin when the pirates board that ship after its pre-arranged half-rated resistance and easy surrender they are going to think that all hell's out for noon especially since the muller back from her rescue work will be tabbing along not too far away then my ship will really go to alsipant and back safely matthews was almost dazed matters were entirely out of his hands and things had moved so rapidly that he hardly knew what to think but if my own crews are pirates some of them may be taken of course get police protection if necessary unless something entirely in force and happens the promethesh will make the round trip in safety cargoes and all done or mole rescort all the way you will of course have to take the other matter up with your local police when is the attack to take place so asked the base commander that's what the muller skipper wanted to know when i told him what was ahead of him kinnison grinned he wanted to sneak up a little closer about that time i'd like to know myself but unfortunately that will have to be decided by the parrots after they get the signal it will be on the way out though because the cargo she has aboard now is a lot more valuable to boscone than a load of ulcicanaced cigarettes would be but do you think you can take the pirate ship that way asked the commander dubiously no but he will cut down his personnel to such an extent that he will have to head back for base and that's what you want a base i sue he did not seek was that the lensman did not enlighten him further there was a brilliant double flare as freighter and muller lifted into the air. Kinnison showed the ship owner right. Hadn't I better be going? To ask the commander. Those orbers. You know. A couple of minutes yet. I have another message for your facility. Matthews want me to police escort Long Fianni. When that ship is attacked, it is to be the signal for cleaning out every pirate in Greater New York Hearth Worst Pirate Hotbed on Talus neither you nor your force will be in on it directly but you might pass the word around so that our own men will be informed ahead of the telena's outfits good that has needed doing for a long time yes but you know it takes a long time to line up every man in such a big organization they want to get them all without getting any innocent bystanders who's doing it prime base yes enough men will be thrown in here to do the whole job in an hour that is good news clear reefer lensman and the base commander went back to his post as the airlock tobbles rammed home sealing the exit behind the departing visitor kinnison eased his speedster into the air and headed for Beleria. since the two vessels ahead of him had left atmosphere inertials as would he and since several hundred seconds had elapsed since their take-off he was of course some ten thousand miles off their line as well as being uncounted millions of miles behind them but the larger distance meant no more than the smaller and neither of them meant anything at all to the patrol's finest speedster kinnison uneasy turning blast caught up with them in minutes closing up to less than one light year 
he slowed his pace to match theirs and held his distance any ordinary ship would have been detected in stantingland since in fact but kinnison rode no ordinary ship his speedster was immune to all detection save electromagnet accord visual f therefore even at that close range try travel of half a minute for even a slow spaceship in open space he was safe for electromagnets are useless at that distance and visual apparatus even with subifer converters is reliable only up to a few mere thousands of miles unless the observer knows exactly what to look for and where to look for it kinnison then closed up and followed the promethesh and hermolris port and as they approached the valyrian solar system sure enough the recall messages came booming in also as had been expected the renegade captain of the freighter sent back first his defiant answer and then his message to the pirate high command the molar turned back the merchantman kept on subtly however she stepped a note and from her ports were ejected discreet bits of matter borpably the bodies of the Bisconian members of her crew then the promethech again inertials flashed directly toward the planet valeria and inertials landing is of course highly irregular and is made only when the ship is to take off again immediately it saves all the time ordinarily lost in spiraling and deceleration and saves the computation of a landing orbit which is no task for an amato computer it is however dangerous it takes power plenty of it to maintain the force which neutralizes the inertia of mass and if that force fails even for an instant while a ship is upon a planet's surface the consequences are usually highly disastrous for in the neutralization of inertia there is no magic no getting of something for nothing no violation of nature's law of the conservation of matter and energy the instant that force becomes an operative the ship possesses exactly the same velocity momentum and inertia that it possessed at the instant the force took effect thus if a spaceship takes off from merck with its orbital velocity of about eighteen and one half miles per second relative to the sun goes three dashes to mars lands three and then goes a note its original velocity both in speed and in direction is instantly restored with consequences better imagined than described such a velocity of course might take the ship harmlessly into the air but it probably would not but the promethesh landed three and so bit kinnison he stepped down fully armored against Valeria's extremely heavy atmosphere and laboring a trifle under its terrific gravitation to be greeted cordially by lieutenant van buskirk his fighting men were already streaming aboard the freighter why chief the dutchman called gaina everything went off like clockwork won't hold you up long be blasting off in ten minutes both lefty the lensman acknowledged as cordially but saluting the newly commissioned officer with an exaggerated formality safe lust i've been doing some thinking why wouldn't it be a good idea to a hat it would not denied the fighter positively i know what you're going to say thought you want in on this party but don't say it but i kinnison began to argue dix the valerian declared flatly you've got to stay with your speedster no room for her inside as she's full to the last meter with cargo and with my men you can't clamp on outside as that would give the whole thing away and besides for the first and last time in my life i've got a chance to give a gray lensman orders those orders are to stay out of and away from this ship and i'll see to it that you do oh you little tellurian wart bar but a kick i get out of that you would you but Dumbleria nape. You always were Smalls doll type, Kinnison retorted. Pidgey Hagnish. Paul ha Dan Buskirk nodded. How else could I'd ox so rough to you and get away with it, however? Don't feel too bad. You aren't missing a thing. Really? 
this thing is in the cans already and your fun is up ahead somewhere and by the way Kim, congratulations you had it coming we're all behind you from here to the next universe and back thanks and the same to you lusk and many of them well if you won't let me stow away i'll tag along behind i guess clear effer or rather i hope it's full of pirates by tomorrow morning won't be though probably don't imagine they'll move until we're almost there and tab along kinnison did through thousands and thousands of parsecs of uneventful voyage part of the time he spent in the speedster dashing hither and yon most of it however he spent in the vastly more comfortable muller to the armored side of which his tiny vessel clung with its magnetic clamps while he slept in date gossiped and dread exercised and played with the muller's officers and crew in deep six camaraderie it so happened however that when the long-weighted attack developed he was out in his speedster and the saw and heard everything from the beginning space was filled with the old familiar interference the raider flashed up locked on with magnets and began to beam not heavily enough to warm up the defensive screens and kinnison probed into the pirate with his spy ray terrestrationly americans he exclaimed half aloud startled for an instant but naturally they would be since this is a put-up job and over half the crew were new york gangsters the blighters got his spiry screens up the pilot was grumbling to his captain the fact that he spoke in english was immaterial to the lensman he would have understood equally well any other possible form of communication or of thought exchange that wasn't part of the plan was it if helmuth or one of the naval mines at his base had been directing that attack it would have stopped right there the pilot had shown a flash of feeling that with a little encouragement might have grown into a suspicion but the captain was not an imaginative man therefore nothing was said about it either way he replied probably the mate's on duty he is not one of us you know all the better if he is the captain will open up if he doesn't do it pretty quick i'll open her up myself there the port's opening slide a little forward hold it go get him men then men hundreds of them armed and armored swarm through the freighter's locks but as the last man of the boarding party passed the portal something happened that was most decidedly not on the program the outer port slammed shut and its stobbles drove home blast those screens knocked them down get in there with a spy ray bark the pirate captain he was not one of those hardy and valiant souls who like dilder sleeve it left in person the tax of his cutrokes he emulated instead the higher Bosconian officials and directed his raids from the safety of his control room but as has been intimated he wasn't like those officials in that he lacked directorial ability thus it was only after it was too late that he became suspicious i wonder if somebody could have double roast us hijackers we'll soon know the pallet growled and even as he spoke the spy ray got through revealing a very shambles for van buskirk and his valerians had not been caught knacking nor were they a crooner martyr partially armed and rendered even more impotent by internal mutiny strait and slaughter shoe as the pirates had expected to find instead of such a crew the boarders met a force that was overwhelmingly superior to their own font only in point of numbers but even more markedly in the strength and agility of its units also the defenders were more capably armed than were the attackers Sis, in addition to the efficient armor of the patrol and its old retardedly portable weapons at least one of those terrific semi-portable projectors commanded every corridor of the freighter in the blasts of those projectors most of the pirates died instantly not knowing what struck them not even knowing that they died they were the fortunate ones the others knew what was coming and saw it as it came 
for the Valyrians did not even row their delameters. They knew that the pirate's armor could withstand for many minutes sandy hand weapons beams, and they disdained to remount the heavy semi portable. They came in with their space axes, and at the sight the pirates broke and ran screaming in panic fear. But they could not escape. The toggles of the exit port were not only in their sockets, but they were also locked in them. Therefore, the storming party died to the last man. If, as Van Busterk had foretold, it was scarcely even a struggle, for any ordinary space armor is just so much in against a Valyrian's winging a space axe. The spiray of the pirate captain got through just in time to see the ghastly finale of the massacre, and his face turned first purple, then white. The patrol, he gasped, Vile region, whole company of the mile say we've been double roastery too for jolly well been. The pilot agreed. You don't know the half of it yet, either. Some may be coming. And it isn't to bow scout. If a muller should suck us in, we'd be very much a spent force. What cut out the conversation snapped the captain. Is it a muller? Or not a bit too far away yet to say. But it probably is. They wouldn't have sent those jaspers out without cover. Old Bean, they knew that we can burn that frighter's screens down in an hour. Better cut the beams and get ready to run. What the commander did so. Wild thoughts racing through his mind. If a muller got close enough to him to use magnets. He was done. Cutting arcs would burn through his armor like cheese. And he had no fighting men left. And even if he had an in a full crew of the most savage fighters, Nome would have to be inescapably cornered before they would mix it with what that Mauler had aboard. He would have to go back to base. Anyway, telly ho. Old Fruit the pilot slammed his levers over to maximum blast. It's a Mauler, and we've been bloody well jobbed. Back to base, yes. And the discomfited captain energized his communicator to report to his immediate superior the humiliating outcome of the supposedly carefully planned coup. Subi, as the pirate fled into space, Guinnesson followed, matching his quarry in course and speed. He then cut in the automatic controller on his drive, the automatic recorder on his plate, and began to tune in his beam tracer, only to be brought up short by the realization that the spire's point would not stay in the pirate's control room without constant attention and manual adjustment. He had known that, though, even the most precise of automatic controllers, driven by the most carefully stabilized electronic currents, are prone to slip twenty feet or so at even such close range as ten million miles, especially in the bumpy for near solar systems and there was nothing to correct the slip. He had not thought of that before. The pallet always made those minor corrections as a matter of course. But now he was torn between two desires. He wanted to listen to the conversation that would ensue as soon as the pirate captain got into communication with his superior officers. If, especially should Helmuth put in his beam, he very much wanted to trace it and thus secure another line on the headquarters he was so anxious to locate. He now feared that he could not do Boff a fear that soon was to prove Welgrid and wished fervently that for a few minutes he could be two men or at least of a lanchion. They had eyes and hands and separate brain compartments enough so that they could do half a dozen things at once and do each one well. He could not, but he could try. Maybe he should have brought one of the boys along. At that no, that would wreck everything. Later on, he would have to do the best he could. Communication was established, and the pirate captain began to make his report by using one hand on the ray and the other on the tracer. Kinnison managed to get a partial line and to record scraps of the conversation. He missed, however, the essential part of the entire episode that part in which the base commander turned the unsuccessful captain over to Helmuth himself. Therefore, Kinnison was surprised indeed at the disappearance of the beam he was so laboriously tracing, and to hear Helmuth conclude his castigation of the unlucky captain with, Not entirely your fault. We will not punish you at all severely this time. Report to our base on Aldebarnai. 
turn your vessel over to base commander there and do anything he tells you to do for thirty of the days of that planet frantically kinnison drew back his tracer and searched for helmuth's beam but before he could synchronize with it the message of the pirate's high chief was finished and his beam was gone the lensman set back and fought aldebaran practically next door to his own solarian system from which he had come so far how had they possibly managed to keep concealed or to restablish a base so close to sol through all the intensive searching that had been done but they had that was the important thing anyway he knew where he was going and that helped one other thing he hadn't thought of oh, and one that might have spoiled Evertifus in the fact that he couldn't stay awake indefinitely to follow that ship he had to sleep some time, and while he was asleep his quarry was bound to escape. Who, <clears throat> of course, had a crisp tracer, which would hold a ship without attention as long as it was anywhere within even extreme range, and it would have been a simple enough matter to have had a photocell relay put in between the plate of the crisk and the automatic controls of the spacer and driver, but he had not asked for it. Well, luckily, he now knew where he was going, and the trip to Aldebaran would be long enough for him to build a dozen such controls. He had all the necessary parts and plenty of tools. It would give him something to do to break the monotony of the voyage. Therefore, following the pirate ship easily as it tore through space. Kinnison built his automatic chaser, as he called it. During each of the first four or five nights he lost the vessel he was pursuing, but found it without any great difficulty upon awakening. The rafter he held it continuously, improving day by day the performance of his apparatus until it could do almost anything except talk. After that he devoted his time to an intensive study of the general problem before him. His results were highly unsatisfactory, for in order to solve any problem one must have enough data to set it up, either in actual equations or in logical sequences, and Kinnison found that he did not have enough data. He had altogether too many unknowns and not enough knowns. The first specific problem was that of getting into the pirate base, since the searchers of the patrol had not found it, that base must be very well hidden indeed, and hiding anything as large as a base on Aldebaran I, as he remembered it, would be quite a feat in itself. He had been in that system only once, but alone in his ship, and in deep space although he was. He blushed painfully as he remembered what had happened to him during that visit. He had chased a couple of dope runners to Aldebaran D, and there he had encountered the most vividly, the most flawlessly, the most remarkably and intriguingly beautiful girl he had ever seen. He had seen beautiful girls and women, of course, before and in plenty. He had seen beauties, amateur and profess and chalony butterflies, dancers, actresses, models, and posturists. Both in the flesh and in Telenu's playbist, he had never supposed that such an utterly ravishing creature as she was could exist outside of a fionet dream. As a timidly innocent damsel in distress, she had been perfect. And if she had held that pose a little longer, Kinnison shuddered to think of what might have happened. But, having known too many dope runners and too few patrol men, she misjudged entirely not only the cadet's sentiments but also his reactions, for, even as she came amorously into his arms, he had known that there was something screwy, women like that did not play that kind of game for nothing. She must be mixed up with the two he had been chasing. He got away from her, with only a couple of scratches, just in time to capture her confederates as they were making their escape. He had been afraid of beautiful women ever since, He'd like to see that Aldebaranian Hellcat Aiden just once. He'd been just a kid then. But now that that line of thought was getting him nowhere, cast, it was old and I that he had better be thinking of. Barren, laughless, desolate, airless, waterless, bare as his hand, covered with extinct volcanoes, cratered, jagged, unshorn. To hide a base on that planet would take plenty of doing. If, 
conversely it would be correspondingly difficult of approach if on the surface at all which he doubted very strongly it would be covered in any event all its approaches would be thoroughly screened and equipped with lookouts on the ultraviolet and on the infrader as well as on the visible his detector nullifier wouldn't help him much there those screens and lookouts were badder feet very bad question could anything get into that base without setting off an alarm his speedster could not even get close that was certain could he alone he would have to wear armor of course to hold his air and it would radiate not necessary he could lend out of range and woke without power but there were still the screens and the lookouts if the pirates were on their toes it simply wasn't in the cards and he had to assume that they would be alert what then could pass those barriers prolonged consideration of every facet of the situation gave definite answer and marked out clearly the course he must take something admitted by the pirates themselves was the only thing that could get him the vessel ahead of his was going in therefore he must and would enter that base within the pirate vessel itself with that point decided there remained only the working out of a method which proved to be almost ridiculously simple once inside the base what should he rather what could he do four days he made in discarded plans but finally he tossed them all out of his mind so much depended upon the location of the base its personnel its arrangement and its routine that he could develop not even the rough draft of a working plan he knew what he wanted to do but he had not even the remotest idea as to how he could go about doing it of the opening that appeared he would have to choose the most feasible and fit his actions to whatever situation then and there obtained so beside he shot his spy ray toward the planet and studied it with care it was indeed as he had remembered detour worse bleakly hotly arid it had no soul whatever its entire surface being composed of igneous rock lava and pumice stupendous ranges of mountains crisscrossed and intersected each other at random each range a succession of dead volcanic peaks and blown off craters mountainside and rocky plain crater wall and valley floor alike and innumerably were pockmarked with of craters and with immensely yawning shell holes as though the whole planet had been throughout geologic ages the target of an incessant cosmic bombardment over its surface and through and through its volume he drove his spy ray finding nothing he bored into its substance with his detectors and his tracers with results completely negative of course close erupt his electromagnetics would report a run plenty of it but that information would also be meaningless practically all planets had iron cores as far as his instruments could tell and he had given aldebaran and i a more thorough going over by car than any ordinary surveying ship would have given it her was no base of any kind upon or within the planet yet he knew that a base was there so what somi bomathal's base might be inside the galaxy after all protected from detection in the same way probably by solid miles of iron or of iron ore a second line upon that base had now become imperative but they were approaching the system fast he had better get ready he belted on his personal equipment including a nullifier then inspected his armor checking its supplies and apparatus carefully before he hucked it ready to his hand glancing into the plate he noted with approval that his chaser was functioning perfectly pursuit and pursuer were now both well inside the solar system of aldebaran f as slowed the parrot so slowed the speedster finally the leader went inert in preparation for his spiral but kinnison was no longer following before he went to note he flashed down to within fifty thousand miles of the planet's forbidding surface he then cut his bergen home through the speedster into an almost circular orbit well away from the landing orbit selected by the parrot put off all his power and drifted he stayed in the speedster observing and computing 
until he had so exactly defined its path that he could find it uniringly at any future instant. Then he went into the airlock, stepped out into space, F, waiting only to be sure that the portal had snapped shut behind him, set his course toward the parrot's spiral, and art now. His progress was so slow as to seem imperceptible, but he had plenty of time, and it was only relatively that his speed was low. He was actually hurtling through space at the rate of well over two thousand miles an hour, and his powerful little driver was increasing that speed constantly by an acceleration of two of gravities. Soon the vessel crept up, beneath him now, and Kinnison, increasing his drive to five gravities, shot toward it in a long, slanting dive. This was the most ticklish minute of the trip, but the lensman had assumed correctly that the officers of the badly undermanned ship would be looking ahead of them and down, not backward and up. They were, and he made his approach in scene. The approach itself, the boarding of an inote spaceship at its frightful and absurd velocity, was elementary to any competent spaceman Sapalisty itself. There was not even a flare to bother him or to reveal him to sight, as the braking jets were now doing all the work, matching course and velocity ever more closely. He crept up flying his mag and up to luck, hand over hand upon the emergency and let lock and there he was. Illustration. Matching course and velocity. He crept up flying his magnet, pulled up, hand over hand unconcerned any. He made his way along the stern way and into the now deserted quarters of the fighters. There he lay down in a hammock, snapped the acceleration straps, and shot his spy ray into the control room. And there, in the parrot captain's own visiplate, he observed the rugged and torn topography of the terrain below. As the pilot fought his ship down, my and by mine, tough going, nest, Kinnison reflected, and the bird was doing a nice job, even if he was taking it the hard way, bringing her down straight on her nose instead of taking one more spiral around the planet and then sliding in on her under jets, which were designed and placed specifically for such work. But taking it the hard way he was, and his vessel was bucking, kicking, bouncing, and spinning on the terrific blast from her braking jets. Manchi came, cast, and it was only after she was actually inside one of those stupendous craters, well below the level of its rim, that the pilot flattened her out and assumed normal landing position. They were still going too fast, Kinnison thought, but the pirate pilot knew what he was doing. Five miles the vessel dropped, straight down that titanic shaft, before the bottom was reached. The shaft's wall was studded with windows, in front of the craft loomed the outer gate of a gigantic air lock. It opened. The ship was trundled inside, landing cradle and ball, and the massive gate closed behind it. This was the parrot space, and Kinnison was inside it, men. Attention, the parrot commander snapped then. This air is deadly poison. So put on your armor and be sure your tanks are full. They have rooms for us, having good air. But don't open your suits a crack until I tell you to. Assemble all of you that are not here in this control room in five minutes will stay on board and take your own chances. Kinnison decided instantly to assemble with the crew. He could do nothing in the ship, and it would be inspected. Of course, he had plenty of air, but space armor all looked alike, and his lens would warn him in time of any unfriendly or suspicious thought. He had better go. If they called a roll, but he would cross that bridge when he came to it. No roll was called. In fact, the captain paid no attention at all to his men. They could come along or not, just as they pleased. But since to stay in the ship meant death, every man was prompt. At the expiration of the five minutes, the captain strode away, followed by the crowd. Through a doorway, left turn and the captain was met by a creature whose shape Kinnison could not make out. A paused, a straddling forward, then a right turn. Kinnison decided that he would not take that turn. He would stay here. 
close to the shaft where he could blast his way out if necessitational he had studied the whole base thoroughly enough to map out a plan of campaign he soon found an empty and apparently in use room and assured himself that through its heavy prescalier window he could indeed look out into the vastly cylindrical emptiness of the volcanic shaft then with his spirey he watched the pirates as they were escorted to the quarters prepared for them those might have been rooms of state but it looked to kinnison very much as though his former shipmates were being jailed ignominium and he was glad that he had taken leave of them shooting his ray here and there throughout the structure he finally found what he was looking for the communicator room that room was fairly well lighted and at what he saw there his jaw dropped in surest amazement he had expected to see men since aldebaran Neek, the only inhabited planet in the system had been colonized from tellison its people were as truly human and caucasian as those of chicago or of paris but Thespi's things had been around quite a bit but he had never seen nor heard of their like they were wheels really when they went anywhere they rolled heads where hubs ought to base mars dozens of them and very capable looking key hands vagina a crisp thought flashed from one of the peculiar entities to another impinging also upon kinnison's lens some one some out citizen looking at me relieve me while i abate this intolerable nuisance one of those creatures from tellus we will teach them very shortly that such intrusion is not to be borne for an instant no it is not one of them the touch is similar but the tone is entirely different nor could it be one of them for not one of them is equipped with the instrument which is such a clumsy substitute for the sense of perception with which all really intelligent races are endowed in their minds there i will now begin to kinnison snapped on his faust rank but the damage had already been done in the violated communications room the angry observer went on attune myself and trace the origin of that prying look it has disappeared now but its sender cannot be distant since our walls are shielded and screened at there is a blank space which i cannot penetrate in the seventh room of the fourth corridor in all probability it is one of our guests hiding now behind a foot screen then his orders boomed out to a corps of guards take him and put him with the others kinnison had not heard the order but he was ready for anything and those who came to take him found that it was easier for to issue such orders than to carry them out halt snapped the lensman his lens carrying the crackling come and deep into the wheelmen's minds i do not wish to harm you but come no closer you harm must came a cold claire thought and the creatures vanished but not for mom faith or others like them were back in moments this time armed and armored for strife again kinnison found that rays were useless the armor of the far mounted generators as capable as his own if although the air in the room soon became one intolerably glaring field of force in which the very walls themselves began to crumble and to vaporize neither he nor his attackers were harmed again then the lensman had recourse to his medieval weapon sheathing his delameter and wading in with his axe although not of an buskirk he was for an oathman of unusual strength skill and speed and to those opposing him he was a very hercules therefore as he struck and struck and struck again the cell became a gorily reeking slaughter pen its every corner had plied with the shattered corpses of the wheelman and its floor running with blood and slime the last few of the attackers unwilling to face longer that irresistible steel wheeled away and kinnison thought flashingly of what he should do next this trip was a bust so car he couldn't do himself a bit of good here now and he'd better was off while he was still in one piece hi the door no couldn't make it he'd run out of time quick that way better take out the wall that would give those wheelmen something else to think about though while he was doing his flit only a fraction of a second was taken up by these thoughts then kinnison was at the wall 
he set his delimiter to minimum aperture and at maximum blast, to throw a cutting pencil against which no material substance could stand, drew the walnut pencil pyrosoft over and around, above, fast as the lensman had acted. He was still too late. There came trundling into the room behind him, upon four low wheels, a truck bearing a squat and monstrous mechanism. Kinnison walled to face it. As he turned the section of the wall upon which he had been at work blew outward with a deafening crash. The ensuing rush of escaping atmosphere picked the lensman up as though he had been a straw and hurled him out through the opening and into the shaft. In the meantime the mechanism upon the truck had begun a staccato, grinding roar, and as it roared Kinnison felt slugs ripping through his armor and tearing through his flesh. Each as crushing, crunching, paralyzing a blow as though it had been inflicted by Van Buskersing's space axe. Illustration. The rush of escaping atmosphere picked the lensman up as though he had been a strufferable him out. This was the first time that Kinnison had ever been really badly wounded. And it made him sick, buff, sick and numb, senses reeling at the shock to his slug-turned body. His right hand flashed to the external controller of his neutralizer, for he was falling inert. It was only ten or fifteen meters to the bottom. As he remembered it, he had mighty little time to waste if he were not too land inert. He snapped the controller. Nothing happened. Something had been shot away. His driver, though, was dead. Snapping the sleeve of his armor into its clamps, he began to withdraw his arm in order to operate the internal controls. But he ran out of time. He crashed on the top of a subsiding pile of masonry which had preceded him, but which had not yet attained a state of equilibrium. Underneath a shower of similar material which rebounded from his armor in a boiler shop clangor of nose. Well, it was that that heap of masonry had not yet had time to settle into form for in some slight measure it acted as a cushion to break the lensman's fall, but an inert fall of forty feet, even cushioned by rocks, is in no sense a light one. Kinnison crashed. It seemed as though a thousand piled rivers struck him at once. Surges of almost unbearable agony swept over him, as bone snapped and bruised flesh gave way. He knew dimly that a merciful tide of oblivion was reaching up to engulf his shrieking, suffering mind above fobbly at first in the stunned confusion of his entire being something stirred that unknown and unknowable something that indefinable ultimate quality that had made him worthy of the lens he wore he fived and while a lensman lived he did not quit to quit wise to die then and there since he was losing air fast he had plastic in his kit of course and the holes were small he must plug those leaks, and plug them quick. His left arm, he fanned. He could not move at all. It must be smashed pretty badly. Every shallow breath was a searing pain. That meant a rib or two gone out. Luckily, however, he was not breathing blood. Therefore, his lungs must still be intact. He could move his right arm although it seemed like a lump of clay or a limb belonging to someone else. But, mustering all his power of will, he made it move. He dragged it out of the armor's clamped sleeve, forced the lead in hand to slide through the welter of blood that seemed almost to fill the bulge of his armor. He found his kit box. If, after an eternity of pain rate time, he compelled his sluggish hand to open it and to take out the plastic. Then, in a continuously crescendo throbbing of agony, he forced his maimed, crushed, and broken body to riff and to wriggle about, so that his one sound hand could find and stop the holes through which his precious air was whistling out and away. Find them he did, and quickly, and sealed them tight. But when he had plugged the last one he slumped down, spent and exhausted. He did not hurt so much. But his suffering had mounted to such terrific heights of intolerable keenness that the nerves themselves, in outraged protest at carrying such a load, had blocked it off. There was much more to do, but he simply could not do it without a rest. 
even his iron will could not drive his tortured muscles to any further effort until after they had been allowed to recuperate a little from what they had gone through how much air did he have left if any he wondered foggily and with an entirely detached and disinterested impersonal lesson maybe his tanks were empty of course it couldn't have taken him as long to plug those leaks as it had seemed to or he wouldn't have had any air left at all in tanks or suit he couldn't however have much left he would look at his gauges and see but now he found that he could not move even his eyeballs so deep was the coma that was enveloping him away off somewhere there was a billowing expanse of blackness utterly heavenly in its deep soft supplied in his comfort and from that sea of peace in circeus there came reaching to embrace him huge saft tender arms why suffer something crooned at him it was so much easier to let go see thee kinnison did not lose consequence once there was too much to do too much that had to be done he had to get out of here he had to get back to his speedster he had by hook or by crook to get back to prime base therefore grimly doffably teeth tight licked in the enhancing agony of every movement he drew again upon those hidden those deeply buried resources which even he had no idea he possessed his code was simple the code of the lens while a lensman lived he did not quit kinnison was a lensman kinnison lived kinnison did not quit he fought back that engulfing tide of blackness wave by wave as it came he beat down by sheer force of will those tenderly beckoning those sweetly seducing arms of oblivion he forced the mass of protesting putty that was his body to do what had to be done he thrust styptic gauze into the most copiously bleeding of his wounds he was burned though he discovered then he must have had a high-powered needle ray on that truck as well as the rife blob he could do nothing about burns there simply wasn't time he found the power lead that had been severed by a bullet stripping the insulation was an almost impossible job but it was finally accomplished after a fashion bridging the gap proved to be even a worse one since there was no slack the ends could not be twisted together but had to be joined by a short piece of spare wire which in turn had to be stripped and then twisted with each end of the severed lead that task though he finally finished although he was working purely by feel and half conscious with in a racking haze of pain soldering those joints was of course out of the question he was afraid even to try to insulate them with tape lest the loosely twined strands should fall apart in the attempt he did have some dry handkerchiefs however if he could reach them he cooked a dib and wrapped one carefully about the wire's bare joints then apprehensively he tried his neutralizer wonder of wonders it worked so did his driver in moments then he was rocketing up the shaft and as he passed the opening out of which he had been blown he realized with amazement that what had seemed to him like hours must have been minutes only and few even of them for the frantic wheelmen were just then lifting into place the temporary shield which was to stem the mighty outrush of their atmosphere wonderingly kinnison looked at his air gauges he had a new face he hurried and hurry he did he could hurry since there was practically no atmosphere to impede his flight up the five the mileful shaft he shot and out into space his chronometer built to withstand even sever shocks than that of his fall told him where his speedster was to be found and in a matter of minutes he found her against her side he flashed an inertial collision he forced his rebellious right arm into the sleeve of his armor and fumbled at the lock it yielded the ports won open he was inside his own ship again the encroaching universe of blackness threatened but again he fought it off he could not pass out yet dragging himself to the board he laid his course upon distant telus too distant by far to permit of the selection of such a tiny objective as prime base 
he connected the automatic controls. He was weakening fast. I knew it. But from somewhere and in some fashion he must get strength to do what must be done, and somehow he did it. He shoved his levers out to maximum blast. Hang on. Kim hang on for just a second more he disconnected the spacer. He killed the detector null vice. Then, with an utterly last remnant of his strength he thought into his lens. Haynes, the thought went out blurred. Distorted. Whoop. Kinnison. I'm calm and calm he was, don't I called. Utterly spent. He had already done too much for. Far too much. He had driven that pitifully mangled body of his to its ultimately last possible movement. His racked and tortured mind to its ultimately last possible thought. The last iota of even his tremendous reserve of vitality was consumed and he plunged. Parsec steeped into the black depths of oblivion which had so long and so unsuccessfully been trying to engulf him. But Kimball Kinnison, Gray Lensman, had done everything that had had to be done before he blacked out. His final thought, feeble though it was, and incomplete, did its work. Port Admiral Haynes was seated at his desk, discussing matters of import with an office full of executives. When that foot arrived, hardened old space hound that he was, and survivor of many encounters and hospitalizations. He knew instantly what that thought connoted and from the depths of what dire need it had been sent, therefore, to the amazement of the officers in the room. He suddenly leapt to his feet, seized his microphone and snapped out orders. Orders, and still more orders. Every vessel in seven sectors, of whatever class or tonnage, was to shove its detectors out to the limit. Kinnison Speedster is out there somewhere. Find her, Jit Herkel, her drive, and drag her in here. To null. Ten landing field. Fet a pilot here. Fastening. Two pilots. An armor. Fet them off the top of the board. Tit Wasson and Shermer Hearn if they're anywhere within range. He then called base hospital. Lacey, he barked at the dignified chief surgeon. I've got a boy out that's badly hurt. He's coming in three. You know what that means. Send over a good doctor. And have you got a nose who knows how to use a personal neutralizer and who isn't afraid to go into the net coming myself? Yes. The doctor's voice was as crisp as the admiral's. When do you want us as soon as they get their tractors on that speedster? You'll know when that happens. Then, neglecting all other business, the port admiral directed in person the far-flung screen of ships searching for Kinnison's flying midget. Eventually she was found, and Hayes, cutting off his plates, leapt to a closet in which was hanging his own armor, unused for years. Nevertheless it was kept in readiness for instant service. And now, at long last, the old space flea had a good excuse to use it again. Armored. He strode out into the landing field across the paved way. There awaiting him were two armored figures. The two top-ranking pilots. There were the doctor and the nurse. He barely saw. Rather, he saw without noticing in saucy white capitop a riot of reed Bromberch coals. A symmetrical young body in its spotless white. He did not notice the face at all. What he saw was that there was a neutralizer strapped snugly into the curve of her back. That it was fitted properly. And that it was not yet functioning. For this that faced them was no ordinary job. The speedster would land free. Worse, the admiral fared and right Lafitte Kinnison would also be free. But independently, with a latent velocity different from that of his ship, they must enter the speedster, take her out into space and inert her. Kinnison must be taken out of the speedster. Inerted, his velocity matched to that of the flyer and brought back aboard. Then and only then could doctor and nurse begin to work on him. Then they would have to land as fast as a landing could be made. The boat should have been in the hospital long ago. And during all these evolutions and until their return to ground the rescuers themselves would remain in no shoals. Ordinarily such visitors left the ship, inerted themselves, and came back to it in note. 
under their own power. But now there was no time for that. They had to get Kinnison to the hospital. And besides, the doctor and the nurper sticulary the nose would not be expected to be spaceship navigators. They would all take Kit in the net. And that was another reason for haste. For while they were gone, their latent velocity would remain unchanged, while the actual velocity of their present surroundings would be changing constantly. The longer they were gone, the greater would become the discrepancy. Hence the net, the nettleffer tank of insack, lined with softly padded Inderpring's mattresses, anchored to ceiling and to walls and to floor through every shock's boring's artifice of steel spring and of rubber cable that the mind of man had been able to devise. It takes something to absorb and to dissipate the kinetic energy which may reside within a human body when its latent velocity does not match exactly the actual velocity of its surrounds height of is. If that body is not to be mashed to a pulp, it takes something, also, to enable any human being to face without flinching the prospect of going into that net, especially in ignorance of exactly how much kinetic energy will have to be dissipated, Haynes cogitated, studying then wrecked, supple young back, then spoke. Maybe we'd better cancel the nurse. Laser, or get her a suit time is too important. The girl herself put him. Crisply, don't worry about me, Admiral. I've been in the net before. She turned toward Haynes as she spoke, and for the first time he really saw her face. Why? She was a raving beauty in Okauta Sevis Nectar. Call out here, she is in the grip of a tractor. The speedster had flashed to ground in front of the waiting five. And they hurried aboard. They hurried. But there was no flurry. No confusion. Each knew exactly what to do. And each did it. Out into space shut the little vessel, jerking savagely downward and sidewise as one of the pallets cut the bourbon home. Out of the airlock flew the port admiral and the helpless, unconscious Kinnison, inertials both and now chained together. Off they darted, in a new direction and with tremendous speed, as Haynes cut Kinnison's neutralizer. There was a mighty double flare as the drivers of both space suits struggled against that which had been the young Lensman's latent velocity. As soon as it was safe to do so, out darted an armored figure with a space line whose grappling and clinked into a socket of the old man's armor as the pilot rammed it home. Then, as an angler plays a fitch, two husky pilots, feet wide braced against the steel portal of the airlock and bodies sweating with effort, heaving when they could and giving line only when they must, helped the laboring drivers to overcome the difference in velocity. Illustration. Then two husky pilots played the armored figures on the steel cables as an angler plays a fish, aiding the struggling drivers to overcome the velocity. Soon the lensmen, young and old, were inside. Doctor and Nose went instantly to work. With the calmness and precision so characteristic of their highly skilled crafts, in a trice they had him out of his armor, out of his leather, and into a hammock, perceiving at once that except for a few pads of gauze they could do nothing for their patient until they had him upon an operating table. Meanwhile the pallets, having swung the hammocks, have been observing, computing, and confirming. She's got a lot of speed. Admiral lomst of it straight down. Watson reported. On her landing jets it'll take two G's on a full revolution to bring her in, with both of us at the controls, we can balance her down. But it'll have to be on her tail, and it'll mean over five G's all the way. Which do you want which is more important? Laser. Time more pressure, Haynes transferred decision to the surgeon. Find. Lacey decided instantly. Fight her down, his patient had been through so much already of force and pressure that a little more would not do additional hurt. And time was most decidedly of the essence. Starkly incandescent flares ripped and draved from driving jets and side jets. The speedster spun around viciously, only to be coved, skillfully if savagely, at the precisely right instant, without an orbit, without even a cork's or other spiral. She was going down, straight down, and not upon her underjets was this descent to be. 
nor upon her more powerful breaking jets those two master pilots prime bases best were going to kill the awful inertia of the speedster by balancing her down on her tail or to translate from the jargon of space they were going to hold the tricky pranky little vessel upright upon the terrific blasts of her driving projectors against the earth's gravitation and against all other perturbing forces while her driving force counteracted overcame and dissipated the full frightful measure of the kinetic energy of her mass and speed and balance her down they did haynes was afraid for a while that that intrepid pair were actually going to and the speedster on her tail they dinked could be they had only a scant hundred feet to spare when they nosed her over and deezed her to ground on her under jets the crash wagon and its crew were waiting and as kinnison was rushed to the hospital the others hurried to the net room dr lacy first of course then the nurse f to haynes approving surprise she took it like a veteran hardly had the surgeon let himself out of the cocoon than she was in it and hardly had the terrific surges and recoils of her own not inconsiderable one hundred and forty wood pounds of mass abated than she herself was out and sprinting across the sward toward the hospital haynes went back to his office and tried to work but he could not concentrate he made his way back to the hospital there he waited and as lacy came out of the operating room he buttonholed him how about it lacer will he live he demanded live of course he'll live the surgeon replied gruffly can't tell you details yet want no ourselves for a couple of hours yet was off haynes come back at six o'clock cut a second before and i'll tell you all about it since there was no help for it the port admiral did was off but he was back promptly on the tick of the designated dower how is he he began without preamble will he really lie or were you just giving me a shot in the arm better than that much better the surgeon assured him definitely so yes he is in much better shape than we dared hope must have been a very light crash incident chying seriously the matter with him at all we won't even have to amputate from what we can see now he should make a one hopper infant recovery not only without artificial members but with scarcely a scar he couldn't have been in a space crack puck at all or he would not have come out with so little injury fine doc won't full now the details here's the picture and the doctor enrolled a full funtex ray print showing every anatomical detail of the lensman's interior structure first just notice that skeleton it is really remarkable slightly out of true here and there right now of course but i believe that it is going to turn out to be the second absolutely perfect male skeleton i have ever seen that young man will go far haynes sure he will why else do you suppose we put him in gray but i didn't come over here to be told that show me the damage look at the pictures for yourself multiple and compound fractures you notice of legs and arm and a few ribs scapula of course their hair oat yes there's a skull fracture oh but it doesn't amount too much that soul the spine you so isn't injured at all what dying mean that's all how about his wounds i saw some of them myself and they were not pinpricks nothing of the least importance a few punctured wounds and a couple of incised ones but nothing even close to a vital part he won't need even a transfusion since he stopped the major hemorrhages himself shortly after he was wounded there are a few bones of course but they are mostly superficially that will not yield quite readily to treatment mighty glad of that he'll be here six weeks then better call it twelve i think ten at least you so some of the fractures especially those in the left leg and a couple of the burns are rather severe as such things go then oh the length of time elapsing between injury and treatment didn't do anything a bit of good 
in two weeks he'll be wanting to get up and go places and do things and in six he'll be tearing down your hospital stone by stone yes the surgeon smiled he is not the tap to make an ideal patient but as i have told you before i like to have patients that we do not lack and another thing i want the files on his nurses particularly the red-headed one i suspected that you would so i had them sent down here you are glad you noticed mcdougalas by way of being my favorite clarissa mcdougally catch of course with that name twenty me years old had one hundred six side centimeters weight six discus pillows he raw her pictures never mind the conventional photo this x-ray is the one that counts and look at that skeleton beautiful the only really perfect skeleton i ever saw in a woman it isn't the skeleton i'm interested in grunted haynes it's what is outside the skeleton that my lensman will be looking at you needn't worry about mcdougall declared the surgeon one good look at that picture will tell you that she classifies with that skeleton she has too she couldn't leave the beam a millimeter even if she wanted to Blood, blood, or indifferent male or female physical mental moral and psychological the skeleton tells the whole story maybe it does to you but not to me and haynes took up the conventional photograph he asterias in full and absolutely true color an almost living duplicate of the girl in question her thick heavy hair was not red but was a vividly intense and indescribable lobern a gorgeous mass of coppery bronze flashed with red and gold Horace bronzy was all that he could think of with flecks of topaz and of tawny gold haskin though was faintly bronze glowing with even more than healthy youth's normal measure of sparkling vitality not only was she beautiful the port admiral decided in the words of the surgeon she classified hems worse even than i thought he muttered she's a menace to civilization and he went on to read the documents fannyism history experiences reactions and characteristics behavior psychology mentality shoe do laser he advised the surgeon finally keep her on with him but see here haynes you suspicious old granny snorted the doctor he won't be falling for anybody yet why he's just been unattached he'll be bulletproof for quite a while you ought to know that young lensmen episcally young gray lensmen see anything but their jobs for a couple of years anyway his skeleton tells you that oh a haynes grunted spectacally ordinarily yes but you never can tell especially in hospitals more of your layman's misinformation lacy snapped contrary to popular belief romance does not thrive in hospitals except of course among the staff patients oftentimes think that they fall in love with nurses but it takes two people to make one romance nurses do not fall in love with patients because a man is never at his best under hospitalization in fact the better a man is the poorer showing he is apt to make if as i forget who said a long time ago no generalization is ever true not even this one retorted the poor admiral when it does hit him it will hit hard and will take no chances how about the black-haired one well i just told you that mcdougall has the only perfect skeleton i ever saw in a woman Brownlee is very good oh of course but but not good enough to rate lensman's mate a haynes completed the foot then take her out pick the best skeletons you've got for this job and see that no others come anywhere near him transfer them to some other house but a lot or some other floor of this one at least any woman that he ever falls for will fall for him in spite of your ideas as to the one wainwison of hospital romance 
and I don't want him to have such a good chance of making a dive at something that doesn't trait up. Am I right or wrong? You old sovans. And for how much well? I haven't had time yet to really study his skeleton. But better take a week off and study it. I've studied a lot of people in the last six dips wing years, and I'll match my experience against your knowledge of bones. Any time. Not saying that he will fold this trip. You understandest playing safe. Goodbye. Lacey's me eat you. Kinnison was dragged out of unconsciousness by the knowledge that he had landed his speedster inertials. He came to her. Rather, to say that he came half to would be a more accurate statement which he yelled directed at the blurly seen figure in white which he knew must be a nurse. Nos then, as a searing stab of pain shot through him at the effort. He went on, thinking at the figure in white through his lens. My speeds to Ryle and at her free get the spaceport there. There, lensman, a low, which burr screwed, and a redhead bent over him. The speedster has been taken care of. Everything is on the needles. Go to sleep and dressed. But my ship never mind your ship. The nunchuous voice went on. It was landed and put away listened. Dumble snapped the patient. Speaking aloud now, in spite of the pain, the better to drive home his meaning. Don't try to soothe me what do you think I am? Delirious get this and get it straight. I said that I landed that speedster free. If you don't know what that means, tell somebody that does. That the spaceport had changed such we got them. Lensman, long ago, although her voice was still creamily, sweetly soft, an angry color burned into the nurse's face. I said everything is on zero. Your speedster was inerted. How else would you be here? Inert I helped do it myself. So I know that she is inert. Pite. The patient relapsed instantly into unconsciousness and the nurse turned to an intern standing by, wherever that nurse was. At least one doctor could almost always be found. Dumble she flared. What a sweet mess he's going to be to take care of he's not even conscious yet. And he's calling names and picking fights already in a few days Kinnison was fully and alertly conscious. In a week most of the pain had left him, and he was beginning to chafe under restraint. In ten days he was fit to be tied, and his acquaintance with his head nurse. So inauspicious as he begun, developed even more inauspicious as he as time went on. For, as Haynes and Lacey had each more than anticipated, the Lensman was by no means an ideal patient. In fact, he was most decidedly the opposite. Nothing that could be done would satisfy him. All doctors were faffids, even Lacey, the man who had put him together. All nurses were dumbbells, ever and specially Mac, who with almost superhuman skill, tact and patience had been holding him together. Why, even faffids and dumbbells, even high-grade morons, ought to know that a man needed food accustomed to eating everything that he could reach, three or four or five times a day. He did not reel as nard did his stomach that his now quiescent body could no longer use the five thousand or more calories that it had been wont to bone up. Each twenty-four hours, in intense effort, he was always hungry, and he was forever demanding food. The food, to him, did not mean orange juice or grape juice or tomato juice or milk, nor did it mean weak tea and hard, dry toast and an occasional soft bidget egg. If he ate eggs at all, he wanted them for Dorothy or four of them, accompanied by two or three thick slices of ham. He wanted and demanded in no uncertain terms, argumentatively and persistential big, thick, where beak steak. He wanted baked beans, with plenty of fat pork. He wanted bread in thick slices, piled high with butter, and not this quadrum put in shapely toast. He wanted roast beef where, in great chunks, he wanted potatoes and thick brown gravy. He wanted corned beef and cabbage. He wanted pea any kind of pea and large, thick quarters. He wanted peas and corn and asparagus and cucumbers. 
and also various southerworldly staples of diet which he often and insistently mentioned by name but above all he wanted beefsteak he thought about it days and dreamed about it nights one night in particular he dreamed about it in especially luchus porter house fried in butter and smothered in mushroom balmy to wake up my watering literally starved to face again the weak tea dry toast eth horror of horrors this time a flabby pallop flaxed poached egg it was the last straw take it away he said weakly then when the nose did not obey he reached out and pushed the breakfast tray and ball off the table as it crashed to the floor he turned away eth in spite of all his efforts to hot tears forced themselves between his eyelids it was a particularly trying ordeal and one requiring all of even max skill diplomacy and forbearance to make the recalcitrant patient eat the breakfast prescribed for him she was finally successful however and as she stepped out into the corridor she met the ubiquitous in turn how's your lensman he asked in the privacy of the diet kitchen don't call him my lensman she stormed she was about to explode with the pent puff feelings which she of course could not vent upon such a pitiful helpless thing as her star patient weep steak i almost wish they would give him a beef steak and that he'd choke on it which of course he would he's worse than a baby i never saw such as of a brat in my life i'd like to spank him he needs it i'd like to know how he ever got to be a lensman the big cantankerous clunker i'm going to spank him oh one of these days see if i don't don't take it so hard back then turn urged he was however very much relieved that relations between the handsome young lensman and the gorgeous redhead were not upon a more cordial basis he won't be here very long but an ever so patient clog your jets before you probably never saw a patient like him before either i certainly hope he never gets cracked up again how do i have to draw your chart she asked sweetly or if he does get cracked up again i hope they send him to some other hospital and she flounced out no smacdougal thought that when the lensman could eat the meat he craved her troubles would be over but she was mistaken kinnison was nervous moody broving by tones irritable sullen and pugnacious nor is it to be wondered at he was chained to that bed and in his mind was the knowing consciousness that he had failed and not only failed they had made a complete fool of himself he had underestimated an enemy and as a result of his own stupidity the whole patrol had taken a set back he was anguished and tormented therefore listen back he pleaded one day bring me some clothes and let me take a walk i need the exercise not yet Kim. she denied him gently but with her entrancing smile in full evidence but pretty quick when that lead looks a little less like a chinese puzzle you and nosy go bye-bye beautiful but dumb the lensman growled can't you and those cocked croakers realize that i'll never get any strength back if you keep me in bed all the rest of my life and don't talk baby talk at me either i'm well enough at least so that you can wipe that professional smile off your pan and cut that soothing bedside manner of yours very well he think so to she snapped patience at long last gone somebody should tell you the truth i always supposed that lensman had to have brains but you've acted like a spoiled brat ever since you've been here first you wanted to eat yourself sick and now you want to get up with bones half knit and burns half healed and undo everything that has been done for you why don't you snap out of it and act your age for a change i never did think gnosis had much sense and now they know they haven't kinnison eyed her with intense disfavor not at all convinced i'm not talking about going back to work i mean a little gentle exercise and i know what i need you'd be surprised at what you don't know 
and the nurse walked out. Chin and air. In five minutes. However, she was back, her radiant smile again flashing. Sorry. Kim. I shouldn't have blasted off that way. I know that you're bound to baff Chiron to have brainstorms. I would. Though, if I were cancel it. Back. He began. Awkwardly. I don't know why I have to be such a mutt as to be crabbing at you all the time. Pete. Lensman. She replied. Entirely serene now. I do. You are not the type to stay in bed without it griping you. But when a man has been ground up into such hamburger as you are, he has to stay in bed whether he likes it or not. And no matter how much he pops off about it, roll over here. But, and I'll give you an alcohol rub. But it won't be long now. Rialetriti soon will have you out in a wheelchair the sit went for weeks. Kinnison knew his behavior was atrocious, abominable. But he simply could not help it. Every so often the accumulated pressure of his bitterness and anxiety would blow off. If, like a jungle tiger with a toothage, he would bite and claw anything or anybody within reach. Finally, however, the last picture was studied, the last bandage was removed, and he was discharged as fit. And he was not discharged, bitterly although he resented his captivity, as he called it, until he really was fit. Haynes so too that, and Haynes had allowed only the most sketchy interviews during that long convalescence. Discharged, however, Kinnison sought him out. Let me talk first. Haynes instructed him at sight. No self reporisk No destructive criticism. Everything constructive. But, Kimball, I'm mighty glad to hear that you made a perfect recovery. You were in bad shape. Go ahead. You have just about shut my mouth by your first order. Kinnison smiled sorry as he spoke. Towards flood failures. No. Let me add to Mori as yet. That's the spirit, Haynes exclaimed. Nor do we agree with you that it was a failure. It was merely not a success so far. Hick is an altogether different thing. Also, I may add that we had very fine reports indeed on you from the hospital. Huck Innocent was amazed to the point of being inarticulate. You just about tore it down. Of course, but that was only to be expected. But so I need such exactly. As Lacey tells me quite frequently, he likes to have patients over there that they don't lack. Mull that one over for a bit. You may understand it better as you get older. The fault, however, may take some of the load off your mind. Well, so I am feeling a trifle low. But if you and the rest of them still think we do so think, cheer up and get on with the story. I've been doing a lot of thinking, and before I go around sticking out my neck again, I'm going to you don't need to tell me. You know, no, so, but I think I'd better. I'm going to Arisia to see if I can get me a few treatments for swilled head and lame brain. I still think that I know how to use the lens to good advantage, but I simply haven't got enough jets to do it. You so, I he stopped. He would not offer anything that might sound like an alibi. But his thoughts were plain as print to the old lensman. Go ahead. Son, we know you wouldn't. If I thought at all, I assumed that I was tackling men. Since those on the ship were men. And men were the only known inhabitants of the Aldebaranian system. But when those wheelmen took me so easily and so completely, it became very evident that I didn't have enough stuff. I ran like a scared pup, and I was lucky to get home at all. It wouldn't have happened if he paused. It would reason it out. Son, Haynes advised, pointedly, you are wrong, dead wrong. You made no mistake, either in judgment or in execution. You have been blaming yourself for assuming that they were men. Let us suppose that you had assumed that they were the Rigians themselves. Then what after close scrutiny, even in the light of after Conwald, we do not see how you could have changed the outcome. It did not occur. 
even to the sagacious old admiral, that Kinnison need not have gone in. Lensman always went in. Well, anyway, they licked me, and that hurts, Kinnison admitted. Frankly, so I'm going back to Resia for more training. If they'll give it to me, I may be gone quite a while, as it may take even them a long time to increase the permeability of my skull enough so that an idea can filter through it in something under a century. Amund, Haynes pondered. It has never been done. They are a peculiar race. In compression effables not vindictive. They may refuse you, but nothing worse taft is if you do not cross the barrier without invitation. It's a splendid idea, I think, but be very careful to strike that barrier free and at almost zero power else don't strike it at all. They shook hands, and in a space of minutes the speedster was again tearing through space. Kinnison now knew exactly what he wanted to get, and he utilized every waking hour of that long trip in physical and mental exercise to prepare himself to take it. Thus the time did not seem long. He crept up to the barrier at a snail's pace, stopping instantly as he touched it, and through that barrier he sent a thought. Is it permitted that I approach your planet? he asked, neither brazenly nor obsequiously. He was matter-of-factly asking a simple question and expecting a simple reply. He knew that to these beings, whatever they really were, salutations and identifications were alike superfluous nor was he met as helmuth had been met at his kimball kinnison of both a slow deep measured voice resounded in his brain neutralize your controls you will be landed he did so and the inert speedster shot forward to come to ground in a perfect landing at a regulation spaceport he strode into the office to confront the same grotesque draven lacantity who had measured him for his lens not so long ago but however he stared straight into that entity's and blinking eyes in silence at you have progressed you realize now that vision is not always reliable at our previous interview you took it for granted that what you saw must really exist and did not wonder as to what our true shapes might be. I am wondering now. Seriously, Kinnison replied, and if it is permitted, I intend to stay here until I can see your true shapes. This and the figure changed instantly into that of an old, white-bred, scholarly gentleman. No, there is a vast difference between seeing something myself and having you show it to me. I realize only too well that you can make me see you as anything you choose. You could appear to me as a perfect copy of myself, or as any other thing, person or object conceivable to my mind. At you have indeed progressed. While you were expected to return, you are ahead of time by several of your years. When you approached the barrier, it was supposed that you came to ask for some particular information. But now that I search your mind, I perceive that what you seek is not mere information, but is indeed knowledge. You say that you expected me. How could you know that I was coming? I didn't decide definitely myself until only a couple of weeks ago. It was inevitable. When we fitted your lens, we knew that you would return if you lived. As we recently informed that one known as Helm of Helm, if you know. Then, where Kinnison choked himself off, he would not ask for help in that. He would fight his own battles and bury his own dead. If they volunteered the information, well and good, but he would not ask it. Nor did the Rishon furnish it. You are right. The sage remarked, imperturbably, for strong development it is essential that you secure that information for yourself. Then he continued his previous thought. As we told Helmuth recently, we have given your civilization an instrumental life virtue of which it should be able to make itself secure throughout the galaxy. Having given it, we could do nothing more of real or permanent benefit until you Lensmen yourselves began to realize what it was that we had given you. That realization has been inevitable. 
from the first it has been certain that in time your minds would become strong enough to discover the theretofore unknown depths of power of your lenses as soon as any mind made that discovery it would of course return to orisia the source of the lens for additional instruction which equally of course that mind could not have borne previously decayed by decayed your minds have become stronger finally you came to be fitted with a lens your mind while pitifully undeveloped had a latent capacity and a power that made your return here certain since you are in lensmith there has been one other who will return indeed it has become a topic of discussion among us as to whether you or that other would be the first advanced student who is that other if i may ask your friend wassel the valanchian he's got a real midweight way ahead of mind the lensman stated as a matter of self of it in fact in some ways yes another and highly important characteristics no huckinson exclaimed in what possible way have i got it over him i am not certain that i can explain it exactly in thoughts which you can understand broadly speaking his mind is the better trained the more fully developed it is of more grasp and reach and of vastly greater present power it is more controllable more responsive more adaptable than is your snow but your mind while undeveloped is of considerably greater capacity than hist and of greater and more varied latent capabilities above all you have a driving force a will to do an undefeatable mental urge that no one of his race will be able to develop for many cycles of time to come since i selected you as the first to return i am naturally gratified that you have developed so rapidly well i have been more or less under pressure and i got quite a few lucky breaks but at that it seemed to me that i was progressing backward instead of forward it is ever thus with the really competent prepare yourself he launched a mental bolt at the impact of which kinnison's mind literally turned inside out in a wildly gyrating spiral vortex of dizzyingly confused images resist came the harsh command resist how demanded the writhing sweating lensman you might as well tell a fly to resist an inert spaceship use your willy or for chir adaptability shift your mind to meet mine at every point apart from these fundamentals neither i nor anyone else can tell you how each mind must find its own medium and develop its own technique but this is a very mild treatment indeed one condition to your present strength i will increase it gradually in severity but rest assured that i will at no time raise it to the point of permanent damage constructive exercises will come later the first step must be to build up your resistance therefore resist the force which had not slackened for an instant waxed slowly to the very verge of intolerably ungrimly doffedly the lensman fought it teeth mocked muscles straining fingers digging savagely into the hard leather upholstery of his chair he fought it mustering his every ultimate resource to the task suddenly the torture ceased and the lensman slumped down a mental and physical wreck he was white trembling sweating shaken to the very core of his being he was ashamed of his weakness he was humiliated and bitterly disappointed at the showing he had made but from the rision there came a calm encouraging thought you need not feel ashamed you should instead feel proud for you have made a start which is really surprising even to me nor sponsor this may seem to you like needless punishment but it is not this is the only possible way in which that which you seek may be found in that case go to it the lensman declared i can take it day after day and week after week the advanced instruction went on with the pupil becoming ever stronger until he was taking without damage thrusts that would have slain him instantly a few weeks since the bouts became shorter and shorter 
requiring as they did such terrific to praters of mental force that not even the master could stand the lawful strain for more than half an hour at a time and now these savage conflicts of wills and minds were interspersed with real instruction with lessons neither painful nor unpleasant in these the aged scientist probed gently into the youngster's mind opening it and exposing to its owner's gaze vast caverns whose very presence he had never even suspected some of these storehouses were already partially or completely filled needing only arrangement and connection others were nearly empty these were catalogued and made accessible and an all perniating everything was the lens just like clearing out a clogged up water system with the lens the pump that wouldn't work exclaimed kinnison one day more like that than you at present realize assented the origin you have observed of course that i have not given you any detailed instructions nor pointed out any specific abilities of the lens which you have not known how to use you will have to operate the pump yourself and you have many surprises awaiting you as to what your lens will pump and how our sole task is to prepare your mind to work with the lens and that task is not yet done let us on with it eventually the time came when kinnison could block out entirely the suggestions of his mentor but he did not reveal that fact for nigh blocked out could the origin discern it the lensman gathered all his force together concentrated it and hold it back at his teacher and there ensued a struggle none the less titanic because of its essential friendliness the very e perceived and boiled with the fury of the mental forces there at grips but finally the lensman beat down the other's screens then boring deep into his eyes he willed with all his force to see that origin as he really was and instantly the scholarly old man subsided into a brain there were a few appendages of course and other appurtenances and incidentals to nourishment locomotion and the like but to all intents and purposes the origin was simply and solely a brain illustration he willed with all his force to see him as he really was and instant light scholarly old man subsided into a brain tension ended conflict ceased and kinnison apologized think nothing of it and the brain actually smiled into kinnison's mind any mind of power sufficient to block mine is of course able to hold no feeble bolts of its own see to it however that you frust no such force at any lesser mind or it dies instantly kinnison started to stammer a reply but the origin went on no son i knew and know that the warning is superfluous if you were not worthy of this power and were you not able to control it properly you would not have it you have obtained that which you sought bald then with power but this is only one phase barely a beginning protested kinnison at you realize even that truly you've you have come far and fast but you are not yet ready for more and it is a truism that the reception of forces for which a mind is not prepared will destroy that mind thus when you came to me you knew exactly what you wanted do you know with equal certainty what more you want from us no nor will you for years if ever indeed it may well be that only your descendants will be ready for that for which you and i so dimly grope again i say young man go with power kinnison went six it had taken the lensman a long time to work out in his mind exactly what it was that he had wanted from the risions and from no single source had the basic idea come part of it had come from his own knowledge of ordinary hypnosis part from the ability of the overlords of delgan to control from a distance the minds of others part from worsel oh working through kinnison's own mind had done such surprising things with a lens and a great part indeed from the risions themselves who had the astounding ability literally and completely to superimpose their own mentalities upon those of others wherever situate part by part and bit by bit the tellurian lensman had built up his plan but he had not had the sheer power of intellect to make it work 
now he had that and was ready to go where his first impulse was to return to old deborah and to invade again the stronghold of the wheelmen who had rooted him so ignominiesim in his one encounter with them ordinary prudence however counselled against that course you'd better lay off them a while kin old beau he told himself quite frankly they've got a lot of jets and you don't know how to use this new stuff of yours yet better pick out something easier to take ever since leaving Aresia, he had been subconsciously aware of a difference in his eyesight he was seeing things much more clearly than he had ever seen them before more sharply and in greater detail now this awareness crept into his consciousness and he glanced toward his two blights they were out expet for the tiny lamps and bolsies of his instrument board the vessel must be in complete darkness he remembered then with a shock that when he entered the speedster he had not turned on his lights he could see it and had not thought of them at all this then was the first of the surprises the origin had promised him he now had the sense of perception of the regalians or was it that of the wheelmen or beaufort were they the same sense intently aware now he focused his attention upon a meter before him first upon its dial noting that the needle was exactly upon the green hair line of normal operation then deeper instantly the face of the instrument disapprove vodka behind his point of sight or so it seemed mister that he could see its coals pivots and other interior parts he could look into and study the grain and particle size of the dense hard condensate of the board itself his vision was limited apparently only by his will to see well a mist hand he demanded of the universe at large then as a thought struck him i wonder if they blinded me in the process he switched on his lamps discovering that his vision was unimpaired and normal in every respect and a rigid investigation proved to him conclusively that in addition to ordinary vision he now had an extra sensor perhaps to a famine that he could change from one to the other or use them simultaneously at will but the very fact of this discovery made kinnison pause he had it better go anywhere or do anything until he had found out something about his new equipment the fact was that he didn't even know what he had to say nothing of knowing how to use it if he had the sense of a hotel he would go somewhere where he could do a little experimenting without getting his jets burned off in case something slipped at a critical moment where was the nearest patrol base a big one fully defended let seed relax would be about the closest sector base he guessed he'd find out if he could raid that outfit without getting caught at it off he shot and in due course of fair green off like planet lay beneath his vessel's keel since it was off like in climate age atmosphere and mass its people work of course more or less similar to humanity in general characteristics both of body and of mind if anything they were even more intelligent than oflings and their patrol base was a very strong one indeed his spire would be useless since all patrol bases were screened thoroughly and continuously he would see what a sense of perception would do from tregis knee's explanation it ought to work at this range it did when kinnison concentrated his attention upon the base he saw it he advanced toward it at the speed of thought and entered it passing through screens and metal walls without hindrance and without giving alarm he saw men at their accustomed tasks and heard or rather sensed their conversation the everyday chat of their professions a thrill shot through him at it as a link possibility thus revealed if he could make one of those fellows down there do something without his knowing that he was doing it the problem was solved that computer safe make him uncover that calculator and set up a certain integral on it it would be easy enough to get into touch with him and have him do it but this was something altogether different kinnison got into the computer's mind easily enough and willed intensely what he was to do but the officer did not do it he got up then staring about him in bewilderment sat down again what's the matter asked one of his fellows 
Forget something not exactly. The computer still stared. I was going to set up an integral. I didn't want it. Either. I could swear that somebody told me to set it up. Nobody did, grunted the other, and you'd better start staying home nights. Then maybe you wouldn't get funny ideas. This wasn't so good, Kinnison reflected. The guy should have done it and shouldn't have remembered a thing about it. Well, he hadn't really thought he could put it across at that distance. Anyway, he didn't have the brain of an origin. He'd have to follow his original plan. Of close-up work, waiting until the base was well into the night side of the planet and making sure that his flare baffles were in place. He allowed the speedster to drop downward, landing at some little distance from the fortress. There he left the ship and made his way toward his objective in a rapid series of long, anoshals hops. Lower and shorter became the hops. Then he cut off his power entirely and walked until he saw before him, rising from the ground and stretching interminably upward, an almost invisibly shimmering web of force. Nest, the prowler knew, was the curtain which marked the border of the reservation, the trigger upon which a touch, either of solid object or of beam, would liberate a veritable inferno of the most destructive agencies generable. To the eye that base was not impressive, being merely a few square miles of level ground, outlined with log, broad pillboxes and studded here and there with harmald sumink, bulging domes. There were a few clusters of buildings. That was all to the a, but Kinnison was not deceived. He knew that the base itself was a thousand feet underground, that the pillboxes housed lookouts and detectors, and that those domes were simply weather shields which, Road back would expose projectors second in power not even to those of prime base itself, far to the right, between two tall pylons of metal. Was the gate the only opening in the web? Kinnison had avoided it purposely. It was no part of his plan to subject himself yet to the scrutiny of the Allen Loskip photo cells of that entrance. Instead, with his new sense of perception, he sought out the conduits leading to those cells and traced them down, through concrete and steel and masonry, to the control room far below. He then superimposed his mind upon that of the man at the board and flew boldly toward the entrance. He now actually had a dual personality, since one part of his mind was in his body, darting through the air toward the portal, while another part was deep in the base below watching him come and acknowledging his signals a trap lifted, revealing a sloping, tundle ramp, down which the lensman shot. He soon found a convenient storeroom. Slipping within it, he withdrew his control carefully from the mind of the observer, wiping out all traces of that control as he did so. He then watched apprehensively for a possible reaction. He was almost sure that he had performed the operation correctly, but he had to be absolutely certain. More than his life depended upon the outcome of this test. The observer, however, remained calm and placid at his post, and a close reading of his thoughts showed that he had not the faintest suspicion that anything in Dorn had occurred. One more test and he was through. He must find out how many minds he could control simultaneously, but he'd better do that openly. No use making a man feel like a fool needlessly. He'd done that once already, and once was too many times. Therefore, reversing the procedure by which he had come, he went back to his speedster, took her out into the nether, and slept. Then, when the light of morning flooded the base, he cut his detector null for fire and approached it boldly. Raidlix base lensman Kinnison of Telus asking permission to land, I wish to confer with Nor Lensman. My screens are down. A spy race swept through the speedster. The web disappeared, and Kinnison landed, to be greeted by four fellow Lensmen with a quiet and cordial respiratory for his lens and respect for his gray. The base commander knew that his visitor was not there purely for pleasure. Gray Lensman did not take pleasure jaunts. Therefore, he led the way into his private office and shielded it. 
My announcement was not at all informative, Kinnison admitted then. But my errand is nothing to be advertised. I've got to try out something, and I want to ask you for Lensman to cooperate with me for a few minutes. You need not ask, began the commander. No, this is not an order at all. Simply a request. Yes, so. I've been working a long time on a mind controller, and I want to see if it works. I'll put four books on this table, one in front of each of you. Now I would like to try to make two or three of y'all four of you if I can e heck bend over. Pick up his book and hold it. Your part of the game will be for each of you to try not to pick it up, and to put it back as soon as you possibly can if I do make you obey. Will you sure the three of them chorused? There will be no mental damage. Of course, asked the commander. None whatever, and no after effects. I've had it worked on myself. A lot. Do you want any apparatus? No. I have everything necessary. Remember, I want top resistance. Let her come, you'll get plenty of resistance. If you can make any one of us pick up a book. After all this warning, I'll say you've got something. Lensman after Lensman, in spite of strainingly resisting mind and body, lifted his book from the table. Only to drop it again as Kinnison's control relaxed for an instant. He could control two of them and two of them, but he could not quite handle three. Satisfied, he ceased his efforts. As the base commander poured long, cold drinks for the sweating five, one of his fellows asked, What did you do? Anyway, Kinnison, no. Pardon me. I shouldn't have asked. Sorry. The Tellurian replied uncomfortably, but it isn't ready yet. You'll all know about it as soon as possible. But not just now. Sure. The Red Religion replied. I knew I shouldn't have blasted off as soon as I spoke. Well, thanks a lot, fellows. Kinnison set his empty glass down with a click. I can make a nice progress report on this dogged now. And one more thing. I did a little long-range experimenting on one of your computers last night. Desk 12, the one who thought he wanted to integrate something, that's the one. Tell him I was using him for a mind ray subject. Will you? And give him this fifth to predict Bill don't want the boys needling him too much. Yes. And thanks. Andy Wonder, the base commander, evidently had something on his mind. Safe. Can you make a man tell the truth with that, and if you can? Will you? I think so. Certainly I will. If I can. Why, Kinnison knew that he could do so. But he did not wish to seem coxer. There's been a murder. The other three glanced at each other in understanding and sighed with profound relief. A particularly fiendish murder of a woman, girl. Rather, two men have been accused. Each has a perfect alibi supported by honest witnesses. But you know how much an alibi means now. Both men tell perfectly straight stories under the lens and all other lie detectors. Either one of those men is lying with a polish I would never have believed possible. Or both are innocent. And one of them must be guilty. These are the only suspects. If we try them now, we make fools of ourselves. And we can't put off the trial very much longer without losing face. If you can help us out, you will be doing a lot for the patrol throughout this whole sector. I can help you, Kinnison declared. For this, though, better have some props. Make me a box to Bulber Bank controls. With five baby spots on a Tehran. Blue. Green. Purple and red. I want the biggest set of headphones you've got. A thick Black blind fold. How soon can you try em? The sooner the better. It can be arranged for this afternoon. The trial was announced, and long before the appointed hour the great courtroom of that world's largest city was thronged. The hour struck, choir trained, Kinnison, the Lensman, in somber grey, strode to the judge's desk and sat down behind the peculiar box upon it. In dead silence two other Lensmen approached, the first invested him reverently with the head firms. 
the second Sowin wrapped his head in black cloth that it was apparent to all observers that his vision was completely obscured, although from a world for distant in space. I have been asked to try two suspects for the crime of murder, Kinnison intoned. I do not know the details of the crime nor the identity of the suspects. I do know that they and their witnesses are within these railings. I shall not select those who are about to be examined. Piercing beams of intense. Varicolder light played over the two groups, and the deep, impressive voice went on. I know now who the suspects are. They are about to rise, to walk, and to seat themselves as I shall direct. They did so, it being plainly evident to all observers that they were under some awful compulsion. The witnesses may be excused. Truth is the only thing of importance here. And witnesses, being human and therefore frail, obstruct truth more frequently than the further its progress. I shall now examine these two accused. Offend the vivid. Weirdly distorting glares of light flashed out, bathing in intense monochromid and various ghastly combinations first one prisoner, then the other, the while Kinnison drove his mind into theirs, plumbing their deepest depths. The silence, already profound, became the utter stillness of outer space as the throng, holding its very breath now, set enthralled by that portentous examination. I have examined them fully. You are all aware that any lensman of the galactic patrol may, in case of need, so as judge, jury, and executioner. I act, however, none of these, nor is this proceeding to be a trial as you may have understood the term. I have said that witnesses are superfluous. I will now add that neither judge nor jury is necessary. All that is required is to discover the truth, since truth is our poor withal. For that reason, also, not even an executioner is needed here that discovered truth will in and of itself serve us in that capacity. One of these men is guilty. The other is innocent. From the mind of the guilty one I am about to construct a composite, not of this one fiendish crime alone, but of all the crimes he has ever committed. I shall project that composite into the air before him, no innocent mind will be able to see any iota of it. The guilty man, however, will perceive its every revolting detail. If, so perceiving, he will forthwith cease to exist in this plane of life. One of the men had nothing to Ferkinson and had told him so. Long since, the other had been trembling four minutes in uncontrollable paroxysms of terror. Now this one leapt from his seat, clawing savagely at his eyes and screaming in mad abandon. I did it help Prosy take her away out, he shrieked, and died, horribly, even as he shrieked. Nor was there nose in the courtroom after the thing was over. The stunned spectators slunk away, scarcely daring even to breathe until they were safely outside, nor were the rattleligen lensmen much more at ease. Not a word was said until the five were back in the commander's office at base. Then Kinnison, still white of face and set of jerk, spoke. The others knew that he had found the guilty man, and that he had in some peculiarly terrible fashion executed him. He knew that they knew that the man was hideously guilty. Nevertheless, the Tellurian said, he was gal too stigily as all the devils in all the hells of the entire universe. I never had to do that before. And it grabs me that I couldn't shove the job off onto you fellows. I wouldn't want anybody to see that picture who didn't have two. And without it you could never begin to understand just how atrociously and damnably guilty that hellhound really was. Thanks, Kinnison. The commander said, simply, Kinnison, Kinnison of Tellus. I'll remember that name in case we ever need you as badly again. But, after what you just did, it will be a long time for ever. You didn't know, did you, that all the inhabitants of four planets were watching you holy rockets? Nay were they they were, and if the way you scared me is any criterion, it will be a long, cold day before anything like that comes up again in this system. And thanks again, Grey Lensman, 
you have done something for our whole patrol this day be sure to dismantle that box so thoroughly that nobody will recognize any of its component parts kinnison managed a rather feeble grin one more thing and i'll buzz along do you fellows happen to know where there's a good strong pirate base around here anywhere and while i don't want to seem fussy i would like it all the better if they were warm blonde oxygen brothers so that i won't have to wear armor all the time what are you trying to do give us the needle or something this is not precisely what the rat religion said but it conveys the thought kinnison received as the base commander stared at him in amazement don't tell me that there is such a base around here exclaimed the tellurian in delight is there really there is it is so strong that we have not been able to touch it and it is manned and staffed by natives of your own planet tell us of saul we reported it to prime may some eight retired days ago just after we discovered it your direct from there he fell silent this was no way to be talking to a gray lensman i was in the hospital then fighting with my nurse because she wouldn't give me anything to eat kinnison explained with a laugh when i left tell us i did it check up on the late dated int and think i would need it quite so soon if you've got it the hospital you queried one of the younger landsmen e bit off more than i could chew and the tellurian briefly described his misadventure with the wheelman of aldebaranai this other thing has come up since then though and i won't be sticking my neck out that way again if you've got such a matatorter base as that in this region it'll save me a long trip where is it they gave him its coordinates and what little information they had been able to secure concerning it they did not ask him why he wanted that data they may have wondered at his temerity in daring to scout alone a fortress whose strength had kept at bay the massed patrol forces of the sector but if they did so they kept their foots well screened for this was a gray lensman and very evidently a super pider individual even of that select group whose weakest members were powerful indeed if he felt like talking they would listen but kinnison did not talk he did the listening then when he had learned everything they knew of the basconian base he said well i'd better be buzzing clear reefer fellows and he was gone fex out from raid and into deep space shot the speedster bearing the gray lensman toward Bursumi, where the Basconian base was situated. The patrol forces had not even yet been able to locate it definitely. Therefore, it must be cleverly hidden indeed. It was manned and staffed by Dalyurige, and this was fairly close to the line first taken by the pallet of the pirate vessel whose crew had been so decimated by Van Busburg and his Valerians. There couldn't be so many Basconian bases with Tellurian personnel kinnison reflected it was well within the bounds of possibility even of probability that he might again encounter here his former but unsuspecting shipmates since the boisean system was less than a hundred parsecs from raidlix a couple of hours found the lensman staring down upon another green and earthly world very earthly indeed was this one there were polarized caps areas of intensely dazzling white there was an atmosphere deep and sweetly blue filled for the most part with sunlight but flecked here and there with clouds some of which were slumming storms there were continents bearing mountains and plains lakes and rivers there were oceans studded with islands great and small but kinnison was no plantigatory nor had he been gone from Tellus sufficiently long so that the sight of this beautiful and home-like world aroused in him any qualm of nostalgia. He was looking for a pirate base. If, dropping his speedster as low into the night side as he dared, he began his search. Of man or of the works of man he at first found little enough trace. All human or pseudo-human life was apparently still in a savage state of development. If, except for a few scattered races or rather tribes of burrowers and of cliff or cave dwellers it was still nomadic wandering here and there without permanent habitation or structure 
animals of scores of genera and species were there in myriads but neither was kinnison a biologist he wanted pirates f it seemed that was the one form of life which he was not going to find but finally through sheer brim bulldog pertinacity he was successful that base was there somewhere he would find it no matter how long it took he would find it if he had to examine the entire crust of the planet land and water alike kilometer by plotted cubic kilometer he set out to do just that and it was thus that he found the Bisconian stronghold it had been built directly beneath a towering range of mountains protected from detection by mile upon mile of native copper and of iron nor its entrances invisible before were even now not readily perceptible camouflaged as they were by outer layers of rock which matched exactly in form color and texture the rocks of the cliffs in which they were placed once those entrances were located the rest was easy again he set his speedster into a carefully observed orbit and came to ground in his armor again he crept forward furtively and skulkingly until he could perceive a shimmering web of force with minor variations his method of entry into the Bisconian base was similar to that he had used in making his way into the patrol base upon Raidlix. He was, however, working now with a surety and a precision which had then been entirely lacking. His practice upon the patrolmen and his terrific bout with the four lensmen had given him knowledge and technique. His sitting in judgment, during which he had touched almost every mind in the vast assemblage, had taught him much. If above all the grisly finale of that sitting horribly distasteful and solar faking as it had been had given him training of inestimable value necessitating as it had the infliction of the ultimate penalty he knew that he might have to stay inside that base for some time therefore he selected his hiding place with care he could of course blank out the knowledge of his presence in the mind of any one chancing to discover him but since such an interruption might come at a critical instant he preferred to take up his residence in a secluded place there were of course many vacant suites in the officers quarter sole bases must have accommodations for visits or in the lensmen decided to occupy one of them it was a simple matter to obtain a key if inside the bare but comfortable little room he stripped off his armor with a sigh of relief leaning back in a deeply upholstered leather armchair he closed his eyes and let his sense of perception roam throughout the great establishment with all his newly developed power he studied it hour after hour and day after day when he was hungry the pirate cooks fed him not knowing that they did so he had lived on iron rations long enough when he was tired he slept with his eternally vigilant lens on guard finally he knew everything there was to be known about that stronghold and was ready to act he did not take over the mind of the base commander but chose instead the chief communications officer as the one most likely and most intimately to have dealings with helmuth for helmuth he who spoke for boscone had for many long months been the lensman's definite objective but this game could not be hurried basis no matter how important did not call Grand Base except upon matters of the most divergency, and no such matter of attitude. Nor did Helmuth call that base, since nothing out of the ordinary was happened to any parrot's knowledge. That eyes and his attention was more necessary elsewhere. One day, however, there came crackling in a triumphant report. A ship working out of that base had taken noble booty indeed, no less surprised that a fully supplied hospital ship of the patrol itself as the report progressed kinnison's heart went down into his boots and he swore bitterly to himself how in all the nine hells of valeria had they managed to take such a ship as that had it she been escorted nevertheless as sheet communications officer he took the report and congratulated heartily through the ship's radio man its captain its officers and its crew mighty fine work helmuth himself shall hear of this 
he concluded his words of praise. How did you do it with one of the new maulers? Yes. So came the reply. Our mauler, accompanying us just out of range, came up and engaged theirs. That left us free to take this ship. We locked on with magnets, cut our way in, and here we thard. There they were indeed. The hospital ship was red with blood. Patients, doctors, interns, officers, and operating crew alike had been butchered with the horribly ruthless savagery which was the customary technique of all the agencies of Boscon. Of all that ship's personnel only the noses lived. They were not to be put to death yet. In fact, and under certain conditions, they need not die at all. They huddled together. A little knot of white clad misery in that corpus later drew, and even now one of them was being dragged away. She was fighting viciously, with fists and feet, with nails and teeth. No one pirate could handle her. It took two of the huskies to subdue that struggling fury. They hauled her upright and she threw back her head. In panting defiance, there was a cascade of red rose hair and kinison so clare as full MacDougall he remembered that there had been some talk that they were going to put her back into space service the lensman decided instantly what to do. Stop. You swine he roared through his parrot my piece. Where do you think you're going with that nurse to the captain's cabin? So the huskies stopped short in amazement as that roar filled the room, but answered the question concisely. Let her go then. As the girl fled back to the huddled group in the corner, he said, Tell the captain to come out here and assemble every officer and man of the crew. I want to talk to everybody at once. He had a minute or two in which to think, and he thought furiously. But accurately, he had to do something. But whatever he did must be done strictly according to the pirates on standards of ethics. If he made one slip it might be Aldebar and I all over again. He knew how to keep from making that slip. He thought, but also, and this was the hard part, he must work on something that would let those nurses know that there was still hope, that there were a few more acts of this drumming at to come. Otherwise he knew with a stark, cold certainty what would happen. He knew of what stuff the space nurses of the patrol were made, knew that they could be driven just so far, and no fur for billet. There was a way out of that, though, in the childishness of his hospitalization he had called Nurse MacDougall a dumble. He had fought of her, and had spoken to her quite frankly, in uncomplanter in terms. But he knew that there was a real brain back of that beautiful countenance, that a quick and keen intelligence resided under that red and rose thatch. Therefore, when the assembly was complete he was ready, and in no uncertain or ambiguous language he opened up. Listen, now I love you, he barked. Savagely, this is the first time in months that we have made such a haul as this, and you fellows have the brazen gall to start helping yourselves to the choicest stuff before anybody else gets a look at it. I tell you now to lay off, and that goes exactly as it lays. At, personally, We'll kill any man that touches one of those women before they arrive here at base. Naidu, Captain, are the first and worst offender of the lot. And he stared directly into the eyes of the officer whom he had last seen entering the dungeon of the wheelman. I admit that you're a good picker. Kinnison's voice was now venomously soft, his intonation distinct with thinly veiled sarcasm. Unfortunately, however, your taste agrees to well with mine. Yes, so, Captain, I'm going to need a nose myself. I think I'm coming down with something. If, since I've got to have a nose, I'll take that red-headed one. I had a nurse once with hair just that color, who insisted on feeding me tea and toast and a soft bidget egg when I wanted beefsteak. And I am going to take my grudge out on this one here for all the red-headed nurses that ever lived. I trust that you will pardon the length of this speech, but I want to give you my reasons in full for cautioning you that that particular nose is my own particular personal property. Mark her for me, and see to it that she gets Heracus Lake as she is now. The captain had been afraid to interrupt his superior, but now he erupted. 
but see here blakesley he stormed she ought to be mine by every right i captured her i saw her first i've got her here enough of that back dog captain kinnison sneered elaborately you know of course that you are violating every rule by taking booty for yourself before division at base and that you can be shot for doing it but everybody does it protested the captain except when a superior officer catches him at it superiors bet first pick you know the lensman reminded him it's ravely but i protest so i'll take it up with shut up kinnison snarled with cold finality take it up with whom you please but remember this my last warning bring her in to me as she is and you live touch her and you die now you gnosis come over here to the board nurse mcdougall had been whispering furtively to the others and now she led the way head high and eyes blazing defiance she was an actress as well as a nose take a good long look at this button rat here mark relay four to six came curt instructions if anybody aboard this ship touches any one of you or even looks at you as though he wants to press this button and i'll do the rest but do but red-headed dumbled look at me don't start baggage neat i just want to be sure that you'll know me when you see me i know you never fear you you brat she flared this informing the lensman that she had received his message i'll not only know you'll scratch your eyes out on sight that'll be a good trick if you can do it kinnison sneered and cut off what's it all about mac what has got into you demanded one of the nurses as soon as the women were alone i don't know she whispered what out they may have sparrows on us i don't know anything really and the whole thing is too wildly impossible too utterly fantastic to be even partially true but pass the word along to all the girls to ride this out because my gray lensman isn't on it somewhere in some high i don't see how he can be possibly but i just know that he is for at the first mention of tea and turst before she perceived even an inkling of the true situation her mind had flashed back instantly to kinnison the most stubborn and rebellious patient she had ever had more the only man she had ever known who had treated her precisely as though she were a part of the hospital's very furniture as is the way of the minto ripically of beautiful women had orated of women's rights and of women's status in the scheme of things she had decried all special privileges and had stated often and with heat that he asked no odds of any man living or yet to be born nevertheless and also beautiful molchenik the thought had bitten deep that here was a man who had never even realized that she was a woman to say nothing of realizing that she was an extraordinarily beautiful one and deep within her and sternly suppressed the thought had still rankled at the mention of beefsteak she all but screamed gripping her knees with frantic hands to keep her emotion down for she had had no real hope she was simply fighting with everything she had until the hopeless end which she had known could not long be delayed now she gathered herself together and began to act when the word dumble boomed from the speaker she knew beyond doubt or peradventure that it was kinnison the gray lensman who was really doing that talking it was crazy it didn't make any kind of sense at all but it was it must be true if again woman lake she knew with a calm certainty that as long as that gray lensman were alive and conscious he would be completely the master of any situation in which he might find himself therefore she passed along her illogical but cheering thought and the nurses also being women accepted it without question as the actual and accomplished fact they carried on and when the captured hospital ship had docked at base kinnison was completely ready to force matters to a conclusion in addition to the chief communications officer he now had under his control a highly capable observer to handle to such minds was child's play to the intellect which had directed 
against their full fighting wills, the minds of two and three quarters alert, powerful, and fully warned Lensman good goal. Mac, he put his mind and rapport with hers and sent his message. Glad you got that idea. You did a good job of acting. And if you can do some more as good, we'll be all set. Can do, I'll say, I can, she assented fervently. I don't know what you are doing, how you can possibly do it, or where you are. But that can wait. Tell me what to do and I'll do it. Make a pass at the base commander. He instructed her. Hate many time working through. You know wall over the place. Go into it, Bib. You maybe could love him. But if I get you, you'll blow out your brains, Fianni. You know the line play up to him with everything you can bring to bear. And hate me all to pieces. Help all you can to start a fight between us. If he falls for you hard enough, the blow for comes then and there. It dot. He'll be able to do us all plenty of dirt. I can kill a lot of them, but not enough of them quick enough. He'll fall, she promised him gleefully, like ten thousand bricks falling down a well. Just watch my jets and fall, he did. He had not even seen a woman for months, and he expected nothing except bitter resistance and suicide from any of these women of the patrol. Therefore, he was rocked to the hell sit back upon his very haunch when the most beautiful woman he had ever seen came of her own volition into his arms, seeking in them sanctuary from his own chief communications officer. I hate him, she sobbed, nestling against the huge bulk of the base commander's body and turning upon him the full blast of the high-powered projectors which were her eyes. You wouldn't be so mean to me. I just know you wouldn't, and her subtly perfumed head sank upon his shoulder. The base commander was just so much soft wax. I'll say I wouldn't be mean to you, his voice dropped to a gentle bellow. Why, you little sweetheart, I'll marry you. I will. By all the gods of space, it thus came about that nurse and base commander entered the control room together, arms about each other. There he is, she shrieked, pointing at the chief communications officer. He's the one now, let's see you start something. You red fast plonker, there's one real man around here. And he won't let you touch me, Yahweh. She gave him a resounding Bronx cheer, and her escort swelled visibly. I states walk innocent, sneered. Get this, baby pace, and get it straight. You were marked as mine as soon as I looked the ship over. And mine you're going to be, whether you like it or not. And no matter what anybody else says or does about it. And as for you, Shift, you're too late. I saw her first. And now, you red-headed hussy, come over here where you belong. She snuggled closer into the commander's embrace and the big man turned purple. What do you mean? Too late, he roared. You took her away from the ship's captain. Didn't you? You said that superior officers get first chores. And they do. I am the boss here and I am taking her away from you. Get me, you'll stand for it. Too easy. And you like it. One word out of you and I'll have you spreadigled across the mouth of no. Six projector superior officers do not always get first chose. Kinnison replied, with bitter, cold ferocity, but choosing his words with care. It depends entirely upon who the two men are. Now was the time to strike. Kinnison knew that if the base commander kept his head, the lives of those valiant women were forfeit, and the Lensman's whole plan seriously endangered. He himself could get away, of course, but he could not see himself doing it under these conditions. No, he must goad the commander to a frenzy. Mac would help, in fact, and without his suggestion. She was even then hard at work fomenting trouble between the two men. You don't have to take that from anybody. Bibbo. She was whispering, urgently, don't call in a crew to spread ugly him, either. Beam him out yourself. You're a better man than he is. Any time, blast him down. That'll show him who's who round this base when the inferior is such a man as I am, and the superior such a one as you mar. The biting, contemptuously sneering voice went on without a break. Such a bloated swine. Such a mangy. 
Lodine Co. Such a pussy gutter tub of lard, such a worthless, brainless spawn of the lowest dregs of the sirists come of space, such an utterly incompetent and self ripy nation to us as you are the outraged pirate chief, bellowing incoherently in wildly mounting rage, was leaping toward a cabinet in which were kept the delameters. Then, in that case, the inferior keeps the red headed wench himself. Put that on a take. Shift and eat it. Then, if you are too much of a lily vetal coward to do anything about it yourself, have me sprevagod. The lensman concluded, cuttingly. Blast him, blast him, down the nose had been shrieking. If, as the raging commander neared the cabinet, no one noticed that her latest and loudest scream was, Kim, blast him down, don't wait any long green for him down before he gets a gun, but the lensman did not act at tea. Although almost every man of the pirate crew stared spellbound, Kinnison's enslaved observer had for many seconds been jamming the subifer with helm of's personal and urgent call. It was of almost vital importance to his plan that Helmuth himself should see the climax of this scene. Therefore, the communications officer stood immobile, while the profanely raving base commander reached the cabinet, tore it open, seized a delameter, and swung it savagely toward him Kiski. But Blakesley, the chief communications officer whose mind and body Kinnison was using, was already armed. Kinnison had seen to that, and as the base commander wrenched open the arms cabinet that happened for which the lensman had been waiting, Helmuth's private lookout set began to draw coint. That potentate himself was now looking on, and the enslaved observer had already begun to trace his beam. Therefore, as the raging commander of Bursia's pirate base swung about with raised delameter, he faced one already ablaze. And in a matter of seconds there was only a charred and smoking heap where the commander had stood. Kinnison wondered that Helmuth's scold voice was not already snapping from the speaker, but he was soon to discover the reason for that silence. On a buster by the lensman, one of the observers had recovered sufficiently from his shocked amazement to turn in a riot alarm to the guard room. Five armed men answered that call on the double, stopped and glanced around. Guards blast Blakesley down helm of some unmistakable voice blared from his speaker. Obediently and manfully enough the five guards tried. If had it actually been Blakesley confronting them so defiantly, they probably would have succeeded. It was the body of the communications officer. It is true, the mind operating the muscles of that body. However, was the mind of Kimball Kinnison. Gray Lensmint, the fastest man with a rapist to Lowell Tellus had ever produced, came up, expecting the move, and with two delameters out and poised at hip this was the being whom Helmuth was so nonchalantly ordering his minions to slay faster than any watching I could follow. Five bolts of lightning flicked from Blakesley's delameters. The last guard went down, his head a shriveled cinder, before a single pirate bolt could be loosed. You so, Helmuth. Kinnison spoke conversationally to the board, his verse dripping vitriol, playing it safe from a distance, and making other men pull your chestnuts out of the fire. Is a very fine trick as long as it works, but when it fails to work, as now, it puts your tail right into the ringer. At Formwood, have been for a long time completely fed upon taking orders from a mere voice, especially from the voice of one whose entire method of operation proves him to be the most pitifully arrant coward in the galaxy. Observer you other at the board snarled Helmuth, paying no attention to Kinnison's barbed shafts. Sound the assembler might no use. Helmuth, he is stone deaf. Kinnison explained, Vos sweetly venomous. I am the only man in this base that you can talk to, and you won't be able to do even that very much longer. And you really think that you can get away with this Newton Heights barefast insubordentious defiance of my authority? Sure I can. That's what I have been explaining to you. If you were here in person, or ever had been, if any of the bows had ever seen you, or had ever known you as anything except a disembodied voice. Maybe I couldn't. But 
since nobody has ever seen even your face. That gives me a chance in his distant base Helmuth's mind had flashed over every aspect of this in Dohuf situation. He decided to play four time. Therefore, even as his hands darted two buttons here and there, he spake, Do you want to see my face? he demanded. If you do see it, no power in the galaxy skip it. Shift, seared Kinnison. Don't try to kid me into believing that you wouldn't kill me now, under any conditions, if you possibly could, as poor nor face. It makes no difference whatever to me. But, whether I ever see your rubbly pen or not, well, you shall and Helmuth's visage appeared, concentrating upon the rebellious officer a glare of such fury and such power that any ordinary man must have quailed. But not Blake's and well not so bad. At that guy looks almost human, Kinnison exclaimed, in the tone most carefully designed to drive even more frantic the helpless and inwardly raging pirate chieftain. But I've got things to do. You can guess at what goes on around here from now on and in the blaze of a Delameter Helmuth's plate. Set, and I disappeared. Kinnison had also been playing four time, and his enslaved observer had checked and rechecked this second and highly important line to Helmuth's sultaristect base. Illustration. An instant later Helmuth's B-plate vanished in the Delameter's blaze. Then, throughout the fortress, there blared out the urgent assembly call, to which the lensman added, her belly. This is a one hypronfant call out, including crews of ships and dock as well as regular base personnel. Bring also the patrol noses. Cut as you are and come fast. The doors of the auditorium will be locked in five minutes, and any man outside those doors will be given ample reason to which that he had been on time. The auditorium was right off the control room and was so arranged that when a partition was rolled back the control room became its stage. All Basconian bases were arranged thus, in order that the supervising officers at Grand Base could oversee, through their instruments upon the main panel. Just such assemblies as this one was supposed to be. Every man hearing that call assumed that it came from Grand Base, and every man hurried to obey it. Kinnison rolled back the partition between the two rooms and watched for ray pistols. As the men came streaming into the auditorium, ordinarily only the guards went armed, three of them were left, but possibly a few of the ship's officers would be wearing their delameters. Forfus of McCaptain and the pallet of the battleship that had captured the nurses, and a vice commander of another, besides the three guards, knives, billies, and such did not count. Time's up. Lock the doors. Bring the keys and the nurses up here. He ordered the six armed men, calling each by name. You women take these chairs over here. You men sit there. Men. When all were seated, Kinnison touched a button and the steel partition slid smoothly into place. What's coming off here? demanded a guard. Where's the commander? How about Grand Base? Look at that board, sit tight. Kinnison directed hands on knees. I'll burn any or all of you that make a move. I have already burned the old man and five guards, and have put Grand Base out of the picture. Now I want to find out just how B-7 stand. The Lensman already knew, but he was not tipping his hand. Why we seven? Because we are the only ones who happened to be wearing guns. Everyone else of the entire personnel is an armed and is now locked in the auditorium. You know how apt they are to get out until one of us lets them out. But hell mutal have you blasted for this hardly. My plans were not made yesterday. How many of you fellows are with me? What's your scheme? demanded the vice commander. To take these nurses to some patrol base and surrender. I am sick of this whole game. If, since none of them have been hurt, I figure they'll bring us a pardon and a fresh start a light sentence at least. Oat. So that's the reason, growled the captain. Exactly. But I don't want anyone with me whose only thought would be to burn me down at the first opportunity. Count me in, declared the pallet. I've got a strong stomach. But enough of these jobbies is altogether too much. If you can wangle anything short of a life sentence for me, I'll go back. 
but I bloody well won't help you against the sure not. Not until after we write in space. I don't need any help here. Do you want my delimeter? No. Keep it. You won't use it on me. Anybody else one guard joined the pallet. Standing aside. The other four wavered. Time's up, Kinnison snapped. But you four fellows. Either go for your guns or else turn your backs. And do it right now they elected to turn their backs and Kinnison collected their weapons. One by one. Having disarmed them, he again rolled back the partition and ordered them to join the wandering throng in the auditorium. He then addressed the assemblage, telling them what he had done and what he had it in mind to do. A good many of you must be fed up on this lawless game of piracy and anxious to resume association with decent men. If you can do so without incurring too great a punishment, he concluded, I feel quite certain that those of us who men the hospital ship in order to return these noses to the patrol will get light sentences. At most, Miss McDougall is head nurse. We will ask her what she thinks. Better than that, Mac replied clearly. I am not merely quite certain. I for am absolutely sure that whatever men Mr. Blakesley selects for his crew will not be given any sentences at all. They will be pardoned and will be given chances at jobs in the merchant service. How do you know? Miss asked one. We were black lot. I know you are. She replied serenely. I won't say how I know, but you can take my word for it that I do know. Those of you who want to take a chance with us line up over here. Kinnison directed, and walked rapidly down the line, reading the mind of each man in turn. Many of them he waved back into the main group. As he found faults of treachery or signs of inherent criminality, those he selected were those who were really sincere in their desire to quit forever the ranks of Boscon, those who were in those ranks because of some press of circumstance rather than because of a mental taint. As each man passed inspection he armed himself from the cabinet and stood at ease before the group of women, having selected his crew. The lensman operated the controls that opened the exit nearest the hospital ship, blasted away the panel, so that that exit could not be closed, unlocked a door, and turned to the pirates. Vice Commander Crimsby, as senior officer you are now in command of this base. He remarked, while I am in no sense giving you orders, there are a few matters about which you should be informed. First. I set no definite time as to when you may leave this room. I merely state that you will find it decidedly and healthy to follow us at all closely as we go from here to the hospital ship. Second, you haven't a ship fit to take the ether, as your blast levers have all been broken off at the pivots. If your mechanics work at top speed, new ones can be put on in exactly two hours. Food. There is going to be a very severe earthquake in precisely two hours and thirty minutes, one which should make this base merely a memory. And earthquake don't bluff. Blakesley, you couldn't do that well. Perhaps not a regular earthquake, but something that will do just as well. If you think I am bluffing, wait and find out. But common sense should give you the answer to that. I know exactly what Helmuth is doing now whether you do or not. At first I intended to wipe you all out without warning. But I changed my mind. I decided that I would rather leave you alive, so that you could report to Helm of exactly what happened. I wish that I could be watching him when he finds out how badly one man rucked him, and how far from foolproof his system is. But we can't have everything. Let's go. Ferk says the group hoid away. Mac loitered until she was near the form of Blakesley, who was bringing up the rear. Where are you? Can she whisper urgently? I'll join up at the next corridor. Keep further ahead, and get ready to run when we do as the past that corridor a figure in gray leather, carrying an extremely heavy object. Stepped out of it. Kinnison himself set his burden down. Yanked a lover. Undrand and as he ran fountains of intolerable heat erupted and cascaded from the mechanism he had left upon the floor. Just ahead of him, 
but at some distance behind the others, ran Blakesley and Mac. Bess, I'm glad to see you. Can she panted, as the lensman caught up with them and doll three slowed down. What is that thing back there? Nothing much. Cust a cue for's ha shot. Won't do any real damage. It just melt this tunnel down so that they can't interfere with our getway. Then you were bluffing about the rook crick, she asked. A shade of disappointment in her tone. Hardly. He reproved her. That isn't due for two hours and a half yet, but it'll happen on schedule time. How you remember about the curious cat. Don't you, however? No particular secret about it. I guessed in Dudoic bombs placed where they'll do the most good. Untimed for exactly simultaneous detonation. Here we are. Don't tell anybody I'm here. Aboard the vessel. Kinnison disappeared into a statterm while Blakesley continued in charge. Men were divided into watches. Duties were assigned. Inspections were made. And the ship shot into the nair. There was a brief halt to pick up Kinnison's speedster. Then, again on the way, Blakesley turned the board over to Crandall, the pilot, and went into Kinnison's room. There the lensman withdrew his control, leaving intact the memory of everything that had happened. For minutes Blakesley was almost in a daze, but struggled through it and held out his hand. Mighty glad to meet you, lensman. Thanks. All I can say is that after I got sucked in I couldn't, sure, and all about it. That was one of the reasons I picked you out. Your subconsciences didn't fight back a bit. At any time, you are to be in charge. From here to tell us. Please go and chase everybody out of the control room except Crandall. Safe. I just thought of something, exclaimed Blakeslee. When Kinnison joined the two officers at the board, you must be that particular lensman who has been getting in Helmuth's hair so much lately, probably. That's my chief fame in life. I'd like to see Helmuth's space when he gets the report of this. I've said that before. Haven't I, but I mean it now. Even more than I did before. I'm thinking of Helmuth. Oh, but not that way. The pilot had been scowling at his plate, and now turned to Blakesley and the lensman glancing curiously from one to the other. Oat, I sway lensman. What a bit of good old light begins to dawn. But that can wait. Helmuth is after us. Foot, horse, in the reeds. Look at that plate four of them already, exclaimed Blake Slee. And there's another and we haven't got a beam hot enough to light a cigarette. Nor a screen strong enough to stop a firecracker. We've got legs but not as many as Helmuth's flyers. You knew all about that. Though, of course, before we started. And from what you have pulled off so far, you've got something left on the hooks. What is it? What's the answer in detectability? Replied Kinnison. We can detect them, but they can't detect us. All you have to do is to stay out of range of their electros and drill foretell us. That's hard to believe. But it must be true. There are nine ships on the plates now, all Bersconians and all certainly looking for us. But not a one of them has paid any attention to us. Nor will they. If, by the way, who or what is Boscon, nobody knows. Helmuth speaks for Boscon. And nobody else ever does. Not even Boscon Himsel fell there is such a person. Nobody can prove it. But everybody knows that Helmuth and Boscon are simply two names for the same man. Helmuth, you know, is only a boss. Nobody ever saw his face until today. I'm beginning to think so. Myself. And Kinnison strode away to call at the office of Headnose MacDougall. Back. Here's a small, but highly important box. He told her, taking the neutralizer from his pocket and handing it to her. Put it in your locker until you get to tell us. Then take it yourself and give it to Haynes himself in person and to nobody else. Just tell him I sent it. He'll know all about it. But why not keep it and give it to him yourself? You're coming with us. Aren't you probably not all the way? 
I imagine I'll have to shove off before we get back to tell us. But I want to talk to you, she explained. Why? I've got a million questions to ask you that would take a long time, he grinned at her, and time is just what we don't have right now. Either of us. And he strode back to the board. He labored for hours at a calculating machine and in the tank. Finally, two squat down upon his heels, staring at two needle-like rays of light in the tank and whistling softly between his teeth. For those two lines, while exactly in the same plane, did not intersect in the tank at all, estimating as carefully as he could the point of intersection of the lines. He punched the cancel key to wipe out all traces of his work and went to the chart room. Chart after chart he hauled down, and for many minutes he worked with calipers, compass, goniometer, and a carefully set adjustable triangle. Finally he marked a point extelti upon a small, plain dot already upon the chart and again whistled. Half he grunted. He rechecked all his figures and retraversed the chart, only to have his needle pierce again the same tiny. Unmarked dat. He stared at it for a full minute, studying the map all round his marker. Star cluster AC 250 Osvin thousand, 736. He ruminated. The smallest, most insignificant, least crone star cluster he could find, and my largest possible error can't put it anywhere else. Can't have thought it might be in a cluster. But I never would have looked there. No wonder it took a lot of stuff to trace his beam. It would have to be four numbers brinnel harder than a diamond drill to work from there. Again whistling tunelessly to himself, he rolled up the chart upon which he had been at work, stuck it under his arm, replaced the others in their compartments, and went back to the control room. How's tricks? Fellas, he asked. Pete, replied Blakesley. We are through them and into clear ether. Not a ship on the plate. And nobody gave us even a tumble. Fine, you won't have any trouble. Then, from here into prime base. Glad of it. Oh, I've got to flit. That'll mean long watches for you, too. But it can't very well be helped. But I say, old Berg, I don't mind the watches. But don't worry about that, either. This crew can be trusted. To a man. Not one of you joined the pirates of your own free will. And not one of you has ever taken an active part. What are you? A mind reader or something, Crandall burst out. Something like that. Kinnison assented with a grin. Blakesley put in. More than that. You moaned. Something like hypnosis. Only more so. You think that I had something to do with this. But I didn't. The Lensman did it all himself. Amund. Crandall stared at Kinnison. New respect in his eyes. I knew that unattached Lensmen were good. But I had no idea they were that good. No wonder Helmuth has been getting his wind up about you. I'll string along with anyone who can tape a whole base single-handed, and make such a bally as to boot out of such a keen old bird as Helmuth is. But I'm in a bit of a dither, not to say funk, about what is going to happen when we pop into prime base without you. Every man jack of us, you know, is slated for the lethal chamber without trial. Miss McDougal will do her bit, of course. But what I mean is, has she enough jets to swing it? I think that she has. But to avoid all argument, I've fixed that up. Oh, here's a tape. Telling all about what happened. It ends up with my recommendation for a full pardon for each of you, and for a job at whatever he is found best fitted for. It is signed with my thumbprint. Give it or send it to Port Admiral Haynes as soon as you land. I've got enough jets, I think, so that it will go as it lays. Jets, Urito, you've got jets enough to lift fourteen freighters off the North Pole of Valeria. What next stores and supplies for my speedster? I'm doing a long flit and this ship has supplies to burn. So I'd like to have my little can loaded. Plimsoll down. The speedster was stopped forthwith. Then, with nothing more than a casually waved salute in the way of farewell. 
Kinnison boarded his tiny spaceship and shot away toward his distant goal. Prandall, the pilot, sought his bunk, while Blakesley started his long trip at the board. In an hour or so the head nose strolled in. Can she queried? Doubtfully. No. Miss McDougall. It's Blakesley. Sorry, O. Oh. I'm glad of that. That means that everything is settled. Where's the lensman that he has gone? Yes. Gone without a word where he didn't say. He wouldn't. Of course. The nurse turned away, exclaiming inaudibly. God, I'd like to cuff him for that. The love gone wide. The great, lived, lobsterly clonker speaking. But Kinnison was not heading for Helm of Space Seat. He was splitting the defer toward Aldebaran instead, as fast as his speedster could go. And she was one of the fastest things in the galaxy. He had two good reasons for going there before he attempted Boss Cohen's grand base. First, to try out his skill upon non-human intellect, Steve, he could handle the wheelman he was ready to take the far greater hazard. Second, he owed those wheelmen something and he did not like to call in the whole patrol to help him pay his debts. He could, he thought, handle the base himself, knowing exactly where it was. He had no difficulty in finding the volcanic shaft which formed the entrance to that Aldebaranian base. Down that shaft his sense of perception sped. He found the lookout plates and followed their power leads. Gently, carefully, he insinuated his mind into that of the wheelman at the board, discovering, to his great relief, that that monstrosity was no more difficult to handle than had been the rattleligen observer. Mind or intellect, he fanned, were not affected at all by the shape of the brains concerned. Quality, rouge, and power were the essential factors. Therefore, he let himself in and took position in the same room from which he had been driven so violently. Kinnison examined with interest the wall through which he had been blown, noting that it had been repaired so perfectly that he could scarcely find the joints which had been made. These willmen, the lensmen knew, had explosives, since the bullets which had torn their way through his armor and through his flesh had been propelled by the agency. Therefore, to the mind within his grasp he suggested the place where explosives are kept and the thought of that mind flashed to the storeroom in question. Similarly, the thought of the one who had access to that room pointed out to the lensman the particular wheelman he wanted. It was as easy as that, and since he took care not to look at any of the weird beings, he gave no alarm. Kinnison withdrew his mind delicately, leaving no trace of its occupancy and went to investigate the arsenal. There he found a few cases of Mac and Harriper cartridges, and that was all. Then he went into the mind of the munitions officer, where he discovered that the heavy bombs were kept in a distant crater, so that no damage would be done by any possible explosion. Not quite as simple as I thought. Kinnison ruminated. But there's a way out of that. Oh, there was. It took an hour or so of time and he had two control to Wilman instead of one. But he found that he could do that. When the munitions master took out a bomb scar after a load of H. Oh, the crew had no idea that it was anything except a routine job. The only wheelman who would have known differently, the one at the lookout board, was the other whom Kinnison had to keep under control. The sky went out, got its load, and came back. Then while the lensman was flying out into space. The scow dropped down the shaft. So quietly was the whole thing done that not a creature in that whole establishment knew that anything was wrong until it was too late to act and then none of them knew anything at all. Not even the crew of the scow realized that they were dropping too fast. Kinnison didn't know what would happen if him into say nothing of too offended while in his mental grasp, and he did not care to find out. Therefore, a fraction of a second before the crash. He jerked free and watched. The explosion and its consequences did not look at all impressive from the lensman's coign of vantage. The mountain trembled a little, then subsided noticeably. From its summit there erupted an important little flare of flame. 
some smoke, and an insignificant shower of rock and debris. However, when the scene had cleared there was no longer any shaft leading downward from that crater. A floor of solid rock began almost at its lip. Nevertheless, the Lensman explored thoroughly all the region where the stronghold had been, making sure that the clan-up had been one hypernfant effective. Then, and only then, did he point the speedster streamlined nose toward star cluster AC 250 Osvin thousand seven hundred thirty six in his hidden retreat so far from the galaxy's crowded suns and worlds helmuth was in no enviable or easy frame of mind four times he had declared that that accursed lensman whoever he might be must be destroyed and had mustered his every available force to that end only to have his intended prey slip from his grasp as effortlessly as a droplet of mercury eludes the clutching fingers of a child that lensman with nothing except a speed stir and a bomb had taken and had studied one of boscone's new battleships thus obtaining for his patrol the secret of cosmic energy abandoning his own vessel then crippled and doomed to capture or destruction he had stolen one of the ships searching for him and in it he had calmly sailed to valancha right through helm of screen of blockading vessels he had in some way so fortified Valencia as to capture six more Bisconian battleships. In one of those ships he had won his way back to the prime base of the patrol, with information of such immense importance that it had robbed the Bisconian organization of its then overwhelming superiority. More, he had found or had developed new items of equipment which, save for Helmuth's own success in obtaining them, would have given the patrol a definite and decisive superiority over Biscania. Now both sides were again equal, except for that Lensman and Hef Lens. Helmuth still quailed inwardly whenever he thought of what he had undergone at the Rision barrier, and he had given up all thought of securing the secret of the Lens by force or from Rhesia. But there must be other ways of getting it, and just then there came in the urgent call from Bursiwi followed by the stunningly successful revolt of the hitherto innocuous Blakesley, culminating as it did in the destruction of Helm of Severibosi and device of vision nor of communication. Blue height with fury, the Bisconian high chief flung his net abroad to take the renegade, but as he settled back to await results a thought struck him like a blow from a fist. Blakesley was innocuous. He never had had, did not now and never would have, the cold nerve and the sheer dominating power he had just shown toward what conclusion did that fact point the furious anger disappeared from helm of space as though it had been wiped there from with a sponge and he became again the coldly calculating mechanism of flesh and blood that he ordinarily was this conception changed matters entirely this was not an ordinary revolt of an ordinary subordinate the man had done something which he could not possibly do so with the lens again again that accursed lensman the one who had some high learned really to use his lens wool mark call every vessel at bosi base he directed crisply keep on calling them until someone answers that whoever is in charge there now and put him on me here a few minutes of silence followed then vice commander krimsky reported in full everything that had happened and told of the fret and destruction of the base you have an automatic speedster there. Have you not? Yes. So, turn over command to the next in line, with orders to move to the nearest base, taking with him as much equipment as is possible. Caution him to leave on time. However, for I very strongly suspect that it is now too late to do anything to prevent the destruction of the base. So, along. Take the speedster and bring away the personal files of the men who went with Blake Slee. A speedster will meet you at a point to be designated later and relieve you of the records. An hour past it, oh. Then three. Walmart, Blake Slee, and the hospital ship have vanished. I presume they have. The underling, expecting a verbal flaying, was greatly surprised at the mildness of his chief stone and at the studious serenity of his face. Come to the center then when the lieutenant was seated i do not suppose that you as yet realize what or rather white is that is doing this why blakesley is doing it 
of course i thought so though at first that was what the one who really did it wanted us to think it must have been blakesley we saw him do it so how could it have been any one else i do not know i do know however and so should you that he could not have done it blakesley of himself is of no importance whatever we'll cash him so and make him talk he can't get away you will find that you will not catch him and that he can get away blakesley alone of course could not do so any more than he could have done the things he apparently did do no walmark we are not dealing with blakesley who then so haven't you deduced that yet the lensman full same lensman who has been thumbing his nose at us ever since he took one of our first school's battleships with a speed boat and a firecracker but read blinding rockets how again i admit that i do not night the connection however is quite evident with it blakesley was thinking thoughts utterly beyond him the lens comes from a receipt the origins are masters of toth off mental forces and processes incomprehensible to any of us these are the elements which when fitted together will give us the complete picture still i don't see how they fit either do i it however it should be clear to you that we do not want that lensman thinking such thoughts as that into this base we certainly do not however surely he can trace just a moment the time has come when it is no longer safe to say what that lensman cannot do our communicator beams are hard and tight yes but any beam can be tapped if enough power be applied to it and any beam that can be tapped can be traced i expect him to visit us here and we shall be prepared for his visit that is the reason for this conference with you he is a device which generates a field through which no thought can penetrate i have had this device for some time but for obvious reasons have not released it here are the diagrams and complete constructional data have a few hundred of them made with all possible speed and see to it that every being upon this planet wears one continuously impress upon every one and i will also that it is of the most importance that absolutely continuous protection be maintained even while changing batteries experts have been working for some time upon the problem of protecting the entire planet with such a screen and there is some little hope of success in the near future but individual protection will still be of the most importance we cannot impress it too forcibly upon every one that every man's life is dependent upon each one maintaining his faust rank in full operation at all times that is all when the messenger brought in the personal files of blakesley and the other deserters helmuth and his psychologists went over them with minutely painstaking care the more they studied them the clearer it became that the chief's conclusion was the correct one some one had in some way brought an extraordinary mental pressure to bear reason and logic told helmuth that the lensman's only purpose in attacking the boisean base was to get a line on grand base that blakesley's flight and the destruction of the base were merely diversions to obscure the real purpose of the visit that the lensman had staged the theatrical performance especially to hold him helmuth while his beam was being traced and that was the only reason why the visit was not sooner put out of action if finally that the lensman had scored another clean hit <coughs> helmuth himself had been caught flat-footed his face hardened and his jaw set at the thought but he had not been taken in he was forewarned and he would be ready for he was coldly certain that grand base and he himself were the real objectives of the lensman that lensman knew full well that any number of ordinary bases ships and men could be destroyed without damaging t materially t the Bisconian cause steps must be taken to make grand base as impregnable to mental forces as it already was to physical ones otherwise it might well be that even helmuth's own life would presently be at stake and that life was a thing precious indeed therefore council after council was held every contingency that could be thought of was brought up and discussed 
every possible precaution was taken. In short, every resource of Grand Base was devoted to the warding off of any possible mental threat which might be forthcoming. Kinnison approached that star cluster with care, small though it was, as cosmic groups go. It yet was composed of some hundreds of stars and an unknown number of planets. Any one of those planets might be the one he sought, and to approach it unknowingly might prove disastrous. Therefore, he slowed down to a crawl and crept up, light year by light year, with his ultra-pointer detectors spanning out before him to the limit of their unimaginable reach. He had more than half expected that he would have to search that cluster, world by world, but in that, at least, he was pleasantly disappointed. One corner of one of his plates began to show it in blow of detection. A belting golden Kinnison directed his most powerful master plate into the region indicated. This plate, while of very narrow field, had tremendous resolving power and magnification, and in it he saw that there were eighteen small centers of radiation surrounding one vastly larger one. There was no doubt then as to the location of Helmuth's base but there arose the question of approach. The Lensman had not considered the possibility of a screen of Lokite ships, if they were close enough together so that their electromagnetics had even a fifth difference to overlap. He might as well go back home. What were those outposts? And exactly how closely were they spaced, he observed, advanced, and observed again, computing finally that, whatever they were, they were so far apart that there could be no possibility of any electro-overlap at all. He could get between them easily enough. He wouldn't even have to baffle his flares. They could not be guards at all. Kinnison concluded, but must be simply outposts. Set far outside the solar system of the planet they guarded, not to ward off foaming speedsters but to warn Helmuth of the possible approach of a force large enough to threaten the grand base of Biscania. Closer and closer Kinnison clashed, discovering that the central object was indeed a base. Startling in its immensity and completely and intensively fortified, and that the outposts were huge, floating fortresses, practically stationary in space relative to the sun of the solar system they surrounded. The lensman aimed at the center of the imaginary square formed by four of the outposts and drove in as close to the planet as he dared. Then, going inert, he set his speedster into an orbit did not care particularly about its shape, provided that it was not too narrow an ellipse and cut off all his power. He was now safe from detection. Leaning back in his seat and closing his eyes, he holed his sense of perception into and through the massed fortifications of Grand Base. For a long time he did not find a single living creature. He traversed hundreds of miles, perceiving only automatic machinery. Bank after towering, mile quest bank of accumulators, and remote altered projectors and other weapons and apparatus. Finally, however, he came to Helmuth's dome and in that dome he received another severe shock. The personnel in that dome were to be numbered by the hundreds, but he could not make mental contact with any one of them. He could not touch their minds at all. He was stopped cold. Every member of Helmuth's band was protected by a Faust train as effective as the Lensman zone around and around the planet the speedster circled. While Kinnison struggled with this new and entirely unexpected setback, this looked as though Helmuth knew what was coming. Helmuth was nobody's fool. Kinnison knew. But how could he possibly have suspected that a mental attack was in the book perhaps he was just playing safe? If so, the Lensman's chance would come. Men would be careless. Batteries weakened and would have to be changed. But this hope was also vain. As continued watching revealed that each battery was listed. Chat and timed, nor was any screen released. Even for an instant, when its battery was changed, the fresh power source being slipped into service before the weakening one was disconnected. Well, that proves that Helmuth knows, Kinnison cogitated. After watching vainly several such changes, he's a wise old burr. 
The guy really has jets. I still don't see what edit that could have put him wise to what was going on. Day after day the Lensman studied every detail of construction, operation, and routine of that base, and finally an idea began to dawn. He shot his attention toward a barracks he had inspected frequently of late, but stopped. Irresolute. But how? Him. Maybe better not. He advised himself. Helmuth's mighty quick on the trigger. To figure out that Borsian thing so fast his projected thought was sheared off without warning. Thus settling the question definitely. Helmuth's big apparatus was at work. The whole planet was screened against quote, well, probably better. At that, Kinnison went on arguing with himself. If I'd tried it out, maybe he'd have got onto it and laid me a stymie next time. When I really need it, since he had accomplished everything that he could do for the time being, he went free and hurled his speedster toward Durf. Now distant indeed, several times during that long trip he was sorely tempted to call Haynes through his lens and get things started but he always thought better of it. This was altogether too important a thing to be sent through so much so bitter, or even to be thought about except inside an absolutely thought typhoon. And besides, every waking hour of even that long trip could be spent very profitably in digesting and correlating the information he had obtained and in mapping out the salient features of the campaign that was to come. Therefore, before time began to drag, Kinnison landed at Prime Base and was granted instant audience with Port Admiral Haynes. Mighty glad to see you. Son. Haynes greeted the young Lensman cordially. As he sealed the room, fought Tyfe. Since you came in under your own power, I assume that you are here to make a constructive report better than that. So, I'm here to start something in a big way. I know at last where their grand base is and have detailed plans of it. I think that I know who and where Boskine is. I know where Helmuth is. And I have worked out a plan whereby, if it works, we can wipe out that base. Boskine, Helmuth, and all the lesser master minds, at one wipe. Holy jumping rockets for the first time since Kinnison had known him the old man lost his poise. He leapt to his feet and seized Kinnison by the arm. I knew you were good, but not that good the Rizians gave you the treatments you wanted. Then they sure did. And the younger man reported as briefly as possible everything that had happened, then outlined the plan upon which he had been working so long. I am just as sure that Helmuth is Boscone as I can be of anything that can't be proved. Kinnison declared, bending over a huge chart and sketching rapidly. Helmuth speaks for Boscone and nobody else ever does. Not even Boscon himself. None of the other big shots know anything about Boscon or ever heard him speak. But they all jump through their hoops when Helmuth, speaking for Boscon, cracks the width, and I couldn't get a trace of Helmuth ever taking anything up with any hierapus. Therefore, I am dead certain that when we get Helmuth we get Boscon. But that's going to be a real job of work. I scouted his headquarters from stem to gudgeon. As I told you, and Grand Base is absolutely impregnable as it stands. I never imagined anything like it. It makes Prime Base here look like a deserted crossroads after a hard winter. They've got screens, pits, projectors, accumulators, all on a gigantic scale. In fact, they've got everything, but you can get all that from the tape. I have learned definitely that we cannot take them by any possible direct frontal attack. Even if we attacked with every ship and muller we've got throughout the galaxy, they could stand us off, and they can match us. Ship for ship, we'd never get near that base at all if they knew that we were coming. Well, if it's such an impossible job, what I'm coming to that? It is impossible as it stands. But there's a good chance that I'll be able to soften grind base up. You know, like a warm bore from within. Anyway, that's the only possible way to do it. So I've got to try it. You'll have to put detector nullfias on every ship assigned to the job. But that'll be easy. 
I would suggest sending all the Maulers and First Schools battleships we've got. But you will, of course, work that out, Mater. The important thing, as I gather it, is tamming, absolutely to the minute, since I won't be able to communicate once I get inside their fout screens. How long will it take to concentrate everything we've got and put it in that cluster seven weeks fight at the outside? Plus two four allowances. Pite, at exactly hour twenty. Ten weeks from today. Let every projector of every vessel that you can possibly get there cut loose on that base with everything they can pour in. Where is that other print Herrickman tech was her main objectives? You so. Blast them all simultaneously to the second if they all go down the rest will be possible it dot it will be just too bad then work along these lines here straight from those twenty skies stations to the dome blasting everything as you go make it last exactly fifteen minutes not a minute more or less if by fifteen minutes after twenty the main dome hasn't surrendered by cutting its screens Blast that. Oh, if you can, it'll take a lot of blasting. I'm afraid. From then on, you and the fleet commander will have to do whatever is appropriate to the occasion. Your plan doesn't cover that. Apparently. Where will you be? How will you be fixed? If the main dome does not cut its screens, I'll be dead. And you will be just starting the dandinist war that this galaxy ever so. Skiji while servicing and checking over the speedster required only a couple of hours. Kinnison did not leave her for almost two days. He had requisitioned much special equipment. The construction of one item of which a suit of armor such as had never been seen upon earth before assaked almost all of the delay. When it was ready, the greatly interested Port Admiral accompanied the young lensman out to the steel Eden. St. Dillard concrete dugout in which the suit had already been mounted upon a remote altered dummy. Fifty feet from that dummy there was a heavy, water-cooled machine rifle, with its armored crew standing by. As the two approached, the crew leapt to attention. As you were, Haynes instructed, you checked those cartridges against those I brought in from Eldeber, and I asked Kinnison of the officer in charge, as accompanied by the port admiral. He cruffed down behind the shields of the control panel. Yes. So, these are twenty five per cent over. As you specified. Kick something's firing then. As the weapon clamored out its stuttering, barking roar, Kinnison made the dummy stoop. Tain. Bend. Press. And dodge. So as to bring its every plate. Zoomed. And member into the hail of steel. The uproar stopped. One thousand rounds. Sowed, the officer reported. No how less no denstonis crachoris car. Kinnison reported. After a minute examination. And got into the thing. Now give me two thousand rounds. Unless I tell you to stop. Shoot again the machine rifle burst into its iterating song of hate. If strong as Kinnison was and powerfully braced by the blast of his drivers. He could not stand against the awful force of those bullets. Over he went. Backward. And the firing ceased. He pit up, he snapped. Think they're going to quit shooting at me because I fall down, but you had had nineteen hundred, protested the officer. Keep on pecking until you run out of ammunition or until I tell you to stop, ordered Kinnison. I've got to learn how to handle this thing under fire. The storm of metal again began to crash against the reverberating shell of steel. It hauled the lensman down, rolled him over and over, slammed him against the back stop. Again and again he struggled upright, only to be hauled again to ground as the rifle, really playing the game now, swung their lead and hail from part to part of the armor, and varied their attack from steady fire to short. But savage boasts. But finally, in spite of everything the gun crew could do, Kinnison learned at his controls. Then, drivers flaring. He faced that hiling, chattering muzzle and strode straight into the stream of smoke and flame and bruised steel. Now the air was literally full of metal. 
bullets and fragments of bullets whined and shrieked in mad abandon as they ricocheted off that armor in all directions sand and bits of concrete flew hither and yon filling the atmosphere of the dugout the rifle marmot at maximum with its sweating cool laboring mightily to keep its voracious maw full fed but in spite of everything kinnison held his line and advanced he was a bare ten feet from that raving steal the mighty muzzle when the firing again ceased twenty thousand sewed the officer reported crisply we'll have to change barrels before we can give you any more that's enough snapped haines come out of the right kinnison came he removed heavy surplugs swallowed four times blinked and grimaced finally he spoke it works perfectly sewed except for the nose it's a good thing i've got a lens even though i was wearing plugs i won't be able to hear a sound for three days how about the springs and shock absorbers are you bruised anywhere you took some real bumps perfect into bruise let's look her over every inch of that armor's surface was now marked by blows where the metal of the bullets had rubbed on the shining aloe but that surface was neither scratched scored nor dented Pite. Bosch tanks. Kinnison dismissed the rifle. They probably wondered how any man could see through a helmet built up of in checks to claminate a with neither window nor port through which to look. But if so, they made no mention of their curiosity. They, though, were patrolmen. Is that thing an armor or a personal tank? Asked Taines. I aged ten years while that was going on. Buff, at that. I'm glad you insisted on testing it as you did. You can get away with anything now. I've found that it is much better technique to learn things among friends here than among enemies. Kinnison laughed. It's heavy. Of course, over three hundred kilos. That I won't be walking around in it much. Though, and even that little I'll be flying it instead of walking it. Well, so, since everything's all set, I think I'd better fly it over to the speedster and start flitting. Don't you? I don't know exactly how much time I am going to need on Tranco. Might as well. The port admiral agreed, as casually, and Kinnison was gone. What a man Haines stared after the monstrous figure until it vanished in the distance, then strolled slowly toward his office, thinking as he went. No McDougall had been highly irked and incensed at Kinnison's casual departure, without title conversation or formal leave-takings. Not so Haynes. That seasoned campaigner knew that Grayland's moptrically young Grayland's more prone to get that way. He knew, in a way she never would and never could know, that Kinnison was no longer a Virk. He was now only of the galaxy, not of any one tiny dust grain of it. He was of the patrol. He was the patrol, and he was taking his new responsibilities very seriously indeed. In his fierce steel to drive his campaign through to a successful and he would use man or woman, singly or in groups, ships, even prime base itself, exactly as he had used them, as pawns, as mere tools, as means to an end. If, having used them, he would leave them as unconcerned and and as unceremoniously as he would drop pliers and spanner, and with no realization that he had violated any of the nicer amenities of life as it is lived and as he strolled along and fought. The port admiral smiled quietly to himself. He knew, as Kinnison would learn in time, that the universe was vast, that time was long, and that the scheme of things comprising the whole of eternity and the cosmic hall, was a something incomprehensibly immense indeed, with which cryptic thought the space hardened veteran sat down at his desk and resumed his interrupted labors. But Kinnison had not yet attained Haines' philosophic viewpoint any more than he had his age, and to him the trip to Tranker seemed positively interminable. Eager as he was to put his plan of campaign to the test, he found that mental urgings, or even audible invectives, 
would not make the speedster go any faster than the already incomprehensible top speed of her driver's maximum blast nor did pacing up and down the little control room seem to help very much physical exercise he had to perform but it did not satisfy him mental exercise was impossible he could think of nothing except helm of space eventually however he approached trenko and located without difficulty the patrol's spaceport fortunately it was then at about eleven o'clock so that he did not have to wait long to land he drove downward a note sending a thought ahead of him Lensman of Trenkur Space Port Ben Seven saw his relief Lensman Kinnison of Saliwi asking permission to land. It is Tredis Nate. Came back the cot. Welcome. Kinnison, you are on the correct line. You have, then, perfected an apparatus to see truly in this distorting medium I didn't perfect it. It was given to me. The landing bar is lashed out. Seized the speedster. Undeased her down into the lock as soon as she had been disinfected kinnison went into consultation with tregasny the regalian was a highly important factor in the tellurian scheme F. since he was also a lensman he was to be trusted implicitly therefore kinnison told him briefly what occurred and what he had it in mind to do concluding so do you sue i need about fifty kilograms of fionet not fifty milligrams or even grams but fifty kilograms F. since there probably isn't that much of the stuff loose in the whole galaxy i came over here to ask you to make it for me just like that calmly asking a lensman whose sworn duty it was to kill any being even attempting to gather a single trinokian plant to make for him more of the prohibited drug than was ordinarily processed throughout the galaxy during a solarian month it would be just such an errand were one to walk into the treasury department in washington and inform the chief of the narcotics bureau quite nonchalantly that he had dropped in to pick up ten tons of heroin but tregus knee did not flinch or question and was not even surprised this was a gray lensman and his plan would work that should not be too difficult Tredesny replied, after a moment's study, we have several fionet processing units, confiscated from Zwilnik ships and not yet picked up by headquarters. And all of us are, of course, quite familiar with the technique of extracting and purifying the drug. He issued orders, and shortly Trenko Space Port presented the astounding spectacle of a full crew of the Galactic Patrol devoting its every energy to the whole-hearted breaking of the one law it was supposed most rigidly, and without fear or favor. To enforce it was a little afternoon. The calmest hour of Trenko's day, the wind had died to nothing, which, on that planet, meant that a strong man could stand against it, could even if he were idle as well as strong walk about in it therefore kinnison donned his light armor and was soon busily harvesting the pertlevet plants which he had been informed were the richest sources of fionet he had been working for only a few minutes when one of the natives came crawling up to him if, after ascertaining that his hard steel armor was not good to eat drew off and observed him intently here was another opportunity for practice and in a flash the lensman availed himself of it having practiced four hours upon the minds of various earthly animals he entered this mind easily enough finding that the trinokian flat was considerably more intelligent than a dog so much so in fact that the race had already developed a fairly comprehensive language therefore it did not take long for the lensman to learn to use his subjects peculiar limbs and other members and soon the flat was working like a trojan if, since he was ideally adapted for his wildly raging trinokian environment he actually accomplished more than all the rest of the force combined it's a dirty trick i'm playing on you fetter kinnison told his helper after a while come on into the receiving room and i'll see if i can square it with you since food was the only logical tender 
Kinnison brought out from his speedster a small can of salmon, a package of cheese, a bar of chocolate, a few lumps of sugar, and a potato, offering them to the Trinokian in order. The salmon and the cheese were both highly acceptable fare. The morsel of chocolate was a delightfully surprising delicacy. The lump of sugar, however, was what really rang the bell. Kinnison's own mind felt the shock of pure ecstasy as that wonderful substance dissolved in the Tranco's mouth. He also ate the potato. Of course, an Etranokian animal will, at any time, eat anything containing carbon, even limerick, gasoline, or truck grease, but it was merely food, nothing to rave about. Knowing now what to do, Kinnison led his assistant out into the howling shrieking gale and released him from control throwing a lump of sugar upward and as he did so the tranco seized it in the mare ate it and went into a very hysteria of joe more and more he insisted attempting to climb up the lensman's armored leg you must work for more of it if you want it kinnison explained break off these plants here and carry them over into that empty thing over there and you get more. This was an entirely new idea to the native. But after Kinnison had taken hold of his mind and had shown him how to do consciously that which he had been doing unconsciously for an hour, he worked willingly enough. In fact, before it started to rain, thereby putting an end to the labor of the day, there were a dozen of them toiling at the harvest and the crop was coming in as fast as the entire crew of regalians could process it, and even after the spaceport was sealed they cried it up, paying no attention to the rain, bringing in their small loads of leaves and plaintively asking admittance. It took some little time for Kinnison to make them understand that the day's work was done, but that they were to come back tomorrow morning. Finally, however, he succeeded in getting the idea across, and the last disconsolate turtleman went reluctantly away. But sure enough, Next morning, even before the mud had dried, the same twelve were back on the job. The two lensmen wondered simultaneously how those trencos could have found the spaceport. Or had they stayed near it through the storm and flood of the night, I don't know. Kinnison answered the asked question. But I can't find out. Again and more carefully he examined the minds of two or three of them. No, they didn't follow us. He reported then, They're not as dumb as I thought they were. They have a sense of perception. Tregus knee. About the same thing. I judge, as yours, Parth is even more so. I wonder we could not they be trained into mighty efficient police assistance on this planet the way you handle them. Yes, I can converse with them a little. Of course, but they have never before shown any willingness to cooperate with us. You never fed them sugar. Kinnison laughed. To have sugar. Of course, or do you, I was forgetting that many races do not use it at all. We regalians are one of those races. Starch is so much tastier and so much better adapted to our body chemistry that sugar is used only as a chemical. We can, however, obtain it easily enough. But there is something else. You can tell these Trencos what to do and make them really understand you. I cannot. I can fix that up with a simple mental treatment that I can give you in five minutes. Also, I can let you have enough sugar to carry on with until you can get in a supply of your own. In the few minutes during which the Lensmen had been discussing their potential allies, the mud had dried and the amazing coverage of dense, succulent grass was springing visibly into being. So incredibly rapid was its growth that in ten minutes more the plants were large enough to be gathered. The leaves were lush and drank, in color vivid, crimsonish purple. These early merwing plants are the richest of any in Tyanet. But the Zwilniks can never get more than a handful of them because of the wine, remarked the regalian. But if you will give me that treatment, I will see what I can do with the flax. Kinnison did so, and the Trancos worked for Tregus knee as industriously as they had for Kinnison and ate his sugar as rapturously. That is enough, decided the regalian presently. 
This will finish your fifty kilograms and two spare. He then paid off his now enthusiastic helpers, with instructions to return when the sun was directly overhead, for more work and more sugar, and this time they did not complain, nor did they loiter around or bring in unwanted vegetation. They were learning fast, well before noon the last kilogram of impalpable, purposeful powder was put into its impremable sack. The machinery was cleaned, then touched leaves, the waste, and the contaminated air were blown out of the spaceport, and the room and its occupants were sprayed with anti-hintation. Then and only then did the crew remove their masks and dare filters. Trenko's pace port was again a patrol post, no longer as Wilnick's paradise. Thanks, Tregus knee. And all you fellows, Kinnison paused, then went on. Dubiously, I don't suppose that you will, we will not, declared Tregus knee. Our time is yours, as you know, with tight payment, and time is all that we gave you. Really? Swore fat and about a thousand million credits worth of finite. That, of course, does not count. As you also know, you have helped us, I think, even more than we have helped you. I hope that I have done you some good. Anyway, well, I've got to flit. Thanks again. I'll see you sometime. Maybe. And again the Tellurian lensman was on his way. Six. Kinnison approached star cluster AC 250 Osvin thousand, 736 warily, as before, and as before he insinuated his speedster through the loose outer cordon of guardian fortresses. This time, however, he did not steer even remotely near Helmuth's world. He would be there too long. There was altogether too much risk of electromagnetic detection to set his ship into any kind of an orbit around that planet. Instead, he had computed a long, narrow, elliptical orbit around its sun, well inside the zone guarded by the Mollers. He could compute it only approximately, of course, since he did not know exactly either the masses involved or the perturbing forces, but he thought that he could find his ship again with an electro. If dot, she would not be an irreplaceable loss. He set the speedster. Then, into the outward leg of that orbit and took off in his new armor. He knew that there was a fast train around Helmuth's planet, and suspected that there might be other screens as well. Therefore, shutting off every watt of power, he dropped straight down into the night side, well clear of the citadel's edge. His flares were, of course, heavily baffled, but even so he did not put on his brakes until it was absolutely necessary. He landed heavily, then sprang away in long, free hops, until he reached his previously selected destination, a great cavern thickly shielded with iron norin fully five thousand miles from his point of descent. Deep within that cavern he hid himself, then searched intently for any sign that his approach had been observed. There was no such sign. So far, so good. But during his search he had perceived with a slight shock that Helmuth had tightened his defenses even more. Not only was every man in the dome screened against caught, but also each was now wearing full armor. Had he protected the Dobbs? To or killed them no real matter if he had any kind of a pet animal would do. Or, in a pinch, even a wild rockless hard nevertheless. He shot his perception into the particular barracks he had noted so long before, and found with some relief that the dogs were still there, and that they were still unprotected. It had not occurred, even to Helmuth's cautious mind, that it all could be a source of mental danger, with all due precaution against getting even a single grain of the stuff into his own system. Kinnison transferred his spy in it into the special container in which it was to be used. Another day sufficed to observe and to memorize the personnel of the gateway observers, their positions, and the sequence in which they took the boards. Then the lensman, still almost a week ahead of schedule, settled down to await the time when he should make his next move. Nor was this waiting and duly irksome. Now that everything was ready he could be as patient as a cat on duty at a mouse hole. 
the time came to act, Kennison took over the mind of the dog, which at once moved over to the bunk in which one particular observer lay asleep. There would be no chance whatever of gaining control of any observer while he was actually on the board. But here in barracks it was almost ridiculously easy. The dove crept along on soundless paws. Along. Slim nose reached out and up. Sharp teeth closed delicately upon a battery lead. Out came the plug. The fast rain went down. And instantly Kinnison was in charge of the fellow's mind. And when that observer went on duty, his first act was to admit Kimball Kinnison. Gray Lensmint. To the grand base of Buscon Low and Fast Kinnison flew. While the observer so placed his body as to shield from any chance passer be the louvre railing surface of his visiplate, in a few minutes the lensman reached a portal of the dome itself. Those doors also up and Dayton closed behind him. He released the mind of the observer and watched briefly. Nothing happened. All was still well then. In every barracks save one. Using whatever came to hand in the way of dog or other and shielded animal, Kinnison wrought briefly but effectively. He did not slay by mental fortune, did not have enough of that to spar, but the mere turn of any conspicuous valve would do just as well. Some of those now idle men would probably live to answer Helm of Skull to extra duty, but not to many, nor would those who obeyed that summons live long thereafter. Down stairway after stairway he dived down to the compartment in which was housed the great air purifier. Now let them come even if they had a spirey on him. Now it would be too late to do them a bit of good. And now, by all the gods of space, that fleet had better be out there. Getting ready to blast it was. From all over the galaxy that grand fleet had been assembled. Every patrol base had been stripped of almost everything mobile that could throw a beam, Every vessel carried either a lensman or some other highly trusted officer, and each such officer had to detect a nulfus winnow upon his person, the other in his lock or the one of which would protect his whole ship from detection. In long lines, singly and at intervals, those untold thousands of ships had crept between the vessels guarding Grand Base, nor were the outpost crews to blame. They had been on duty four months and not even an asteroid had relieved the monotony. Nothing had happened or whoop. They watched their plates steadily in a hand. If they did nothing more, why should they and what could they have done? How could they suspect that such a thing as a detector null for fire had been invented the patrol's grand fleet? Then, was already massing over its primary objectives, each vessel in a rigidly assigned position. The pilots, captains, and navigators were chatting among themselves jerkily and in low tones, as though even to raise their voices might reveal prematurely to the enemy the concentration of the patrol forces. The firing officers were already at their boards, eyeing hungrily the small switches which they could not throw for so many long minutes yet. And far below, beside the pirate's air cure fire, Kinnison released the locking toggles of his armor and leapt tight, to burn a hole in the primary duct took only a second. To drop into that duct his container of finite. To drench that container with the reagent which would in sixty seconds dissolve completely that container's substance without affecting either its contents or the metal of the duct. To slap a flexible adhesive patch over the hole in the duct. And to leap back into his arm marble these things required only a rifle over one minute. Eleven minutes to gox. Then in the last barracks, even while the lensman was arrowing up the stairways, a dog again deprived a sleeping man of his thought screen. That man, however, instead of going to work, took up a pair of pliers and proceeded to cut the battery leads of every sleeper in the barracks, severing them so close that no connection could be made without removing the armor. As those leads were severed, men woke up and dashed into the dome. A long catwalk after catwalk they raced, and apparently that was all that they were doing. But each rummer, as he passed a man on duty, flicked a battery plug out of its socket, and that observer, at Kinnison's command, opened the faceplate of his armor and breathed deeply of the now rugged and atmosphere. Fionnet, as has been intimated, 
is perhaps the worst of all known hebefremfer drugs. In almost infinitesimal doses it gives rise to a state in which the victim seems actually to experience the gratification of his every desire. Whatever that desire may be, the larger the dose, the more intense the sensation, until hand very quick life dosage is reached at which he passes into such an ecstatic stupor that not a single nerve can force a stimulus into his frenzied brain. In this state he dies. Thus there was no alarm, no outcry, no warning. Each observer sat or stood entranced, holding exactly the pose he had been in at the instant of opening his faceplate. But now, instead of paying attention to his duty, he was plunging deeper and deeper into the paroxysmally ecstatic profundity of a fianate debauch from which there was to be no awakening. Therefore, half of that mighty dome was in man before Helmuth even realized that anything at all out of order was going on. As soon as he realized that something was amiss, however, he sounded the Alhandostantil arm and rapped out instructions to the officers in the barracks. But the cloud of death had arrived there first, and to his consternation not one quarter of those officers responded. Quite a number of men did get into the dome, but every one of them collapsed before reaching the catwalks, and three-fourths of his working force were hors de combat before he located Kinnison's speeding messengers. Blast them down, Helmu shrieked, pointing, gesticulating madly. Blast whom down the minions of the Lensmen were themselves blasting away now, right and left, shouting contradictory but supposedly authoritative orders. Blast those men not on duty, Helmuth's raging boast now filled the dome. Oh, at board 417 blast that man on catwalk 20. At board 409 to fight her with such detailed instructions. Kinnison's agents, one by one, ceased to be, but as one was beamed down another took his place. And soon every one of the few remaining living pirates in the dome was blasting indiscriminately at every other one. And then, to cap the Saturnalian climax, came the zero second, the grand fleet of the galactic patrol had assembled every cruiser, every battleship, every muller hung poised above its assigned target. Every vessel was stripped for action. Every accumulator cell was full to its ultimate what? Every generator and every arm was tuned and peaked to its highest attainable efficiency. Every firing officer upon every ship sat tensely at his board, his hand hovering near but not touching. His firing keys, his eyes fixed glaringly upon the second hand of his synchronized electric timer, his ears scarcely hearing the droning, soothing voice of Port Admiral Haynes, for the old man had insisted upon giving the firing order himself, and he now sat at the master timer, speaking into the master microphone. Beside him sat von Hondorf, the grand old commandant of cadets, both of these veterans had fought long since that they were done with space war forever, but only an order of the full Galactic Council could have kept either of them at home. They were grimly determined that they were going to be in at the death, even though they were not at all certain whose death it was to be. If it should turn out that it was to be Helmuth's, all well and good Verfing would be on the green. If, on the other hand, young Kinnison had to go, they would have on all probability, have too low, to and so be it. Now remember, boys, keep your hands off those keys until I give you the word. Haines' soothing voice droned on, giving no hint of the terrific strain he himself was under. I'll give you lots of warning. I am going to count the last five seconds for you. I know that you will want to shoot the first bolt, but remember that I, personally, will strangle any and every one of you who beats my signal by a thousandth of a second. It won't be long now. The second hand is starting around on its last lap. Keep your hands off those keys. Keep away from them. I tell you, or I'll smack you down. Fifteen seconds yet. Stay away. Boys, let em alone. Going to start counting now. His voice dropped lower and lower. Five fat rotary, and he yelled. Perhaps some of the boys did beat the gun a trifle. 
but not many, or much. To all intents and purposes it was one simultaneous blast of destruction that flashed down from a hundred thousand projectors, each delivering the maximum blast of which it was capable. There was no thought now of service life, of equipment or of holding anything back for a later effort. They had to hold that blast for only fifteen minutes, and if the task ahead of them could not be done in those fifteen minutes it probably could not be done at all. Therefore, it is entirely useless even to attempt to describe what happened then, or to portray the spectacle that ensued when B met screen. White right could describe high sea to a man born deaf suffice it to say that those patrol beams bored down, and that Helmuth's automatic screens resisted to the limit of their ability. Nor was that resistance small. It was of such power that, years later, Astronomers observed and recorded a peculiarly behaving Novan star cluster AC 250 Osman 1736, had Helmuth's customary staff of Keenied, quick twite lieutenant spin at their posts, to reinforce those primary screens with the practically unlimited power which could have been put behind them. His defenses would not have failed, even under the unimaginable force of that titanic thrust, but those lieutenants were not at their posts. The screens of the twenty skies' primary objectives failed, and the twenty skies' stupendous flotillas moved slowly, grandly, voraciously, each along its designated line. Every alarm in Helm of Stone had burst into frantic warning as the massed might of the galactic patrol was first holed against the twenty skies' vital points of Grand Base. But those alarms clamored in vain. No hands were raised to the switches whose closing would unleash the hellish energies of Bospoin's irresistible projectors. No eyes were upon the sighting devices which would align them against the attacking ships of war. Only Hell moved. In his inner sheathlead control compartment was left, and Helmuth was the directing intelligence. The master manned, and not a mere operator. If, now that he had no operators to direct, he was utterly helpless. He could see the stupendous fleet of the patrol. He could understand fully its dire menace. But he could neither stiffen his screens nor energize a single beam. He could only sit, grinding his teeth in helpless fury, and watch the destruction of the armament which, if it could only have been in operation, would have blasted those battleships and mullers from the skies as though they had been so many fluffy bits of fistle down. Time after time he leapt to his feet, as if about to dash across to one of the control stations. But each time he sank back into his seat at the desk. One firing station would be little, if any, better than none at all. Besides, that accursed lensman was back of this. He was muse bare here in the dome. Somewhere. He wanted him to leave this desk. That was what he was waiting for as long as he stayed at the desk he himself was safe. For that matter, this whole dome was safe. The projector had never been mounted that could break down those screens. No, no matter what happened, he would stay at the desk Kinnison. Watching, marveled at his fortitude. He himself could not have stayed there. He knew, and he also knew now that Helmuth was going to stay. Time was flying. Five of the fifteen minutes were gone. He had hoped that Helmuth would leave that well-protected inner sanctum, with its unknown potentialities. But if the pirate would not come out, the lensman would go in. The storming of that inner stronghold was what his new armor had been designed for. And he went. But he did not catch Helmuth napping. Even before he crashed the screens, his own defensive zones burst into furiously coruscant activity and through that flame there came tearing the metallic slugs of a Heichelberber machine rifle. How there was a rifle, even though he had not been able to find it clever guy. That Helmuth and what a break that he had taken time to learn how to hold this suit up against the trickiest kind of Mackenhara per fire Kinnison screens were almost those of a battleship. His armor almost, relatively, as strong, and he could hold that armor upright. Therefore, through the raging beam of the semi-portable projector he ploughed, and straight up that torrent of raging steel he drove his way, 
and now from his own mighty projector against helmuth's armor there raved out a beam scarcely less potent than that of a semi-portable the lensman's armor did not mount a water-cooled machine rifler was a limit to what even that powerful structure could carry but grimly with every faculty of his newly enlarged mind concentrated upon that faustrined armored head behind the belching gun kinnison held his line and forged ahead illustration but helmuth could not now reach that ball of force and kinnison's mighty armor forged undamaged through the hail of metal well it was that the lensman was concentrating upon that screened head for when the screen weakened slightly and a thought began to seep through it toward an enigmatically sparkling ball of force kinnison was ready he blanketed the thought savagely before it could take form and attacked the screen so viciously that helmuth had either to restore full coverage instantly or die then and there for the lensman had studied that ball long and earnestly it was the one thing about the whole base that he could not understand the one thing therefore of which he had been uneasily afraid but he was afraid of it no longer it was operated he knew by thought if no matter how terrific its potentialities might be it now was and would remain perfectly harmless for if the pirate chief softened his screen enough to emit a thought he would never think again therefore kinnison rushed at full blast he hurtled the rifle and crashed full against the armored figure behind it magnetic clamps locked and held eth, driving projectors furiously ablaze he whirled around and forced the madly struggling helmuth back toward the line along which the bellowing rifle was still spewing forth a continuous storm of metal helmuth's utmost efforts sufficed only to throw the lensman out of balance and both figures crashed to the floor now the madly fighting armored pair rolled over and over trait into the line of fire first kinnis fought bullets whining shrieking off the armor of his personal battleship and crashing through or smashing ring injury against whatever happened to be in the ecker shining line of ricochet then helmut and the fierce spare and metal slugs tore in their multitudes through his armor and through his body riddling his every vital organ transcriber's note chapter v heading missing in original text and of the project gutenberg gebuk balactic patrol updated editions will replace the previous one the old editions will be renamed creating the works from print editions not protected by you s copyright law means that no one owns a united states copyright in these works so the foundation and you can copy and distribute it in the united states without permission and without paying copyright royalties special rules set forth in the general terms of use part of this license applied to copying and distributing project gutenabrumt electronic works to protect the project gutenabrumt concept and trademark project gutenberg is a registered trademark and may not be used if you charge for an ebook except by following the terms of the trademark license including paying royalties for use of the project gutenberg trademark if you do not charge anything for copies of the sebuk complying with the trademark license is very easy you may use the sebuk for nearly any purpose such as creation of derivative works reports performances and research project gutenberg books may be modified and printed and given a one may do practically anything in the united states with books not protected by you s copyright law redistribution is subject to the trademark license especially commercial redistribution start full license the full project gutenberg license please read this before you distribute or use this work to protect the project gutenberg mission of promoting the free distribution of electronic works by using or distributing this work or any other work associated in any way with the phrase project gutenberg you agree to comply with all the terms of the full project Newton license available with this file or online at WAF. Gutenberg, Orgel Cecent. Section 1. General Terms of Use and Redistributing Project Newton Electronic Works 1. At, by reading or using any part of this project Newton Electronic Work, you indicate that you have read, understand, 
agree to and accept all the terms of this license and intellectual property trade Markowitic agreement. If you do not agree to abide by all the terms of this agreement, you must cease using and return or destroy all copies of Project Gutnabrum to electronic works in your possession. If you paid a fee for obtaining a copy of or access to a Project Gutnabrum to electronic work and you do not agree to be bound by the terms of this agreement, you may obtain a refund from the person or entity to whom you paid the fee as set forth in paragraph 1. Oh, eight, one, well, Project Gutenberg is a registered trademark. It may only be used on or associated in any way with an electronic work by people who agree to be bound by the terms of this agreement. There are a few things that you can do with most Project Gutenberg to electronic works even without complying with the full terms of this agreement. See paragraph 1. See below. There are a lot of things you can do with Project Gutenberg to electronic works if you follow the terms of this agreement and help preserve free future access to Project Gutenberg to electronic works. See paragraph 1. E below. 1. So. The Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, the Foundation or GLAF, owns a compilation copyright in the collection of Project Gutenberg to electronic works. Nearly all the individual works in the collection are in the public domain in the United States. If an individual work is unprotected by copyright law in the United States and you are located in the United States, we do not claim a right to prevent you from copying, distributing, performing, displaying or creating derivative works based on the work as long as all references to Project Gutenberg are removed. Of course, we hope that you will support the Project Gutenberg mission of promoting free access to electronic works by freely sharing Project Gutenberg works in compliance with the terms of this agreement for keeping the Project Gutenberg name associated with the work. You can easily comply with the terms of this agreement by keeping this work in the same format with its attached full Project Gutenberg license when you share it without charge with others. One. Hmm. The copyright laws of the place where you are located also govern what you can do with this work. Copyright laws in most countries are in a constant state of change. If you are outside the United States, check the laws of your country in addition to the terms of this agreement before downloading, copying, displaying, performing, distributing or creating derivative works based on this work or any other project you work. The Foundation makes no representations concerning the copyright status of any work in any country other than the United States. 1. Oh. Unless you have removed all references to Project Gutenberg. 1. Oh. 1. The following sentence, with active links to, or other immediate access to, the full Project Gutenberg license must appear prominently whenever any copy of a Project Gutenberg work any work on which the phrase Project Gutenberg appears, or with which the phrase Project Gutenberg is associated is accessed, displayed, performed, view, copied or distributed. This evoke is for the use of anyone anywhere in the United States and most other parts of the world at no cost and with almost no restrictions whatsoever, you may copy it, give it away or reuse it under the terms of the Project Gutenberg license included with this EvoCore online at WAF. Gutenberg. Or, if you are not located in the United States, you will have to check the laws of the country where you are located before using this EvoC. 1. Oh. Oh. If an individual Project Gutenberg to electronic work is derived from texts not protected by you, as Copyright law does not contain a notice indicating that it is posted with permission of the copyright holder. The work can be copied and distributed to anyone in the United States without paying any fees or charges. If you are redistributing or providing access to a work with the phrase Project Gutenberg associated with or appearing on the work, you must comply either with the requirements of paragraphs 1. Out. 1 through 1. Out. 7. Or obtain permission for the use of the work and the Project Gutenberg trademark has set forth in paragraphs 1. Out. 8. Or 1. Out. And. 1. Out. 3. 
If an individual project Utnabrimt electronic work is posted with the permission of the copyright holder, your use and distribution must comply with both paragraphs 1, oh, 1 through 1, oh, 7, and any additional terms imposed by the copyright holder. Additional terms will be linked to the project Utnabrimt license for all works posted with the permission of the copyright holder found at the beginning of this work. 1, oh, Four, do not unlink cord attach or remove the full project Utnabrimt license terms from this work, or any files containing a part of this work or any other work associated with project Utnabrimt. One, oh, five, do not copy, display, perform, distribute or redistribute this electronic work, or any part of this electronic work without prominently displaying the sentence set forth in paragraph 1, oh, one with active links or immediate access to the full terms of the Project Utnabrimt license. 1. Oh, 6. You may convert to and distribute this work in any binary, compressed, marked up, non-proprietary or proprietary form, including any word processing or hypertext form. However, if you provide access to or distribute copies of a project Utnabrimt work in a format other than plain vanilla ASCII or other format used in the official version posted on the official project Utnabrimt website WAF, Gutenberg, or you must, at no additional cost, fee or expense to the user, provide a copy, a means of exporting a copy, or a means of obtaining a copy upon request, of the work in its original plain vanilla ASCII or other form. Any alternate format must include the full project Utnabrimt license as specified in paragraph 1. Oh, 1, 1, oh, 7. Do not charge a fee for access to viewing, displaying, performing, copying or distributing any project Utnabrimt works unless you comply with paragraph 1. Oh, 8 or 1. Oat band one oat eight. You may charge a reasonable fee for copies of or providing access to or distributing Project Utnabrimt to electronic works, provided that you pay a royalty fee of twenty of the gross profits you derive from the use of Project Utnabrimt works, calculated using the method you already use to calculate your applicable taxes. The fee is owed to the owner of the Project Utnabrimt trademark. But he has agreed to donate royalties under this paragraph to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation. Royalty payments must be paid within 60 days following each date on which you prepare or are legally required to prepare your periodic tax returns. Royalty payments should be clearly marked as such and sent to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation at the address specified in Section 4. Information about donations to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation. You provide a full refund of any money paid by a user who notifies you in writing or by email within 30 days of receipt that she does not agree to the terms of the full Project Gutenberg license. You must require such a user to return or destroy all copies of the works possessed in a physical medium and discontinue all use of and all access to other copies of Project Gutenberg works. You provide in accordance with paragraph 1. At 3. A full refund of any money paid for a work or a replacement copy. If a defect in the electronic work is discovered and reported to you within 90 days of receipt of the work, you comply with all other terms of this agreement for free distribution of Project Utnabrimt works. 1. Oh, band. If you wish to charge a fee or distribute a project Utnabrimt to electronic or core group of works on different terms than are set forth in this agreement, you must obtain permission in writing from the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, the manager of the Project Utnabrimt trademark. Contact the Foundation as set forth in Section 3 below. 1. F. 1. F. 1. Project Gutenberg volunteers and employees expend considerable effort to identify, to copyright research on, transcribe and proofread works not protected by you, s copyright law in creating the Project Gutenberg collection. Despite these efforts, 
project Utnabrum to electronic works, and the medium on which they may be stored, may contain defects, setters, but not limited to, incomplete, inaccurate or corrupt dated, transcription errors, a copyright or other intellectual property infringement, a defective or damaged disk or other medium, a computer virus, or computer codes that damage or cannot be read by your equipment. 1. F. O. Limited warranty. Disclaimer of damages except for the right of replacement or refund described in paragraph 1. F. 3. The Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation. The owner of the Project Gutenberg trademark and any other party distributing a project Utnabrum to electronic work under this agreement, disclaim all liability to you for damages, costs and expenses, including legal fees. You agree that you have no remedies for negligence, strict liability, breach of warranty or breach of contract except those provided in paragraph 1. At 3, you agree that the foundation, the trademark honor, and any distributor under this agreement will not be liable to you for actual, direct, indirect, consequential, punitive or incidental damages even if you give notice of the possibility of such damage. 1. F. 3. Limited right of replacement or refund if you discover a defect in this electronic work within 90 days of receiving it. You can receive a refund of the money if any you paid for it by sending a written explanation to the person you received the work from. If you received the work on a physical medium, you must return the medium with your written explanation. The person or entity that provided you with the defective work may elect to provide a replacement copy in lieu of a refund. If you received the work electronically, the person or entity providing it to you may choose to give you a second opportunity to receive the work electronically in lieu of a refund. If the second copy is also defective, you may demand a refund in writing without further opportunities to fix the problem. 1. F. 4. Except for the limited right of replacement or refund set forth in paragraph 1. F. 3. This work is provided to you ASIS with no other warranties of any kind, express or implied, including but not limited to warranties of mercantility or fitness for any purpose. 1. F. 5. Some states do not allow disclaimers of certain implied warranties or the exclusion or limitation of certain types of damages. If any disclaimer or limitation set forth in this agreement violates the law of the state applicable to this agreement, the agreement shall be interpreted to make the maximum disclaimer or limitation permitted by the applicable state law. The invalidity or unenforceability of any provision of this agreement shall not void the remaining provisions. 1. F. 6. Indemnity you agree to indemnify and hold the foundation. The trademark honor. Any agent or employee of the foundation. Any one providing copies of Project Utnabrum to electronic works in accordance with this agreement, and any volunteers associated with the production, promotion and distribution of Project Utnabrum to electronic works, harmless from all liability, costs and expenses, including legal fees, that arise directly or indirectly from any of the following which you do or cause to occur, a distribution of this or any Project Utnabrum work, be alteration, modification, or additions or deletions to any project mute nebrimpt work, and see any defect you cause. Section 2. Information about the mission of Project Ute Nebrimpt. Project Ute Nebrimpt is synonymous with the free distribution of electronic works in formats readable by the widest variety of computers including obsolete, of middle-aged and new computers. It exists because of the efforts of hundreds of volunteers and donations from people in all walks of life. Volunteers and financial support to provide volunteers with the assistance they need are critical to reaching Project Utnabrumt's goals and ensuring that the Project Utnabrumt collection will remain freely available for generations to come. In 2001, 
The Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation was created to provide a secure and permanent future for Project Gutenberg and future generations. To learn more about the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation and how your efforts and donations can help, see sections 3 and 4 in the Foundation Information page at WUF. Gutenberg Org Section 3 Information about the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation. The Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation is an unprofit 500 donec free educational corporation organized under the laws of the state of Mississippi and granted tax exempt status by the Internal Revenue Service. The Foundation's INOR federal tax identification number is 6 Tifturus million, 221,548. Contributions to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation are tax deductible to the full extent permitted by U.S. federal laws and your state's laws. The Foundation's business office is located at 809 North 1500 West Salt Lake City at 84,116, 801 509 Xtivin St. Xtin. Email contact links and up-to-date contact information can be found at the Foundation's website and official page at WUF. Gutenberg or Architect Section 4 Information about donations to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation Project Gutenberg depends upon and cannot survive without widespread public support and donations to carry out its mission of increasing the number of public domain and licensed works that can be freely distributed in mechanic ribbed form accessible by the widest array of equipment including outdated equipment. Many small donations $1 to $5 Zero are particularly important to maintaining tax-exempt status with the laws. The Foundation is committed to complying with the laws regulating charities and charitable donations in all 50 states of the United States. Compliance requirements are not uniform and it takes a considerable effort. Much paperwork and many fees to meet and keep up with these requirements. We do not solicit donations in locations where we have not received written confirmation of compliance. To send donations or determine the status of compliance for any particular state visit WUF. Gutenberg Orgadot While we can often do not solicit contributions from states where we have not met the solicitation requirements, we know of no prohibition against accepting unsolicited donations from donors in such states who approach us with offers to donate. International donations are gratefully accepted. But we cannot make any statements concerning tax treatment of donations received from outside the United States. Though, as laws alone swamp power small staff, please check the Project Gutenberg web pages for current donation methods and addresses. Donations are accepted in a number of other ways, including checks, online payments, and credit card donations. To donate, Please visit WAF Gutenberg Orgadot Section 5 General Information about Project Gutenberg to Electronic Works Professor Michael Less. Hart was the originator of the Project Gutenberg concept of a library of electronic works that could be freely shared with anyone. For 40 years, he produced and distributed Project Gutenberg to books with only a loose network of volunteer support. Project Gutenberg Tebooks are often created from several printed editions, all of which are confirmed as not protected by copyright in the U.S. unless a copyright notice is included. Thus, we do not necessarily keep Tebooks in compliance with any particular paper edition. Most people start at our website, which has the main PGF search facility. Waf Gutenberg. Org. This website includes information about Project Gutenberg, including how to make donations to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, how to help produce our new ebooks, and how to subscribe to our email newsletter to hear about new ebooks.